All righty, welcome everyone to the Butte for our Montana State Library Commission's April meeting. I am Robin Scribner and I'm chairman of the MSL Commission and I'm calling this meeting to order. Okay, we would like to extend our appreciation to the Montana Library Association for allowing us, um, our commission, to join the MLA Convention. And as your chair, I'm going to work to create a pr productive meeting space where every commission member and staff member is respected, valued, and seen and heard. Okay, I'd like to ask our commissioners and staff to introduce themselves. Go ahead, Tom. I'm Tom Burnett, I'm from Bozeman. Brian Ross, excuse me, Brian Ross from Bozeman, and I work at Montana State University Library. Peggy Taylor, I'm from Whitefish. Tammy Hall, I'm from Bozeman, and I was appointed by Governor G. Forte. I'm Carmen Hufferson from Calisto. Elsie? Good morning, uh, State Superintendent Elsie Arnson coming in from Helena. Good morning. Okay, Jenny. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jenny Staff. I'm your state librarian. And as you see, we have um, an honored guest here. This is First Lady Susan Jean Forte, and I will be um, introducing her and explaining why she's here in just a few minutes. Okay. Genevieve, busy as she is during our meetings, has bowed out as a parliamentarian. I would like to thank her for stepping up and um, helping us out through our preliminary Roberts rules. Um, Commissioner Peggy Taylor has now kindly agreed to help us. And another mind, reminder, if we're struggling to phrase a motion, I as chair will allow a discussion on how the motion should be phrased. Not in all motions, but using my discretion, I may allow a limited discussion in the phrasing of the motion. Okay, with that being said, I would like to ask if there are any changes or additions to the agenda. As there are none, let's go to Jenny for the um, staff longevity recognition of Alexia McCune. Great, thanks Robin. And I actually want to introduce Dan Bakken who is online. Dan is Alexis's supervisor and he's going to be recognizing Alexis for her years of service with the State Library. Thanks, Jenny. Um, yeah, I'm excited to have this opportunity. Um, so I believe we're recognizing Alexis for five years of service, but I think we need a little bit of context because she's actually been with us for quite a bit longer than that. Alexis started with the program in 2009 as a uh, technician working on a statewide amphibian and reptile monitoring project that we still use that data today. It was a really cool thing. So she was with us for three years, left us to go get her master's degree studying coastal tailed frogs up in BC. Then we rehired her in 2016 as the assistant zoologist. Um, she worked there through about 2019 when in the process of emigrating to the US from Canada, she had to take a uh, mandatory but well-deserved vacation which reset her longevity clock. So since 19, she has really exemplified our program. She's been a great asset. She does a lot of coordination with uh, volunteers from both federal and state organizations in her statewide monitoring efforts. She kind of herds cats and does it really well. She's not maybe the person who gets to go out and talk about these efforts, but she's really the glue that holds them together. And I've been constantly impressed by her work ethic, both in moving these projects forward, tackling tough issues, that we run into, but also in her um, dedication to not only maintaining her skill sets, she's one of the, I'd say, best um, folks within the country for bat call analysis, um, which is increasingly, you know, kind of a big deal within the wildlife world. But she also really seeks to maintain her skill sets um, and find new tools to put in her toolbox. So I'm thrilled to work with her and I hope that um, she'll be with us for many years to come. So thank you, Alexis. Congratulations, Alexis. Thank you everyone for the opportunity to be here and also for the recognition. Thank you, Alexis. Great, okay. All right, now it is my privilege to introduce um, we, we have, we, the Montana State Library Commission, are, we're very excited to have an honored guest 
And that is our First Lady, Susan Gianforte. And she's going to discuss the Dolly Parton Imagine program, which is a project near and dear to her heart. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're kind of having a fireside chat. So I have some questions I wanted to ask her. Okay, um, I'd like to ask, how did you select your First Lady initiatives? Because obviously you have more than just yeah. the Dolly Parton. Um, when I thought about what I was passionate about, education just um, jumped to the top. It um, it was getting a quality education just meant so much in my life. Um, I grew up, my, my dad passed away early. I grew up with a single mom and um, my teachers and my school were my family. Um, so that experience prepared me for high school um, and advanced classes. And then that prepared me for uh, studying engineering in college, which prepared me for a, a career that I absolutely loved and uh, came out with a great skill set that I'm um, even applying now as first lady. So education was just um, foundational. And I've seen it in many other people where they get an education and they're excited about learning, excited about the Pat career path they choose. Um, and anyway, it's great. So the two initiatives were first um, in interest in STEM and promoting STEM, promoting access to STEM education. Um, with my background in engineering, at, at least giving people, children the exposure, I thought was it's just critical. And then the second one is reading. And reading starts early, preparation for reading starts early. So early childhood literacy, um, I think, is just uh, is just so important. And the Dolly Parton Imagination Library program addresses that and meets that need. Um, so yeah, great. Those are my two. And well, many of us are interested in education and literacy. Okay, speaking of early childhood literacy. Could you share with us a little bit more about why you chose to champion this important initiative? Yeah, thank you. Um, the reading is just so foundational to everything you do in life. And uh, the experience of a young child sitting with a parent, guardian, older sibling, being read to, talking about the books, talking about the characters, the story, all of that interaction um, prepares kids, not just being ready to read when they get to kindergarten, but ready to learn, to be able to sit and listen to the teacher, to be able to interact with the teacher's questions, listen and respond. And all that early childhood reading interaction prepares children. So yeah, the, the Dolly Port Imagination Library is just such a great match. Um, I think books in the home, I consider them a treasure, whether they're purchased or even better, borrowed from the library so that you can have an unlimited, uh, unlimited access to books, especially now with the way the library sharing system works. So um, I've always considered books and reading a treasure. Yeah, yeah definitely. Books are, books are such a fundamental part to um, even, I mean, even um, babies in black and white. And, I mean, yeah. it's just such a... Such and a even doing part. math. I mean, you yes. can't do math if you can't read the problems. Right, right. So yes. it, it's Definitely. just everything. Okay. Could you tell us a little bit more about the Dolly Parton Imagine Library? Why is it important to you and what made you decide to become involved with it? Yeah, so I learned about it through um, another first lady, Fran DeWine of Ohio, and the program has been there for quite a few years. Um, they're about 10 times bigger, their eligible mm -hmm. child population. So it's just an absolutely huge program. Um, and she, and when she told me about it, I was like, that's great. I, I want to do that in Montana. Okay. So that's where I learned about it. Um, when I looked, when I started looking in Montana, it was a little less, about a year and a half ago, 17 counties had the program. Um, and there were about 8,500 children that were in the program, kind of scattered and some pockets of cities. Um, 
So now, um, after taking statewide, all 56 counties are covered, every zip code. And previously, the, the affiliates had to raise 100% of their own funding, these 17 counties. And now, um, through Treasure State Foundation that I fundraise for, um, we provide 50% of funding, so they only have to raise half what they did before. And hopefully that's an incentive to add a lot more kids. And for new and expanding affiliates, um, we provide 100% funding. So they don't have to do any fundraising. Um, they just have to register kids. So right now, the program is about 24,000 children. Mm -hmm. So almost triple. Uh, which is about 40% of the 60,000 eligible children. So we've made a lot of progress from like 15% to 40. Mm -hmm. And the goal for Dolly Parton Imagination Library, their kind of overarching goal is um, two thirds to 70%. So we're two thirds of the way wow. to, to two thirds. But um, I mean, I, I would like to do more. Um, if we can pass that, I'd, I'd be thrilled. Um, the money is will be there. I'll make sure that the money's there. And uh, it's an easy program to fundraise for. Um, and it's very easy to do at the statewide level. So um, so that's the goal, is um, to get these high-quality, free, age-appropriate books that are curated um, by Dolly Parton's committee um, delivered to the home or P.O. box to every child in Montana that we can possibly touch. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you, can, can you talk a little bit to the eligibility of the children? Thank you. Uh, zero up to age five. So once they reach their fifth birthday, um, yeah, then they're they get a graduation book. They have, uh -huh. they have a 16th book library collection. The idea, yes. And yes. so getting them enrolled as soon as possible to get those black and white right. books right. that are so, I, you know, that are age appropriate for the kids and, and then going on from there. So every child is eligible. Every so child is eligible. It's there not, there's no, income, there's no and, income and the book is free for every child. Okay. And, and. Do you go, I'm sorry to be asking so many questions, no, but do you go yes. to the library and say, um, register. register me, or do you do it online? Uh, you can go to your library. The um, the easiest, the way people do it mostly is online at imaginationlibrary.com. Okay. And even if the library has a link for a register here for Imagination Library, it goes to the, the to Dollywood Foundation. The Dollywood. Okay. They, they have, that's how they... Do their great, sign up. So, great. Thank yep, you. That's such good information. Thank you. Thank okay, you. So, what has it been like working with Montana libraries, traveling to them and meeting with the librarians and the trustees? How was it? Doing? Yeah. Well, when I um, started looking, Dolly Parton uh, also likes to have every county have their own thing. So, then I was looking who should I partner with in counties, and libraries were just such. A natural partner because they they have books and they care about reading and they care about more kids reading so that's who I started calling and emailing and so I had a year almost of interaction with email and phone getting them signed up telling them about the program uh, just encouraging them, ex explaining and getting them. There was a little bit of paperwork involved to get every affiliate signed up. Even the old affiliates had to do new paperwork because the funding level was different. Um, so then last summer, uh, Catherine and I um, on the governor's staff, we did, uh, when the governor did his 56 county tour, uh, Catherine and I broke off and visited the affiliate in every county. Mm -hmm. So we actually got, I, we got to meet the librarians and the trustees, whoever could come uh, face to face and just talk about how to expand registration, how to expand outreach, um, sharing ideas, which I then shared with other librarians. So it was very collaborative. Um, they were very excited about the program because it did get kids interested in coming to the library and getting more books. Because once you start reading one book a month, doesn't quite do it. You, <laughs> you want to read more. Yes. 
yeah, the material. Mm -hmm. So that was yeah. great. They've been great partners. And uh, I really encourage them because they have to man women, staff their libraries, um, to, to engage their library board and their friends of the library board as a volunteer team to help with outreach. And those could be the people going to daycare or Head Start or wherever wherever little kids are at. Um, and so I've been sharing that information. So basically, you're 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 trying to contact the librarians and their trustees to spread it by word of mouth. Yeah, yes. and and do outreach, do outreach and get flyers to daycares and preschools. Are the flyers provided? Is there just I we usually send them electronically, but okay. if someone is like, I don't have a printer, I can't afford to print right. it, then we'll print them and and send them to the daycare or the preschool. Would you send me your flyer? I would love to. Yeah. Yes, oh, I have some here. In fact, I, I believe all the flyers, okay. we're gonna do a little bit of a redesign there, but anyway, that tiny QR code actually does work. Okay, great. That takes you right to imaginationlibrary.com. Okay, wonderful. To sign up, yeah, a little bit here for anybody. There's about 40 print, there. And we can print off our own too. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. it'd probably be easy if I email them okay, too. email me. And as a forward to a page. Yeah. yeah. I can definitely do that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Um, so what are your hopes for the program in the future? Um, right. So my hope is that there would be a team of volunteers in every county doing outreach. Um, Cascade is a really good example. They have, um, they already had a group together for early childhood learning. And so it was the library, it was the Head Start director, um, just people passionate about making sure kids have a good start for when they get to school. And so that really is my goal right now is, um, and I just hired an outreach coordinator. Actually yesterday, I found the perfect person. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, she'll be able, cause I'm a little busy this year. Um, she'll be able to do a lot of, really get on the outreach, talk to every Head Start in the state, Great. Um, talk to all the licensed uh, daycare centers, preschools. Great. So, Great. yeah, and my goal, of course, is to get to 70, at least 70% eligible kids registered over, over the next two years. I mean, it takes time. You don't go from zero to, or 15% to 70, but um, that's my goal is to just keep pushing on that. Well, I have to go to Missoula and, and babysit. I will be taking um, this well, to good. the to the daycare where my granddaughter good. is. Wonderful. Yes, and we'll yeah. see if they have it already. That, that's great. Yeah. Okay. So and another question. Oh, and we'll probably if you're probably in a hurry and on the go. No, no, I don't. I don't want to take too much time of your meeting. But I think um, the program. Yeah. Great. Okay. So. Will you stay involved with the program after your term as the first lady of the state of Montana? Will you continue to do this great work? Uh, yes. So I expect to continue to be involved. Um, I've committed to the affiliates that the funding will be there one way or the other. Um, the next first spouse may choose to continue it, but, but I... I'm just so passionate about reading and about this program in particular as the foundation for for reading as a child grows up to uh, to continue it. So I fully expect to be involved. And I just believe that every child needs the opportunity to grow and thrive and they need to be able to read to do that mm -hmm. and have their caregivers involved in their lives through books. Wonderful. So, yeah. Do you mind if we, if anyone has the oh sure questions? Yeah, any questions? Happy to or choose mm -hmm. cover question. So are the kids reading the books? Has uh, the foundation analyzed the uptake? Right here. Well, I have people come up to me a lot saying they they're getting their books. The kids are so excited about the books. Um, Missoula did a study because uh, United Way was the partner, is the partner in Missoula County and Mineral County. And they did a study about reading and how much um, the Dolly Parton kids were reading, the people getting the Imagination Library books. 
So they have some really good data. Um, and I know you're a data driven kind of guy. Mm -hmm. So I would be happy to, to share that. But it does show that um, once people, the kids are in the program, that they have more books in the home than kids that aren't in the program. Mm -hmm. um, and then also states like Ohio, uh, Tennessee was the first state, that's Dolly Parton's home state. Um, they have years of data about when kids get to kindergarten and then when they progress to third grade, they have a question on a survey about the kids' backgrounds. Did they get the Imagination Library books in the home? Mm -hmm. And those kids are much better prepared for reading, doing better in reading. So I am really hoping Tom and everybody to see in like three or four years, if we can do, if we can ask one more question mm -hmm. from the kids on whatever forms they fill out, if they were in the program to really see the difference. And, um, and the thing that I said about not just ready to read, but ready to learn, I got that from kindergarten teachers. Yeah. They're the ones that really say they mm -hmm. notice if kids have books in the home. I was a kindergarten teacher for 21 years, oh, and you. you could really tell. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, you yeah. also yeah. were a kindergarten yeah. teacher? Yeah. yeah. So I'm hoping, uh, yeah, I'm hoping teachers will be seeing a difference. Those early grade K and first grade teachers that have to What a wonderful everything. program. And thank you so much for sponsoring mm -hmm. it and, mm -hmm. and for being such a, a powerful mm -hmm. advocate. Yeah, we it. just got yes. coverage all the way because we had the funding. So a lot of sorry. Yes. So with, yeah, with the books coming into the home, it basically removes one obstacle from the child getting a book. The caregiver doesn't even have to go to the library or go somewhere. How does it work to sign up? What what barrier type is left? Do, does the parent or caregiver have to go to the library? Do they just do it online and they have just to just online? Yeah, and even if they go to the library, the librarian will probably take their computer or type it in for them. Mm -hmm. They'll go to the imaginationlibrary.com website and enter it. Every kid gets entered through that website. Mm -hmm. Even if they fill out a paper form, which I can't remember the last one I did, it was probably a year ago. I actually do the admin for Yellowstone County, mm -hmm. which is quite a bit. <laughs> but um, Actually, that's not the hard part. The outreach is the work. Um, it's very, the system is very automated for registrations for the administrator. But yeah, um, you enter the child's name and birthday, uh, the parent's name, address, and an email. So that if for some reason the book isn't getting delivered or there's some problem, they can email you and say, do you have a new address for the child so that they can keep getting the book. But um, literally, my husband was with somebody. They had a two-year running, two-year-old running around. He's like, "Let's just do it right now." He took the guy's phone, went to Imagination <laughs> Library. <laughs> and it took like thirty seconds to register this. So kid. they just get mailed to the home. Once they're registered, it um, gets through. mailed to. It has to be a USPS. Right. So that's a PO box wherever you're getting a USPS, not your packages. Mm -hmm. So then what is the role of the affiliate? I know um, Latter County Library is part of the system. What what does the library do? They really outreach, giving out flyers to people that come to the library, getting this team of volunteers <laughs> that can make calls to wherever little kids are, preschools, um, church Sunday schools, you know, um, homeschool groups. Mm -hmm. I even, I, I mean, I suggest senior centers because grandparents can sign up their grandchildren if they live them anywhere in Montana. They could be in Kalispell and their grandkids could be in Miles City and go ahead, mm -hmm. sign your grandkids up. Aunts, uncles. I know Catherine has signed up. That's her baby present for her friends that have babies is um, mm -hmm. she signs them right up. Yeah. On the Imagination Library program. That's a great idea. Yeah. Wonderful. I know it's on the end of things with kindergarten, but lots of times kindergarten parents have younger kids. So contacting schools to maybe have the available yes. kindergarten registration, the one that's registering obviously is maxed out with age wise. Yeah. If they have younger kids, they a lot yeah. of schools have preschools. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, they're that is true. No, they do. So, yes. So. Yeah. Um, so we have been in touch with schools to ask their kindergarten first, even second, third graders, uh, do you have younger siblings at home? Mm -hmm. um, and you're right. 
So that is, I have a list of like outreach ideas that I've collected as I when I had started with a list, but then I kept adding to it as I spoke to librarians and got other ideas, including pub, the public schools. Well, add me to your list of outreach people. I'd love to be a, I'd love to help. Oh, love good. Help. I'll send you the, Do. um. I'll send you the outreach Perfect. list I would love of ideas. And, and I, I, there's probably 25 things on there. I, I suggest don't try and do everything, you know, or have one person take two items and another two. And one person call all the public schools and, and get them flyers to, to give out. Just a thought. Mm -hmm. You might get a hold of the hospitals when they send the welcome home package with the kids. Yeah, to, we're doing to put that. one in there. Good. I Number one. So I, I did hear Gallon County. Uh, that is also the second United Way. Uh, and that's a, an older program that they just met with the CEO of the hospital. There's been a lot of turnover there. So it's been a little tough, but they say that they're going to start putting the flyers in. But yeah, every every birthing hospital, uh, midwives, these are all the outreach ideas I talked <laughs> to my my new employee okay. as of yesterday. So, yep. And that's how you get them at age zero. Yes, definitely. Zero, zero. Thank you. Thank you for your passion for this. I just want to reiterate what you said about reading leads to the learning. Um, our first child is, you know, 54 years old now, but about that happened. Um, she is mentally disabled. And Kelly and I run the beginning program to get that established in Bozeman. And it was all self-contained classrooms with a few special ed kids. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to do inclusion as much as possible and get them into the classroom. And that was really successful until second grade. And then there was like this absolute division to kids who could read, people mm. who couldn't. Because she always been included in music. Well, all of a sudden in second grade, they're reading the music. They're reading the words. They're reading, and they can't, and she couldn't. And the art, there were actually instructions in art, which the teacher would try to do, but they would often. And mm -hmm. it became this, all of a sudden classes, inclusion classes that had always been okay, weren't without the ability to read. So I cannot express enough how much getting those. And we learned on the school board that the number one um, helper to children being able to do well in school was parents who read to them. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and it just separates the world. So I it realize does. that that ability to read is is a gift of the future. It's mm -hmm. a gift of freedom. It's, a, it's empowering. It's I call it a light bulb. It, when a kid it, can read a light bulb, like the whole world opens up. Every mm -hmm. every book is a right is a new world, a new adventure. So at fifty four, she yeah. still loves if someone reads her book. Mm -hmm. It's like the most exciting thing. She doesn't care what it is. My friends give her books for Christmas. Certainly, we read those. She just yeah, your kid books that she wants to read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes it's overnight and the light bulb comes on over mm -hmm. the next day. Mm -hmm. you know, they're like, so I can read, or the parent or the teacher is like, you can read. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's amazing. it's true. Well, our home, our biggest joy was the weekly trips to the library um, and uh, reading to them, and then I taught my youngest two to read. Mm -hmm. um, amazing joy, just right. amazing. Any other questions? Okay, yeah, Kelly. Susan. Okay, a friend, I'm thinking of all family. They got the young ones started. Can they use the same books for every as a child? Uh, whole family, you use one set of books, or does each child need to be registered when they get on the age? The Dolly Parton Imagination Library is supposed to keep track of which books the oldest siblings have gotten oh, and oh send a different goodness. book. Oh, my God. I have had. Not actually, not that they must be doing it because I've only had a couple parents say my kids are getting the same book, and I was like, "Well, did you move?" And then the registration link got lost. But they're supposed to get a different book. Even twins oh, um, are supposed to get a different book, so that yeah, so then next year comes along. Can they use the same book, or do they register again and get their own book? Oh, they register again. So they get yeah. another set of books. Yeah, every child okay. needs to be registered individually. Okay. Yep. So every child gets the little engine that cooks. That's true. That is the first book that they all get. And that's where a lot of parents say, hey, my kid got the same book because little engine. That is their first book. 
And then the last book is the you graduated to kindergarten book, and every kid gets that book. Right. Um, we have had it where if you have twin boys, they get the same book. Twin girls get the same book, but if oh, it's boy girl, they're different. Um, and they're set upon age levels. So infants get board books or soft books, like the board books. And then as they progress, they go older with the 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 reading and stuff like that. They get progressively harder. So um they are, if you have like four kids on it and they're all different age levels, then they're going to have different books because they're in the different age level. But if you have two kids that are in the same age level, like Irish twins, you're probably going to get the same book. <laughs> so a lot of parents, what our parents do, if they have that situation, they just put both kids on one book and then that younger kids get separate books. Yeah, and the books are by year. So every child that was born in this year you know, so if, even if they are Irish twins, and the, but they're, I don't know, they really should do yeah. different books if it's different. Kids. They should. Yeah. And then they also um, get a different committee each, uh, like I think it's every two years, they get a different committee that uh, selects that the books. Selects the books. So all the books are different throughout the years. Maybe even updated because yes. of the. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. They're all Penguin books. Mm -hmm. I've had a couple authors oh. approach me about wanting to have their book in the program. It's like, oh, so Dolly Parton right now is shipping 2.9 million books a month. And she has expanded into Australia, Australia, Ireland, and the UK and Canada. Mm -hmm. English speaking countries. So, yeah, almost 3 million books a month. Wow. And she's delivered life to date over 100 million. She just passed 100 million Gosh. like a year ago or something. But thank you for that background on the books. We've been doing it a long time. Yeah. Yeah, there's some long time affiliates. Anyone else? Thank you so much for coming and sharing. Yes, questions. I'll get you some more, a little more information. Yeah. And just remember imaginationlibrary.com. That's okay. all you have to know. Okay, perfect. Great. Perfect. Well, thank you. Yeah. Have a good rest of your meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, can I grab a more panel? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, I will. I will share. But I just definitely yeah. 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 Hey. Right, that was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Okay. All righty, Tracy Cook will now make a presentation about consulting and lifelong learning services. Thank you, Tracy. Mm -hmm. Do you want to sit or do you mind if I sit? No, I have her back. Oh, great. Oh. <laughs> See you. And Genevieve, I don't know if you uh, mind pulling up a PDF. That would be lovely. Yes, I'm not close that. to the computer. Yeah, give me one sec. I'm trying to. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. One second. Sorry. While Genevieve, while Genevieve is doing that, um, I think all of you know me, but for those of you in the audience, I'm Tracy Cook. I'm the lead consulting and learning librarian with the State Library. And um, I have been before you multiple times, commissioners. Uh, I really appreciate being given the opportunity to talk about the work of the consulting and learning team. And I would really like to be able to give you time to ask questions too. So while I do have a presentation, please don't hesitate to interrupt me as I'm talking. Because um, some of you have worked with me actually in my consulting role in particular. So the consulting and learning team, as I mentioned on the next slide, and I have their pictures on there, this, is, this group of staff, we actually work with primarily individual libraries, and we provide consulting, continuing education, and lifelong learning services and support for libraries. 
And so the way that I think about this, like in terms of Kara Orban's role as the consortia director, she's working with formal groups of libraries, often through a contractual relationship, whereas we are working one-on-one -on -one with individual libraries or very small groups of libraries. And we are focused on issues that are of importance to them um, and things that they want to solve or things that they want to do and accomplish. And so that's kind of a difference that I think of with us. You tend to see me a little bit more often because this is the arm that also manages things that you are asked to vote on pretty regularly, like the federations and their plans of service and their annual reports, the public library standards, all of those kinds of things that come to you. That's why you see us a little bit more often as well. So on the screen, we have Bobby. Um, Bobby is our new lifelong learning librarian. And I will actually start with her when we get uh, into the presentation and talking about what she does. And then there's me, of course. And then we have Suzanne Reimer, um, who is another consultant. And we have uh, Cole Bartow, who is our continuing education coordinator and whom you have also seen because he recently within the last 18 months voted on the certification program, which she manages. So um, Genevieve, if you'll go to the next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about lifelong learning, and Mrs. Gianforte was a really nice introduction to this. Um, this position came about, gosh, was it about 10 years ago now? My about that, yep. Yep. And it was because um, we recognized the role of programming in libraries in terms of learning and the importance of emphasizing and supporting informal and formal learning in libraries. And we also um, were very, at that time, very interested in the early literacy. That was a big driver of the creation of the Lifelong Learning Program because it was just really clear what a difference it makes, particularly from zero to three, for children and parents and grandparents and caregivers to know about the development of those learning and reading skills. And so what libraries were, um, what we were trying to do was help libraries strengthen their story times and their programming to incorporate different skill sets that actually help encourage kids to learn and parents to like practice with their children. And so that's the kind of the ready to read concept of read, talk, sing, play, and write. And so those are the five critical skills that if children are exposed to, especially in that zero to three, it really helps them be ready to read. And also as Mrs. Gianforte pointed out, ready to learn. Because the, all of those particular skill sets, they do different things. So like obviously writing helps them with the concepts that they'll need throughout their life to be able to write. Um, singing helps them hear the phonetic sounds and be able to kind of pull the words together. Reading obviously is helping them with recognizing stories. And as they grow, like, you know, as babies, the most important part is just the sounds and the words and the exposure. But as they get older, that ability to recognize the concepts of stories mm -hmm. and the subject and activity and action and what all of those pieces of a story are helps them be more successful in school because then they're able to understand and comprehend what they're reading. And so we really wanted to make sure that libraries were doing everything they could to incorporate this into their story times and help parents and guardians be able to do this for their children and to reach especially any children who might not be normally coming to the library as well. And so that was kind of where this concept of having a lifelong learning librarian came from. And then we wanted to just include everyone from babies to older adults. And so the program began to expand with the idea being that we would scan kind of the nation and Montana and the research and bring that information back to libraries. And so a lot of what Bobby is doing is partnering with other state agencies. She's looking at the research out there, the latest research about how to encourage learning, how to design your programming. And then she's trying to tie it to particular audiences that libraries have expressed interest in. And so on this slide, I mentioned some of the things uh, she is doing. Um, early literacy, uh, you may be aware of the virtual programming series. This came out of COVID 
and has turned out to be a very popular, popular series. So she just did one on rock hounding and geology that I think we have over 200 people have already viewed it. We've done mushroom foraging. Um, feedback from that virtual programming series is Montanans have just expressed a real love of it. It's like they get to go back to college without paying the tuition fee and taking the exams, um, but they learn really interesting things as well. And it, one of the things we really are trying to do, and particularly in the consulting and learning arm, is, is certainly we support the largest public libraries. We do. However, we're really trying to do everything we can to help those small one to two person libraries be able to offer really nice services and programming in their communities, even though they may not have the capacity because they're doing so much, those librarians. The creative aging program is something that is so interesting to me and I really love, and I hope we can pull this off. It's a pilot program this year. It's bringing teaching artists into libraries to run six to eight weeks, eight week series where older adults can learn things like watercolor, oil painting, digital photography. And then they have a culminating event where they showcase their artwork. The organization, the national organization Lifetime Arts who is partnering with us on this and the Montana Arts Council have pointed out these kinds of programs really help address social isolation, which is something that our communities have really indicated is an issue the loneliness. They've actually done some longitudinal studies now that really show that even this, this aspect of coming together with other older adults to learn art and then to showcase your art can help with physical health and of course mental health as well. And so these are the kinds of things we are thinking about as we're trying to identify how to help libraries because there are a million different directions you can go in with lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. So what is, what is it that Montanans need what are their biggest challenges? And then where does it make sense for libraries to help? And the Creative Aging Program is one of those examples of us trying to just get all of that criteria and do something kind of really cool and different. So I can report back on that if you have any interest. And then the bottom two things, the trunk programs and the summer reading, um, this is actually continuing that idea of literacy but it also combines our work with the other side of the state library. At your last meeting, you heard a lot about natural heritage and the GIS. So the trunk program combines both in many ways. So we have like a giant map of Montana, which teaches how to read maps, but we also include, we try to include books and um, ideas for activities that libraries can use in their programs. So they can check these trunks out and they can make it a very educational event. And so it's been pretty fun to be able to combine both sides of the state library through that trunk program as well. And then summer reading is something that is really important. It does really make a difference in terms of the reading slide that um, schools see if their students keep reading. And so it's of course a long time tradition with libraries to do summer reading. And so we try to support that by helping them brainstorm, giving them access to materials through the Collaborative Library Summer Program um, that they can use to design their summer reading. So that was a lot. Before I go on, <laughs> do you have any questions for me? Um, I do. Yeah. Um, so where are the pilot programs for the creative aging? Yep, yeah. so Browning, Glasgow, Haver, Foresight. I'm blanking out a moved one. No, I can't remember the fifth one. Oh, how embarrassing. <laughs> I'll get back to you, Rob. Okay. <laughs> Brown, Glasgow, Haver, Foresight. Yes. Okay. Yeah, more. Yeah. There's one more, too. Oh, Eureka. You're no. to come to Eureka. <laughs> there you go. That's great. That's <laughs> great. That's 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 great. Boy, that is, have you been to Eureka? Yes. I'm sure you have. Yeah. Oh, yeah. man, it's all the middle. Mm -hmm. That is. Tracy has been everywhere. I'm sure you have. Been. <laughs> what was I saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been, been, been everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. Yes, I can relate to that song. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Shall I move on for you yes. or do you? Yeah, okay. okay. All right. How many Trump programs do you have? You said they could borrow. Oh, let me let me find out the number. I 
like my husband doesn't get this, but I am not good at numbers, Stanley. Like okay. I remember like people and places, but I, I thought there were five. I think that sounds right. Because there's the bear trunk, the map trunk. Yep. I'm there's, pretty sure there's five. I think there's an ungulate and then there's creepy Carly's track. Water, there's water, water, track. So there's there's maybe more than five. Six or seven. seven. Yeah. yeah. Six or seven. Yeah. So yeah. Bear map. Creepy crawly tracks, tracks. ungulate, ungulates, water, ungulates. There was bats. 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 Thank bats. you. There is bats. <laughs> NASA. Oh yeah, the NASA one. So that's eight. Yeah, we'll get back to you. Yeah, we will. That's a great question. We'll Should get back to you. <laughs> okay. So Tracy, on on this um, mm -hmm. services, what you were talking about. So you're calling on your life and consulting, the lifelong learning, and the certification program. Those three things are. Yep. Those three under. boxes are, fall under me. Okay. Yes, so that's, that's the lead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So those those three things are handled by four staff, four full time staff. About. Yeah, we have a vacancy, so there's five of us total. Okay. Madam Chair. Yeah, I was actually going to ask this question this afternoon under the uh, task, our task list, our work mm -hmm. list on page 14. But <clears throat> it said you have completed the summer reading re re a book list. Can we get a copy of that book list? Yeah. It was not, it's on, mm -hmm. it, or I can ask this afternoon. Okay, I can look it up for you. It's on your, which one? The work, which one? Uh, you mentioned that you have the summer reading. It's under the work plan. Oh, do you mean the summer reading? Like, I think what it, it said you completed your list of recommended books and it was. Um, oh, that sounds. I don't know what that is. I mean, I'll have to look that up. Where is it? I thought I saw that. Sorry. Well, I'm waiting for my running my book books to realize they have to do something. <laughs> um, it says uh, provide access to online summer reading materials and provide. Um, at least three summer reading planning sessions. Oh, yeah. That, and that's um, completed. Yes, that is not a list of books. So what that is, is we purchase access for all public libraries in Montana. It costs about $900 a year for an online summer reading program manual that comes through, through Collaborative uh, Library Summer Program, CS, CSLP. Collaborative Summer Library Program. And that provides libraries with programming ideas, activities that they can use to design a summer reading program. And it has a theme. It's a national group that comes together. They have um, representatives from all over. Um, and then they pick a theme and then they create artwork and activities that libraries can use to design their summer reading program. And then the Lifelong Learning Librarian meets with librarians from around Montana to brainstorm ideas for how to implement those programs and activities. That's what we do. We don't okay. have an actual list. Because I looked up and, mm -hmm. and tried to find out from other commissioners what CLFP was, and it didn't come up on anybody's mm -hmm. acronyms. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what is it? Collaborative Summer Library Program. And that's a summer learning program. Is it learning? It's okay. Because I was corrected in our board. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Collaborative Summer learning. Program. So, can we get a copy or uh, of the manual? Just a, a um, you know, a connection to it or something, so we sure. can read it. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to get a piece. So, is it the nine hundred dollars per library or nine hundred dollars for the state? For the state. Oh, for the yeah. Time. Yeah. yeah. And where are the other? Do you know? I do not know. I, okay. I will look that up. Yeah, I would just like to get a connection mm -hmm. to them so I can look up what they provided for the summer yeah. and what their theme is. I will send you a link to their website and then I'll find out about the manual and how to get access to that. Yeah, yep. That's the word I couldn't find. Okay. And I'll add sure. PSLP to your acronym list. So yeah. 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 Yes. Gotcha. yes but, uh, it's been many years, but I used that manual when yeah. I did the. Mm -hmm. A program in Shelby, and it's it's like 
flyers and pictures and things that go with the theme so you can put up the flyers at the school and stuff mm -hmm. and, and yeah. ideas of activity art projects and things that go um and so it, it it's kind of like a teacher's manual mm -hmm. kind yeah. of thing yeah. to help you yeah. help you do that so yeah. you don't have to recreate it all and find it so it's Good. a great time yeah time. that's what that's a great description of it thank you mm -hmm. okay and I was really disappointed. I think, like you were too, that Flathead uh, Library decided not to use that anymore a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you've yeah. looked into it further after the comments our children's librarian gave us. I um I actually put it on Bobby's radar to to take a look at it, and I had a series of questions. Um, so what Carmen is talking about is at the last Flathead County Library Board meeting, which I was able to be at. Um, they had a, a presentation about. Flathead County Library chooses to use their, their own and not use collaborative summer library summer learning program. Um, and, and she listed her reasons why, which I thought were really great reasons. She mentioned that it doesn't seem to address the needs of very young children. So I've asked Bobby to explore that. And Bobby said that um, now it has changed and they've really improved the kind of ability to provide activities and ideas for that much younger, the two to three year olds. Mm -hmm. So that's really improved quite a bit uh, as well. And then there were some other things that I think Flathead County Library is lucky enough to have a large enough staff they can do that program. Uh, whereas, you know, some of the libraries who are using this, they're only one or two people. So it's kind of, it does mm -hmm. give them some ideas and some ability to do that. Uh, the other thing she mentioned was that the themes can be very challenging sometimes. Um, so we wanted to kind of look at that. And what I mean by that is challenging to find books that fit that theme as you're reading through it. It does give you, I think as a library, if you have that ability and luxury, it does actually, it's very freeing to have your own program. You know, you can do whatever you want and create whatever you want as well. You're not tied in to some other um, ideas. But if you don't really have the time, if you do everything, you know, order the books, put them on the shelf, help the patrons do summer reading, it's very nice to have a out of the box kind of thing you can look at. Well, and you also don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yes, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Weekly enough, because I I looked into it and then was very disappointed that we are not using. It. Yeah, and that's why I said why why are we because. If the state library mm -hmm. pays nine hundred dollars a year mm -hmm. to get the flyer, the theme, the materials, uh, an instruction book for the person running the program, mm -hmm. that's a really great deal. Mm -hmm. It's it um, is. So yes. Yeah. We'll we'll explore mm -hmm. it more. I think at our library. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We do have librarians if you'd mm -hmm. like to hear from mm -hmm. them about how they use it. I mm -hmm. but I don't want to. I want to be respectful of your time. So do you? Shall we move on or? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. okay. All right, so um, Genevieve has kindly moved to the next slide where I talk a little bit about key priorities. Um, lifelong learning, this particular area is an area where I am often very, very moved by people's experiences with the program. Um, I, it is absolutely important to think about how many people use it, uh, the service and all of that. But I know for me personally, my bone is, did it make a difference for a Montana and did it really help them? And lifelong learning, some of the things we've done have brought tears to my eyes. I shared one of the quotes. Um, this was a, a child, she was, I believe two at the time and she had not spoken a word. She had not said anything. Um, you know, her parents were, despairing. It was very, very stressful for them. They went to the library and this uh, children's library and at this library had been to our ready to read rendezvous and learned puppet uh, songs and had begun to incorporate them in story time. And this mother sent a video of this children's librarian of her daughter for the first time ever performing the puppet song. Mm -hmm. And th these are the kinds of quotes we get from the lifelong learning. And that's the stuff that's my bone. I'm trying not to tear up on you. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the stories about like family members with um, uh, a loved one with Alzheimer's, seeing the Alzheimer's art exhibit and realizing they could connect. Those are the things that are really important to me. Mm -hmm. And um, this is the program that gives you that, but but we do have numbers <laughs> and we do have stats. 
and that you can find that on the lifelong learning dashboard. Um, we do try to pay attention to what programs are most popular, what's the use, you know, how much does it cost financially? But really, when we start out, it's like, what do we want to do? What are we trying to accomplish? What do Montanans need? And, and I would say the things that right now are rising to the top for us is addressing social isolation and loneliness, because that's a huge issue in Montana, uh, addressing health, mental health and physical health, and then literacy, of course. So those are the things that we're really kind of thinking about, and how does this program help advance that? What do librarians need from us to support that? What partnerships, what resources, and what training to be most successful at that? So working with uh, Dolly Parton, mm -hmm. imagine mm -hmm. libraries. Mm -hmm. It's a, it could mm -hmm. be, I mean, very key for. Yes. The, so the librarians are so grateful to Mrs. Jean Forte for starting that and for um, helping them support that. Uh, they do work with their friends or volunteers or foundation. And they, as, as you know, Lori kind of shared her own experiences. They also take an active role in it themselves, mm -hmm. trying to reach out to people. And that's something that's of real interest to Bobby and I in particular. How do we reach those parents and families who just don't come to the library for whatever reason, you know, like maybe they can't get to the library, but how do we help them have access to books and library services? Because it really does make a difference. It, it's huge. I mean, I would love to see a longitudinal study because it, it's disheartening to me that so many Montana kids don't read at grade level. You know, that's really disheartening. And I'd love to see if we can like whittle away at that. But that's a longitudinal study. Well, and you also have, as a librarian and a kindergarten mm -hmm. teacher, thank you probably, where when they come to kindergarten, this is the first book they've ever checked out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's from the school library. Yeah. Which is very, very sad. And it's so hard to recover. That's the thing. Right. You don't recover really from losing right. out on that early literacy. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so important. I mean, you can, but not not to the same extent. I have a question yeah. on your creative aging pilot. Yep. Um. So the the Dillon Library has seven Stay Sharp kits mm -hmm. for dementia and Alzheimer's, and I was wondering if that would be something that the state library would be able to look into, like your kits that are the trunks mm -hmm. that get sent out, um, the textile things. Uh, memory games, mm -hmm. photos, they're really, really neat, but... Um, That's a great suggestion. Where they, did you get your state, your state shark kits? Where did... Uh, Penworthy. Mm -hmm. And then there's, there's quite a few of them. What but, made you decide to do that? Uh, the population of Dillon uh, is... Is aging? Is aging. Okay. Mm -hmm. 65 and older is over 60% of oh, the population. Good. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing more families come in with dementia issues and caregivers and stuff and the caregivers can come in and check them out and keep them for a week and it creates discussions and that's what it was for is to create discussion and memories and trying to that is great and we work with the local hospital on them yeah and nice yeah i asked a question yes yeah um trace i had written down the same thing for special needs and disability which is one of my pushes right now for the libraries that they we yeah. help them have a program um, mm -hmm. because those folks are isolated. Yeah. They're in oftentimes in apartments and homes where all they can do is watch TV. Yeah. Um and a outing to the library would be oh. incredible. Yeah. And they often have their own transportation. But maybe a trunk program for special needs with everything you're talking about mm -hmm. with the different mm -hmm. level of books, the different, yes. you know, mm -hmm. that would be a, a really big help just to help libraries because I've talked to several of our libraries and they do want to have an outreach to that program. And mm -hmm. in each town, there's already people that are sort of set up for that. And that would be really helpful, I think. Um, is Elsie still on the line with us? I was going to ask Elsie if she. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Elsie. I wondered if you do you see any crossover with the Department of Education and what they're talking about with summer reading programs that that were duplicating the same things or 
What are they doing with the, the Department of Education or with OPI and with summer reading programs? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, Tracy, is there much work? I know you've got uh, Cole, who also, she was such a great employee here at our agency. So I'm sure she mm -hmm. does have, uh, Cole does have that. But Tracy, when it does come to, I'm gonna throw this back to you. Um, are you in tune to our new reading standards that we are doing? I heard a little bit, of course, from uh, our first lady but we are mm -hmm. renewing our uh, early literacy as well as um, all of our reading standards in K-12. I don't mm -hmm. think there's much communication, but would you like to expound on what communication from the library to us there is? Hi, Elsie, this is Jenny, and I can answer that question for you. We do align the Ready to Read Early Literacy Program to all of the state's early learning standards, and we do pay close attention to the state's reading standards for how we design these lifelong learning programs. And, and if I may, Tammy, I would also share that um, I just fielded a phone call from a school librarian who is in an area where there is not a public library not close by and she wanted to do a summer reading program. And so, you know, I said, we have some spaces with that online manual. I'd be happy to share it with you. I'd be happy to connect you mm -hmm. with the nearest public librarian so that you can be supported in doing the summer reading. So we do that too. Great. Yeah. So there's the back and forth with that. Yeah, absolutely. For those schools that are have invested in the summer reading, we are happy to help them and share however we and can. And some of the smaller ones just don't have the money. They can't even stay open. Yes, so. exactly. Yeah, well, that's a great question. And I do also want to share, I've been going in a million different directions, so I don't have a ton of details, but I'd be happy to have Bobby speak with you, but I was like, I have such great staff. And she's like, I hope you don't mind, Tracy, but I reached out to Marilyn with the Talking Book Library because we want to do summer reading for kids who have visual impairments. And so she is on that. She loves that. So I will share that. Thank you. Yeah. I just really appreciate yeah. them not being invisible. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. No, I, I, I'm very interested in that. All right. Anything else with lifelong learning? Well, I have a question, just curiosity. On, yeah. on I'm not, I, I'm having trouble getting up the bottom page, but it's on your one about um, evaluation, and you had down below, which is really impressive, that 62% of the people were very happy um, or strongly agreed that their needs were being met. But what you had here that some people said they needed more concrete programs and or more concrete program themes. Was that for children, adults? And what what was what did you think that was referring to? Probably all of the above would be my guess. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because we do cover babies to older adults. Yeah. So and so 40% yeah. saying we need more concrete. I didn't know what they meant by that. I wondered if that helped you do what they meant. Um <clears throat> I am not. Well, I would say we actually talk to librarians all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I have learned, and I'm sure everyone has this experience, like all of us, we sometimes need people to ask us probing questions to figure out what concrete programs we need. And so we actually started just being like, what are you seeing in your communities? What do you see as needs? And then using that, and that's where Bobby really does come in because she's scanning to see what else is going on. And she's connecting libraries or other state agencies to deliver more concrete kinds of programs for them. Because this, you know, you would think 10 years is long enough, you'd have it solid. But I would say we were figuring out this position when we first started it. And so it was more uh, squishy, <laughs> for lack of a better word. And so I think over the years, that's why you're seeing much more concrete, like the virtual programming and the creative aging. And the trunks. And the trunks. Yeah. yeah, we are really trying to solidify that. And, and I would add that we want this effort to be research-based, as yes. Tracy said. We want to adopt proven practices in libraries that have research-based track records to actually address the needs that we're trying to address. And yes. address Montana's needs. Yes. Montana. <laughs> yes. And 
I would say also leaving it flexible enough because Montana is so different, you know, so like how do we build programs that will work for Bozeman, but also work for more Montana, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so we're thinking about that stuff too. For your week, I mean, <laughs> so far, yes. Yes. All right. Well, I'll move into the continuing education work then. So this is uh, Cole Barto, and uh, she manages our certification program. So of course, this is the library directors, public library directors are required to earn 60 hours in four years. Uh, for everyone else, it's voluntary. They can do it if they choose. Um, and she manages that program and she assists and answers any questions uh, library directors, board members, library staff might have about where to get continuing education credits, what counts, you know, how to actually develop continuing education plans. She's really been trying to work with libraries to do that so that the CE is very meaningful. That's something that's very important to me um, is that if we ask people to invest the time in continuing education, I want it to be useful to them and I want them to learn. And I really ideally want like a change, like something improves as a result of that. And so Cole has begun to work with library directors and boards in developing CE plans that are built on what that library needs, what that person needs to learn in order to do a better job. And that's all tied to that desire for continuing education to be meaningful and valuable. And then uh, Cole supports us in finding presenters for our face-to-face -face sessions, for taking care of the logistics, of course, that go on behind the scenes. She also helps our staff and actually other state library staff with instructional design. So really trying to incorporate adult education principles, helping people create training that actually is, I hope, fun and engaging and meaningful. And again, some kind of learning takes place as well. So that's very important to me as well. She has also really, really beefed up our online learnings, our webinars and our self-paced courses to try and be able to give people access to CE when they need it and when it's convenient for them. And that was great because personally, like I have a lot of knowledge in my head about budget and finance and laws. And it was Cole who was like, you need to get that out of your head and into something that others can access it. And I was like, oh, that's a really great idea, Cole. <laughs> so those are all things she has done as well. Um, in the key priorities for continuing education, the next slide, uh, I share that graph that is what people have indicated, you know, do they think that this learning will improve library services? That's what you're seeing there. And then I also shared a quote um, from someone who just mentioned Cole. This is actually about the continuing education coordinator. We try to evaluate, encourage people to evaluate every session we teach and um, ask for feedback, both to improve, but also to kind of try and figure out did they get something out of it as well. And then I'll do a lot of informal kinds of things. Uh, because I'm out there working with the libraries, as is Suzanne, um, and Bobby and Cole will do it a little bit too. You know, if we have someone who mentions, hey, because of that training, you made us sit through Tracy about developing outcome statements. I actually was able to get several more grants this year because they they depend on that and it helped me evaluate how it did. And so I'm just looking for those kinds of informal things as well uh, to make sure that our learning actually made a change or made a difference. So um, we, but like I said, we do have access to that and the continuing education dashboard does highlight some of that for you as well. And I'm sure that I am missing, Cole does so many things behind the scenes um, as well, but do you have any questions for me about the continuing education part of our work? Thank you. Yes. I would just like to commend your concern mm -hmm. that trainings matter. Because we can waste time. Yeah. So thank you for being on top. And Kalea, so yes. Yes. Yeah. No, definitely. Yes, Carmen. Um, I can testify that the new online courses for trustees are really great because they deal with the financing, the legal stuff, then really when you're a new trustee. That's the first thing you need to know. Mm -hmm. So those new online classes have been highly recommended for trustees. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks Thank for that you. feedback. 
That's helpful. Yeah. Tracy, we brought this up earlier um, in a, a session last year, but it's so important because we're responsible by by the statute to oversee the, mm -hmm. the training of the certification. Um, and so we talk about when you sign on without out groups from outside to allow them mm -hmm. to get credit for training, that there be a really good filtering system as to what they're teaching mm -hmm. and that you, we're all aware of that and we're comfortable mm -hmm. with what it is and it's foundational. Um, has that happened? Have, have we pursued that at all? I mean, our, who is there? Is there a selection process that's monitored for who can come in and teach these? So give, give credits or is approved to give credits. So you know, certainly for anything we do, we are we are monitoring Years that. Are yeah. Um, the struggle that I have, Tammy, is being sure that I am respectful of local decision-making. And so we went through and we really pointed out, like, these are the criteria for what counts. And this, this is the air, these are the areas, library administration, services to the public, uh, collection management, and technical services and technology that you need to focus on. And then we work with them. But, but the process we have currently is that it happens at the local level, and if the continuing education credits meet the requirements for learning and fall within those areas, then that's up to the local library to decide. And I, I would say we did an analysis, and I, I think most of them are very much foundational. I don't know if you want to add anything, Jenny, or if I... Just, I think you described it well. Do you okay. have more questions, Tammy? Yeah, do you? Well, I was trying to find, um, hang on a second. Mm -hmm. I, I have a picture. I, I wrote it down. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those I have to read sideways because mm -hmm. I can't turn it right. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the programs last year actually had an entire section on privileged people who are mm -hmm. holding other people um, basically empowerment over other people and it listed that the people who are holding power other people and remember this is montana mm -hmm. were white people able-bodied people heterosexuals males christians middle or owning class people mm -hmm. middle-aged people and english-speaking people and they were all listed as people who are in authority holding power over other people unfairly Mm -hmm. I thought that defined almost Montana, except for the middle age it defined me. Mm -hmm. um, and I just found that uh, frankly offensive and very inappropriate for Montana. That was a group called Empower Montana. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't think they should be approved to teach something like this that's so out of line for Montana. Mm -hmm. I mean, those groups cover our state. Yeah, there somewhere or other, and mm -hmm. you're saying that every one of those people is abusing power over people. That that's a very, very. I, I found that unpleasant. So I just really encourage because I think you bring your whole group. I'm so impressed with, and when you're in charge of it, you bring incredible, meaty, necessary educational topics, mm -hmm. which. Credit should be. Now, I have no problem if a local library wants to teach this class. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. That's their choice. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the more local control, the better off it is. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we, as a state certified, mandated by statute to define certification, should be offered that. So that was my concern. So uh, I yeah. just wanted to make sure we brought that up. And mm -hmm. I want to make sure that's sort of, we talked about what is the process to decide. Yeah. And I don't know where that process is. Yeah, it's, you know, that was not one of our trainings. Certainly we got, you know, if the libraries chose to take it and they wanted to go through maybe the discomfort of learning about that, they could get credit. It was on our list. Right, yes. but that was because it was MLA, Montana Library Association. And we have like a 150 year tradition of communicating when MLA is offering their credits as well. And we debated that, but it seems like there's such a rich history that I think there's no way throughout history, in my way of thinking, you're not going to have things that you may disagree on, but should you end it 
if 99% of it is fine. I Do you know what I'm trying to say here? I'm probably not saying it very eloquently. Higher course, every thing about an hour and month, and none of it was fine. I think what's most relevant to, to our work mm -hmm. is what is defined in the, the continuing education manual exactly. that sets the criteria. And as Tracy yes. said, that criteria has to do with library administration, mm -hmm. public service, technology, and is I'm it possible to use time. your judgment and discretion and possibly say, sorry, we won't be advertising that on the Montana State Library website? Or we, we could. I guess my discomfort, Robin, is um I understand that, but that would I I agree with that. Yeah. Completely. I'm just wondering if that's I mean, I'm sure we could, but I, Once I guess we put it on our web page. We have we have given it our stamp of proof. We really have. And I think that should be very protected because we are mandated by the state to do that. And we have, a, that's not something we just choose to do because it's needed and wonderful. We are mandated to oversee the certification process. And that process needs to be very carefully designed to meet the needs of the people. And these programs are great if individual libraries. I think they can contact individual libraries, no problem. So John. So do we do we have a document that guides the content of continuing ed classes that we that we offer, that we promote, that we do, or do we automatically take over classes from a whole list of entities? So I think I think actually your question is more like what do we promote and what do we not promote? Because I think in listening to you, you're not really concerned about what the state library is offering. You know, so far you've been okay with right. you yes. know our offerings. Yes. It's it's who do we promote and um how do we go about promoting it? And we have definitely started adding a little clause that says the views of this presenter do not represent necessarily the state library okay mm -hmm. so we have added that clause um but really it's on that calendar it tends to be state library federations or the montana library association that's pretty much it uh, we will forward a web junction from oclc they have a lot of online classes we will forward that but we're not putting it on our website we just forward it so that people are aware of it because one of the main questions that Cole gets is where can I earn continuing education credits and how so that is a need that's out there is to let people know about mm -hmm. the different options mm -hmm. I, I guess may I think about your question and talk about it with yes family and others yeah. and just to close this out without mm -hmm. pulling us off too long mm -hmm. um, I used to present workshops for schools and governments all over the nation mm -hmm. and um, I had to apply, whether it was with realtors, bankers, accountants, um, I had to apply to be a state certification trainer. So for the Montana Board of Real Estate, they would bring me in for a workshop, but they, the people wanted credit. Mm -hmm. And I had to make sure my materials aligned with what they needed under their mm -hmm. credit. Otherwise, when they brought me in, they would bring me in as perhaps a, a speaker that's doing a general session, but he's not accredited to the realtors or not accredited to the bankers. And you really have to jump through hoops to make sure you are accredited. That's what I'm talking about, protecting that accreditation. Mm -hmm. It's all over the country. It's every board. And so if you're going to go in and speak for nurses, you have to show if they're going to get certification credit for it, it has to deal with certain topics. So I think that's where we need to really protect that certification all right i promise to go back and chat yeah it'd be great we could be fun to have them yes yeah. thank you okay thank you so much and oh for what you do mm -hmm. um, and i'm sorry i can't put names with the people that's okay cole cole is the one with the red shirt and which one was bobby bobby was the one with the pink uh sweater and glasses darker, yeah. hair. darker hair okay yep. and then um suzanne is the is in front of the beach I wonder if that was helpful. Oh, I don't know. All right. So the last piece is the consulting work.
One more question. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm continuing it mm -hmm. um, because I did it and I had a really hard time with the mechanics of it and I had to contact Kalei yes. many, many times. Yes. She always did help me out. Um, I'm wondering how much of her time was spent simply on the mechanics. Yes. One thing that blew my mind is that I take the class somewhere but that the system doesn't know I took the class, so I just have to go into a completely different system and tell it I took this class. Yes. And then apparently I am believable. And yes, you took that class, I get the credit for it. So mm -hmm. I wish there was a way to just remove that barrier of that and how to do it. Yes. Um, not not talking about the content at all, but the how to. Yeah. As a non library insider, it was. Yes. Um, I completely agree. We all agree. We would love to make Aspen easier to, we would actually love really to perhaps consider an out of the box program that's designed, the software's designed to do that. That was built in house and um, it, gives, it gave me a great appreciation for why you need to invest a lot of money in software design. Mm -hmm. the, the, the issue is the barrier with cost of purchasing out of the box software for that content management. It's actually pretty steep. I will check in with Cole. Um, I I believe that there may be a way to connect the Moodle, the which is the online learning courses with Aspen, um, but I may be I may be incorrect in that. So let me just visit with Cole about that. So I will do that. And, and I'm wondering, you know, just you mentioned nurses; they have certification. What other state agencies? Doing certification and how do how do they do it? The teachers do. Does anybody have an automated? So yeah, that that's a good idea. That's a good idea. The OPIs is um, speaking for Elsie. Sorry, Elsie. Um, OPIs is very easy oh. to to go through. Okay. Um, you they keep track of somehow they keep are able to keep Elsie explain your. Continuing it, <laughs> they keep track of your credits. Um, mm -hmm. I don't even know how, mm -hmm. um, by paperwork or or even just taking their online certification courses, and it just goes right to your page. Correct, Elsie? Mm -hmm. Are you still here? Elsie. Well, I can okay. tell you that they have online certification for plumbing. Mm -hmm. My husband mm -hmm. hasn't taken, mm -hmm. and cosmetologists mm -hmm. have it. Nutrition, like oh, yeah, they, yeah, every group has certification classes that they have to have. Yep. And Kelly, my son, had to go at least once or twice a year and spend a day or two days in a plumbing certification mm -hmm. class. So, yeah. this mm -hmm. is not unusual. And again, it's very highly guarded by the commission responsible for it. And the farmers have to get a culture of chemical, mm -hmm. chemicals mm -hmm. licenses. Mm -hmm. and yep. Of course, we wish them the so just, after, we'll see what oh, software yes. they have. Mm -hmm. And and yeah. how much it costs. <laughs> right. That was kind of the issue. The last time we checked, it was like, wow. That's Elsie would probably have information when she's mm -hmm. not busy. Well, and Cole, that was right. Cole's right. work. Right. So right. I can yeah. ask Cole. Right. You know. Yep. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it time to go back to paper and filing cabinets? <laughs> It, it was actually easier, although, <laughs> although the computers do the math. That's nice. Yeah. The, governor's, the governor's top priority is digital first. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do the plumbing one. How to fix it, how to push. <laughs> I can say that the state library has been very, very helpful with my trustees and my staff yeah, in right. making sure that their credits are on yeah. their, under their names and stuff like that. So They've been very, very helpful. And again, I appreciate closing it. Without yeah. what you do is always, mm -hmm. it seems very appropriate. We're talking yes. about the outside groups that have been allowed to get on the pages offering their things. Mm -hmm. I think we have to be protected. Yes, I think okay. you, you all, everything I've ever watched has been very productive and, and precise and to the point, just great. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So shall I talk about consulting? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this is this is Suzanne and myself, and this is where the vacancy is. Pam Henley retired in March, and so what we do is we go directly to the libraries. I try we try to visit every main public library at least once a year, and I actually. I asked my other staff, the continuing education coordinator and the lifelong learning librarian to do a little bit of that as well, because there is nothing like being in that library for making you very realistic about how you should design state library programs. There is just something about seeing their experiences that really educates you about how small these libraries are, how isolated they might be and what they need. We answer questions from libraries, any library related questions. We provide training. We create and update a lot of the resources. So we're the ones who did the new library director's handbook um, for libraries that are interested in running mill levy campaigns. We have a handbook about that for libraries that are interested in becoming library districts. That's all us. So that we are the ones doing that. And I would say we're doing a lot of the library administration. So we're doing a lot of the support for library boards and for library directors and planning and policy writing and so forth. Kind of, I think of them as the things that if they run smoothly, it frees libraries up to do good stuff on the front end for their community members. And so we'll do a lot of problem solving with the librarians. Um, we also will help them. You know, I've helped libraries who wanted to start homebound services, helping a library that's trying to get a district up and running, helping with facilities. Um, so that it runs the gamut in terms of what we do. And then, as I mentioned, this is the arm that manages the federations and the public library standards as well. So we are the ones who do that. And then on the next slide, you'll see the, the statistics for the consulting. Uh, we just finished a short trustee videos. We were trying to do really bite-sized five to 15 minutes so that boards could watch them before their board meeting if they wanted and discuss it. Things on you know how to run effective meetings, how to work with library support groups, those kinds of things. Um, and then given all of the funding coming through and actually the absolute importance for a lot of people to have internet access at their local library, we've been focusing on that as well. And so for libraries, um, we've been helping them invest in new cabling and new network equipment. It's a one-time only kind of thing, but it really makes a difference in terms of speed and quality of network, which is really pretty important because for a lot of Montanans, who do not have access at home, the library is their place, either in the computers or their Wi-Fi at the library. So that's been a key focus. And then I just shared a couple of comments um, that we've received. I think the consulting arm is kind of much more personal. So the comments and evaluations tend to be more about like that, that person to person kind of assistance. Mm -hmm. Any questions or comments for me? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, All right. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah. Thanks, Genevieve. Okay, we will be going on now to the consent agenda. Does anyone want anything pulled from the consent agenda to be discussed separately? Madam Chair? Yes. I have a question about the third quarter financial report. Just an update that we received in the, in the budget committee about the NLI, NLI account. We could bring that up during this time. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I would like to pull out briefly the minutes from the last meeting from I was sure getting very I mean to then mm -hmm. pull them up. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Tom. Mm -hmm. Well, I assume we'll have the report first. Um uh, or join it and then yeah, the consent agenda typically is just you've seen it. We'll approve it, but if you want to pull it out, then we can show it. Okay. So, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll just ask Melissa if she'll update the full commission on the shortage in market. Yes, I'm happy to. Um, so, in the last couple of weeks, uh, we have noticed a pretty significant. Melissa, could you come up? So maybe. Um, yeah, so mm -hmm. you want to put me on the spot? Yeah, no, I wanted to um, 
the owl thing or whatever or the thing is. Secretary of Education or whatever the hearing is. <laughs> <laughs> <Whatever. laughs> is it an yeah. owl? Oh, the superintendent. Okay, go ahead. So we talked about this at the Finance Committee that was on Friday. And um, we monitor our Montana land information account regularly. Um, and we've noticed a concerning decrease in the amount of funds that come into that account. So that account is a state special revenue fund. And, and just as a reminder, that revenue comes from the recordation fees that are collected at the clerk and the clerk's office in the local governments. Um, and so they are they are low enough that we decided to go and have a conversation with the governor's office, um, yeah. specifically with Nancy Hall, who's our budget analyst in the budget office. And so they're going to take a look and help us do some research. Um, we know that the that our these revenues are tied to the real mostly to the real estate market um, because those transactions have a recordation associated with them, and we know that that trend is slowing. Um, but the the what we're seeing is a much steeper decline than what we would expect. So um, we are monitoring this very closely. Like I said, we're talking with the governor's office. Um, and we hope to work with the local governments as well to just figure out why, what's happening. Um, so unfortunately, that's all the information that I have at this point is that there is an issue and we're on it. Um, but we will definitely keep you all apprised as we get more information. Um, if this trend is accurate, then we might have to make some adjustments in our future year's budgeting um, so that our cash will match what we actually spend. Um, but I, I can't give you more information right now, but we'll let you know. Uh, does it appear that we will have, um, according to trends, trend lines, uh, sufficient cash to meet the obligations we have in that account? For this fiscal year? I, I can't say with certainty because the revenue comes in each month. So if I look at the trends from how the, how the dollars come in the last three months of the year, I think yes. Um, we haven't made any cuts at this point. I don't know that we need to make any cuts at this point. Um, I want to see what the next month or two look like. We're also running projections, which we typically do this time of year anyway. Um, and so when we're looking at those projections, which is just how much we're gonna, we anticipate spending for the rest of the quarter, the rest of this fiscal year, we'll, uh, we will um, compare that to what the collections are looking like for the last quarter and make, make decisions as we get more information. But I don't believe that we'll have to make any adjustments this fiscal year. Thank you. Uh, could this have a bearing on what we should present to the EPP process June 5th? I don't know that I can answer that just yet because we don't know what is causing this. Is it an error? Is it is it is it actually this low? And and you know if if these revenues are actually this low, then other entities that benefit from this revenue would also be seeing these trends, and it would cause a, a ripple effect to to many entities. So I I don't feel comfortable answering that at this point. Because we only have six weeks before we have to be doing some of that right. presenting. Right, and there's, That's true. there's plenty of points along the executive planning and legislative process where if in fact there's continues to be a problem, those those requests could be correct, adjusted. True. Okay. Yeah, but, but based on what we know now, we just don't have enough information that I feel would warrant us changing what we would present. Well, thank you for keeping an eye on this. Yes, my job. Yes. <laughs> thank you for noticing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, 100%. Yes. So could I just ask, Melissa, you said that the revenues are tied to the real estate market. Could you explain what that means? You want me to? Sure. 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 So whenever you have a real estate transaction, as you know, we go to the title company and we sign many, many documents. Each page that is recorded through that process has a fee associated that we all pay. It's one of those line items that we see when we're looking at the, the costs of that transaction. I believe that 
that fee is somewhere around nine dollars a page right now um, and for GIS purposes in the state of Montana two dollars go to fund GIS we receive a dollar fifty of that amount and the local governments where the fee is collected receive 50 cents for GIS purposes. Um, other entities that receive funds, as Melissa said, include the local clerks and recorders for helping manage their records. So, so that is the recordation fee. And, and there are other processes too that require recordation, any kind of public notices and other kinds of things that get recorded with the clerk and recorder have this same fee. But it is the, the real estate market that um, has the largest impact on that recordation. So when you define we, I mean any person in Montana. Any person, any, any person. person. Isn't that just yes. you? And I'm like, wow, I'm gonna buy that much money. Yeah. Yeah. Like any person. Every, yeah. Any person who who Seems records so any kind of document with the clerk and recorder. So is real estate trends payment. are going down. Is that what the, well, so. the trend is slow. The trend slowing. is slowing. slowing, and that's you know compared to COVID, especially. Right. You know, we saw a huge uptick in COVID as the interest rate increased. Yes. Obviously, you know that's tied. So the real estate market, we've that's anecdotal for the most part. I, I'm reading about it, just seeing it. You know, if you pull up Zillow, there's less sales going on. Um, so that's mostly anecdotal. Um, but, but it is reflected in these in these earnings. So we'll we'll we're interested to make some progress, and we'll keep you guys updated. Real estate purchases are down. The, the condo building and the apartments and rentals is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's why Melissa is pointing this out. You know, we, we, we can see anecdotally that there appear to be some trends, um, but the, the declines we're seeing in revenue seem to be steeper than what those trends would indicate, which is why we're involving the budget office and, and doing more research to try to understand, is this simply a mistake that the dollars aren't being properly collected and, and deposited with the Department of Revenue? Did, did some other kind of change occur that we weren't aware of? We just don't know. Gotcha. Yes. Uh, Melissa, what's the, what's the typical year revenues from the geocorrigation fees? Well, um, because of COVID, that's a little bit more complicated of an answer. So prior to COVID and when our, when our recordation fee was um, 75 cents per page, it was, you know, $800,000, $900,000 per year. Then COVID happened and everything doubled, not quite, but almost doubled. And then in the middle of COVID, we um, had the legislation did change. And so then the recordation fee increased from 75 cents to a dollar fifty. So then we have those COVID and the increase stacked together. And then we have the market decline. So there are so many variables. And the only information that we have is sort of the summary level. Um, and so we have to look at at the trends from this high level. So I don't have the ability to go in and, and reconcile individual counties, um, which is why we're involving the budget office. Um, but all of those things combined are, are showing us this trend. Any further questions about the MLA? Okay, so Tammy wanted to pull out some the minutes from February. Hey, ahead, Tammy. I just had a clarification. Um, I made a motion at that meeting to um, pull out the bylaws for the discussion. In the discussion that followed, we agreed to direct the librarian, Jenny, to come back at this meeting with the coordination of the election officers at the seating of the board in June. Mm -hmm. um, To change that. So I would just like the minutes to reflect very shortly that a discussion followed, and the discussion that follows actually is covered in your very next agenda item. So Genevieve could just add um, the next, the wording from the next agenda item. But the discussion that followed was to direct the head library to bring us back section four um, the election of officers. To coordinate the election of officers with the seating of the of the commissioners, 
That's all. And then I think it gives us some continuity. We didn't technically vote on it, but we all agreed on it. And it tells why we're bringing it back and approving it today. So if that's okay, I think mm -hmm. that would help us. With I, I, yeah, we can, I can go back and look at it. Um, on the minutes, I just put the motions and I type them on the screen as we do it. So what's on the yeah. minutes is exactly what was on the screen that's been voted on. And then for any discussion in between that wasn't a motion, that is what the timestamp is for, is to include that kind of lets anybody who wants to know the information before or after a motion, the timestamp directs them to the video. But I don't tend to do word for word or reference anything but the motion. Um, word for word was put on the screen and then I timestamp if anyone wants to review a discussion. But I'll go back and listen to it and make sure that I typed the motion correctly. I think it's important in this case because we direct we did not vote on the bylaws and we directed and it makes a clear bridge to today. So if people are comfortable, I think that discussion and direction would be good in there. But so yes, yeah, so for our next item of business, we will be accepting the commission bylaws mm -hmm. and the revision of the election process. Okay. Okay, so we're going to have to figure so those out. Changes are moved. We accept the consent agenda. Okay. Okay. Second that. Okay, it has been properly moved and seconded that we accept the consent agenda. Um, is there any further discussion? Yes. I would just like to comment, maybe to avoid this problem in the future. Um, the motion could have said. Motion by Tammy Howell to move accept the consent agenda as it is pulling out the bylaws for discussion of this mm -hmm. issue. And then it actually said in the motion that is written in the written minutes why that step was taken. And then it would be, it would be yeah, there. it has to be in the motion. I don't add any words or I don't go back later and summarize anything. The motion is exactly as presented. I'm not allowed to, like, right, I'm not allowed to fill it out. Um, if there's things right. that, yeah, so. Definitely, that's the key to emotion is having all the words you want. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, I would just like to share that my past experience with governance, mm -hmm. I agree that the party already should be the actions, but I also think that it it is at the discretion of the secretary who's recording this. And I think any time that we have a discussion directing the head librarian to do something. That part of the discussion should be included in the minutes. I think it's important for the continuity. I think to ask people to go back and listen to a six hour meeting to find that part is a little extreme. Um, I would feel like to do it, but I'm passionate about all this as are you sitting here, but people calling in or in the future for history to say, why'd they change that? Yeah, but we can't, you know, it's up to your discretion, Genevieve. That's just my bias. Okay, thank you. Noted. Okay, is there any public comment? Okay, seeing none, we will now vote on the motion, which is to accept the consent, to accept the consent agenda mm -hmm. with changes. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. And I say aye also. I'm sorry. The consent agenda has been approved by a voice vote, okay. I have a quick All question, right, I just have to do a roll call yes. vote. Um, did Elsie, are you on to vote? Okay, thank you. Okay, Let, we probably should take a quick short break. Let's take a, if five minutes is enough, let's quick, let's be back here at 10, 50, 10, 10, 50. If anybody's looking for restrooms, there are restrooms just right around the corner. Oh, you want that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just a reminder that we, we do we do see a break. Yeah. Sometime around yeah. 12. From the yes. Recording resumed. Yep. Good. Okay. All right. Our next business item is the commission bylaws and, and the revision of the election process. Okay, is there a motion to accept all commission bylaws with the revision to the election process? I so move. Is there a second? 
Second. Okay, it has been properly moved and seconded that we accept all commission bylaws with the revision to the election process um, as is. Is there any further discussion? Is there any public discussion? I've seen none. We will now vote on the motion, which is to accept all commission bylaws with the revision to the election process. All those in favor say aye. 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 All, aye. all opposed say no. Okay, the commission bylaws have been accepted by a voice vote. Okay. All right. Continuing on, um, I believe it's Commissioner Taylor will have a network advisory council update and nominations. Okay. Uh, the council met um, and they went over many topics that day. And some of the key points would include that uh, they're doing a survey of library employee salaries. And it shows that despite 70% of the Montana library directors serving in their roles for more than five years, 92% of them are paid below the median average for similar management positions. So not a lot of money in the field. Um, the NAP provided useful feedback to add additional context as they continue the study. And MSL will consider how to best share this study with local library boards. Uh, the NAC also discussed how libraries might best make use of the state of Montana term contracts to receive technology support. They recommended a pilot to help evaluate how to support this support and benefit libraries. They also discussed the library development roadmap to help libraries evaluate how they can continually improve library services. And that's part of their standards, I believe, to, to use this roadmap. Um, despite challenges that libraries face, all agree that it is important to continue to aspire to improve services. And the roadmap is, is, is intended to help serve as a model for continued library development. They discussed the library resource sharing and support that ask, and um, they will meet again on May 1st and discuss further budget priorities. And Jody, who is the president, um, just to, to give her a little update, she wanted to be a part of this, but she cares so much about her early literacy program and the storytelling program that she stayed to do her second to the last program um, with her children and uh, will attend the meeting later. So it just shows the dedication of our librarians to early learning. With that, we have some nominees um, to serve Three year terms on the council effective July 1, 2024. All three are currently on the NAC committee. One is Jody Moore, Red Lodge Carnegie Library, and we know her dedication. Jonna Underwood at the Sheridan County Library, and Erin LaFromboy from Medicine Spring Library, Black Community College. I know all three of these are. Um, very dedicated to their libraries and to promoting library work in Montana and would serve as um, wonderful members of the Network Advisory Council for another three years. Do we need to just do a motion to approve them? So I am moved that we approve Jody Moore, Jonna Underwood, and Aaron LaPromboy as uh, to serve a three year terms on the Network Advisory Council effective July 1, 2024. Is there a second? I second. It has been moved and seconded that we accept the nominations for the Network Advisory Council of Jody Moore, John Underwood, and Aaron LaFromboy. LaFrom, sorry, Aaron. Um, as the um, for three year terms on the NAC. Um, is there any further discussion? I have a question. Um, is it correct that the NAC has 13 members at this point? Or how many people are? I tried to look that up. They have their own page. Yeah. Let me, let me pull it up really quick. Someone, Tracy or Karen, know off the top of their head? 
I think it's nine. I think it's nine. Nine, Jennifer says. Nine. I'll, I'll pull up the list though. One second. Uh, my reason for looking into that was to find out whether there's diversity on there as far as the different stakeholders in the library. I wanted to know if all of them are librarians or all of them are library directors. If there's any trustees, what, what's the balance mm -hmm. of input on that committee? Mm -hmm. Genevieve can bring that up. I believe they are all library directors. All nine of them. Thorlin is the dean of the MSU library. Jenny, is it required that they all be library directors or could they have some board members or trustees? Okay. I would need to double check their bylaws. I don't I don't know that it's required, but I would need to double check their bylaws to be sure. Yeah, I would like um, to make a suggestion for the future that maybe this council um have more diversity on it and include patrons, trustees, library directors, librarians, um, just to get everybody's perspectives mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. Um I you know I think one concern I would have about that is this is the advisory committee of librarians, of professionals advising this commission. And there's opportunities for trustees, volunteers, patrons to engage directly with the commission. Uh, we think it's important to make sure that there is a professional body in the same way we have our GIS professional advisory committee who can use their professional expertise to advise the commission and that's really the role of this network advisory council and i do know they work to get some small libraries and different libraries of sizes of libraries mm -hmm. and all across the state and all across the state mm -hmm. is there any are there any further any further discussion commissioners if not is there any public discussion I see no further discussion. We will now vote on the motion, which is to accept Jody Moore, John Underwood, and Aaron Lafram Boyd as the um, candidates for the three term, three year terms on the Network Advisory Council. All those in favor say okay, aye. I made the yeah, okay. that was made by Peggy Taylor. Yeah, it was motion by Peggy Taylor. Okay. Oh, it was by. Thank Peggy you. Taylor. Sorry. Sorry about that. Thank you. And Tom seconded it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Tom seconded it. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed saying sorry or no. Okay. It has been moved and accepted that we, or it has been voted on as a voice uh, ballot, and it has been accepted. All righty. Let's go on. Sorry, we're rushing through these. We are already late, so we're trying to rush on through. Thank you, Peggy, for that. Okay. okay, we now have the draft for state aid, the state aid formula, administrative rules to include college libraries, and it is an action item also. Is there a motion to accept the, the draft state aid formula administrative rules to include tribal libraries? Uh, is that college libraries or tribal libraries? So or yeah, they... College libraries. College libraries. So, so, okay. Tammy made the motion. Is there a second? Okay, okay thank you. I'll second. Okay, you will second it. Okay, it has been moved and seconded that we accept. I'm sorry, I have to go to this. Yeah. Accept the draft state aid formula administrative rules to include tribal college libraries. Seeing no further discussion. I'm sorry, yeah, I'm oh, sorry. there is further discussion. Though. I was trying to wrap my brain around this. Um, so for, for public libraries, are we using their service area? Okay. We use a combination of their service area and their service population. The what the the formula that's in existing 
administrative rule. Okay, so we're taking the 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 tribal enrollment number as an equivalent of the library service population. Right. Yep. Yep. Are there any other? Is there any other discussion? Is there any public discussion? Okay, it has been properly moved and seconded that we accept the draft state aid formula administrative rules to include tribal college libraries as is. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those say aye. All opposed say no. Okay, the draft state aid formula administrative rules to tribal college libraries has been accepted by a voice vote. Alrighty, Tracy is now up again. She will present the Excellent Service Award recognitions. This is actually a very straightforward one. Um, annually, we award the Excellent Library Service Award. Libraries apply by completing a form where they indicate programs or outreach that they have done that's kind of above and beyond the traditional role. And so these are the libraries that staff recommended receive the Excellent Library Service Award. And so we are just seeking uh, your approval of that, if you are okay with that and moving forward. Okay, is there a motion to accept that the Excellent Library Services Awards as presented? I move it. I move by Tom, seconded by Peggy. Okay. It has been properly moved and seconded that we accept the Excellent Library Services Awards. Is there any further discussion? Madam Chair? Yes, Tom. After we, uh, we vote, hopefully affirmatively, may we have the people that are in the room that uh, represent these libraries if they're willing to stand and recognize them. Do so? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Tammy? Were there some that applied that were not received the award? Um, I think there was only one application that was incomplete. Incomplete. Yeah. Yep. Carmen, did you? Yeah. It was um, going online to see the blank application because I wondered what the criteria were, yeah. but it was closed because mm. the deadline had passed. Yeah. So I would like to see the application just to. Absolutely. I would also. Yeah, yeah, you bet. Great. Right. And then the other question I have is how many libraries apply? How many that could mm -hmm. be and why would mm -hmm. they come? Oh, um, so the that's a good question. So any any type of library is eligible to apply. So that potentially is up to four hundred and some. Uh, I'm not clear on the school libraries, but it's quite a bit. You know, typically speaking, it varies. Um, when we made an application process that was more intense with more essay questions, we did see the number drop um, from, you know, it used to be almost all the public libraries would apply for the old Excellent Library Service Award. So now we've seen that drop um, to about 30 or 40. I, I would share, I would really like to revamp that award. Um, I really feel like I'd like to either change it to maybe make it perhaps um, where we would truly identify four or five really outstanding libraries um, and give that to them. And then what I would love to do with the library development roadmap is we don't really have a carrot for those libraries who choose to say, okay, I meet the basic public library standards, but I'd really like to like level up kind of thing. And I would really love to do something where we maybe acknowledge those libraries who do that, who go to that extra level and extra effort that's maybe a different application process. I don't know what that looks like. I'm just sharing mm -hmm. with you my initial thoughts. Mm -hmm. So you don't think that you should combine this mm -hmm. with that? I was, or what are you thinking? I'm, I'm actually thinking that, I guess my thoughts on it are, it would be really nice to make the, I'm not sure if this is totally meaningful in its current format. Mm -hmm. That's actually what I'm really okay, thinking. Okay, so maybe eliminate this and go to a higher standard. Or have obviously. both. Or have, or have both. Yeah, yeah, like have one that's more of a, we want you to consider going, going further. further. Mm -hmm. And we want to recognize that. And, mm -hmm. and that's maybe a little bit lower bar, you know, or not a lower bar, but it's, the, the application is quite 
time intensive. It's time intensive to do and time intensive to review. Mm -hmm. And so it would almost be nice to make that really meaningful with only a handful of libraries receiving that award, but then encouraging libraries through perhaps some kind of recognition program to, to choose a certain number of items from the library development roadmap that's like, this is the next level. This is beyond just basic public library standards. Does that help? Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. When I did look before mm -hmm. at the questions and what was needed, mm -hmm. I guess the one that bothered me was, what are you doing new? It was kind of, what new program mm -hmm. are you outreaching for a group in the community? Mm -hmm. And my initial reaction to that was for very small libraries who are very limited staff. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult to have a new program every year. I don't, I didn't think that was very practical. And I think it would have been better to have said, the newer programs you have added, how are you extending them? Do you have a record of how mm -hmm. successful they are? Mm -hmm. Because I'd rather see people who are a small library right. growing a really effective program than feeling, mm -hmm. I, I used to run across that in schools, we feel like we have to do something new every year, do something new every year. Mm -hmm. And that's not really a measure mm -hmm. sometimes. Yes. But their success that's of what they have done. It's a success yes. of growing within that program. Yeah. yeah. And so if there was a way, I, that, that I felt was yeah. probably self-limiting right off the bat for a lot of libraries mm -hmm. apply because Mm -hmm. They're already 180 percent. Yeah. Where are they going to be new? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. That's a mm -hmm. good suggestion. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So are you ready, Jen? Yes. I think that's that's exactly the discussion I mm -hmm. wanted to see the application. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, should we make the motion to direct um, a reevaluation? System or I don't know that you need to make a motion, but I think we hear you, and, and that's been on our minds as well. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so our motion basically is to accept the um, if, if I could the get a motion to accept the excellent library services awards as presented. Uh, Tom, Tom, oh, sorry, sorry, Tom, sorry. and second it. Okay, there you go. I'm sorry, we're, we're, ready we're ready on discussion. We're okay, there you go. Sorry about that. Okay, all those in favor of accepting the Excellent Library Services Award, um, please say aye. 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 And anyone, anyone opposed say aye or no? Okay, the Excellent Service, the Excellent Library Service Award recognition has been accepted by a voice vote. Congratulations and good work to all those libraries. If anyone is here, that was on the list. Please stand up and we, we would like to appreciate you. Can, can we quickly tell where you are from, uh, your name and where you're from? Sure. You know, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rebecca Meredith, Public Service Fest Board in your Belgrade. Oh, great. Sarah Widger, Head of Public Services at Bozeman Public Library. And Nielsen, Creative Labs Librarian, Bozeman Public Library. Kimmy Aguilar, trustee at the Lear Club Public Library. Great. Rachel Wallstrom, Mark County State Library co director. Great. Thank you. Uh, Lori Roberts, still in the Library. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Are there are there any any direct or any of the um, award winners online? We would like to recognize you if you are online. Okay, seeing as there's none, thank you so much for your hard work and dedication, all of you. And thanks for attending. All right. Um, presented now are the 2025 legislative legislative budget requests. This is an action item also. Okay, is there a motion to accept the 2025 legislative budget request? I would move that their budget request be approved as presented. I'll second it. Okay, Brian has moved and Peggy seconded it to accept the budget request as requested. As presented. As presented, sorry, as presented. Uh -huh. Is there any further discussion? Madam Chair. Yes, Tom. I move an amendment 
that we accept uh, part of the part of your request and pulled several items um, to deny some items and to forward some items to further analysis. Madam Chair? Yes. yes. For point of clarity, um, I would like to encourage people to defeat the motion and then address each of these major items individually. I think it will be complicated to put them together. We're, de we're dealing with um, one, mm -hmm. two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So um, Tom's amendment has not been accepted. That motion's still on the table or it hasn't been seconded. And if Tammy wants to make an amendment, it would need to be seconded. I second Tammy's amendment. My amendment would be that we take these items one at a time. Just point of order, Tom. Yeah. Tom's is on the table. Didn't get a second. His didn't get a second. So Did it? Waiting. So it's waiting. Tom's didn't get a second. A second so did. It's not on the table. It's not on the table. Okay. So right. Tammy's. So my amendment is that we take these items individually so that we don't have to vote on the whole group. I second. Is just a point of order, is that an amendment or would that be a, another motion after my motion is? Should we just vote? First and then? Should we I vote? On... Should, I think you should discuss because I do think that is a new motion. And yeah, then I would, if it yeah, will be discussed first. I, think I would encourage people to vote against the motion as made to accept this entire list and to please allow us to have them individually discussed. So if you want to withdraw your amendment, I would go back to a vote. Because I was comfortable with just asking people to vote this down and then individually approaching me. So I would ask that we defeat the motion as it's written so that we can make a motion to approach these individually. Okay, so the motion has been made and seconded to accept the budget request as presented. And um, is there any public discussion? Yes. You probably need a certain line. <laughs> I think if we're going to discuss them individually, it will be better. Should we vote first? I, I would. Uh, Should we vote first? I'm oh, sorry, okay. just one second. Okay. Okay, so yeah, I believe, yeah, I believe. But if the motion dies and we go through them individually, people may want to individually get up on the side. They could do that. They could bring their comments in. We'll ask him. Would you like to do it as we're? Uh, well, I voted we'll, as it currently is as a big conference thing. Okay. So okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Are you guys ready? Yes. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Ooh, I probably shouldn't do that. I'm going to set up here so that's right in my eyes. Okay. My name is Angela F. Archuleta. I have served in the following MLA board positions, school library division co-chair. I was vice president, president-elect, president, and now past president. In my positions, I've heard many librarians and patrons discuss the importance of bringing back resource sharing from the state. In addition, as a retired Lieutenant Colonel in the Montana Army National Guard, I understand that our country has enemies who love to see our country fight each other internally. They want to interfere with our elections. They want us to believe everything that is posted on social media. They do not want our kids or us to fact check or verify, just believe what is posted. In today's world more than ever, we need our kids, our patrons and fellow countrymen to learn how to find information and validate it. Google and artificial intelligence may give you the top sponsored answer to your question, but that does not mean that it will give you accurate answers. We could all benefit from having access to databases that gather information from variable sources. In Alaska, Alaskans have access to the statewide library electronic doorway that includes everything from how to learn a language, do-it-yourself projects, genealogy, auto repair resources, home and 
improvement reference guides, research da databases such as Ex Expo, eh, EBSCO and Dale databases are used for students to prepare for both career and college. These databases assist residents no matter where you live as long as you are a resident of the state. The Montana Legislature and the State Library used to fund these data dates for everyone in Montana. It's time to bring it back. Please support the research sharing ask. It will help Montana's compete in today's world and contribute to keeping the United States safe. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jeremy, I make just a few remarks. Sure. I, I, there's a few things that I think from, from my perspective, I would like the commission to know about the budget requests. And, and how and why they were presented the way they are. First and foremost, they represent the breadth of the stakeholders of the State Library. They have expressed needs to us and we have worked hard to prepare budget requests that reflect our, our best abilities to address our stakeholder needs. And we present them as a block to you because we don't think it's appropriate to pick and choose between stakeholders. Um, and, and that's why I think it's important to consider these requests as a holistic view of our agency budget requests. Um, the other thing that I think is important to think about, about the, the, what is being asked of you in this motion is to remember that this is the very first step in what, what from now is basically a 13 month process. Your vote today expresses that you are listening to our stakeholders and that there's merit in their needs and that we are willing to advocate for their needs through a budget process that's going to include extensive evaluation from the governor's budget office and then extensive debate in the legislature. So this is just the very first step in a lengthy process that will likely see a lot of negotiation and back and forth. Uh, what we are really asking for is your recognition of the importance of the needs of all of the stakeholders of the state library, not to pick and choose between those stakeholders and to say, we've heard you and we recognize these needs and we want to move these requests forward through that planning process. So that is why I would ask that you would really consider these requests uh, as a block and also recognizing that many of these services rely on one another, build on one another. And if you choose one and not the other, you may be undermining other requests within this, this very package. And then the, the other point that I just wanted to make in, in considering these requests is um, these are requests, it's, it's a significant budget request. We recognize that nearly 98% of these dollars pass through the state library to private contractors to help support the needs of, of Montana citizens. Only about 2.2% of these asks are retained within the state library to help us support these needs. So this is a way for us to help bolster private sector investment, private sector contracting to support Montana's needs. We know we can be successful in supporting all of these asks if we have the funding and resources necessary to move them forward. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes. I'd like to clarify my encouraging um, us to vote this down and address these items individually. Um, I think we have a fiduciary responsibility to continually oversee the budget process and especially what we're going to ask the legislature to do. Um, I believe that our last business session was incredibly educational and very helpful. And many of these items, we heard exactly why they are being needed and requested. Um, and I know that our staff has a great deal of, of they're limited in their time. They have big, um, very big burdens to carry. There are three ways that we can go on these individual items. We can just say, yes, it's great. Leave it on the list. We can say, mm, I want more information. I'm not there yet. 
Um, I might want it smaller, I might want it bigger. And then we may have a majority of people on a certain item who are saying, no, this is not even, I don't even want this to go further on the list, nor do I want it to take any more valuable staff time to study it or prepare it. And if that be the case, I think it's only fair to the staff and our librarians and everyone to be straightforward about that. And I don't know if that's the case. I really don't. But I think this stage is a very good stage to begin saying yes, maybe no, and let people um, understand where we're going to put our effort of our staff. And, and then later, I think for me, it's not transparent or honest. If, if I am totally against something to just not say anything until after the staff has invested six months. Um, so I think if there are no's, then this would be a good time to at least get that information out. And plus there are some of these I need more information on. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't feel it's appropriate to put them all together. It would be easier for me. It would be easier to say, hmm, I support this and this, so therefore I'll vote for that and that and that because they're tied on. But I don't think it's a transparent way to do it. So I would encourage anybody who has a feeling some of these are no to at least vote no now and pull them out and we'll talk about them together as a group. So that's why I'm encouraging a no vote. Yeah. Yes. I concur with the with Commissioner Hall. Madam Chair, if I could speak. Yes. Knowing knowing budget process, uh, understanding that there is time, and I thank the state librarian for discussing that there is a process here, and that process can be amended. But I believe completely with all my heart that we need to really recognize uh, what the dollar goes to a goal, as well as goes to an opportunity given by the state uh, general fund or any taxes that go into this. So I would like more information. I would like a better understanding. I think it helps uh, the commission recognize the, the gravity of this good work, as well as recognizing how it attaches to the goals of the state library. So I would also want to look at these uniquely rather than in a global motion, knowing there is time. I know there's an, a finite amount of time, but I do recognize that uh, more information for an uh, uh, invitation for these uh, requests to come forward to understand a little bit more in depth how they're interconnected and where they've been to where they may wanna go in the goals of the State Library. That would be what I'd like to do. So I would support um, the, the motion to delay at this time and have them come individually to us. Is there any other public? Is there any more commission or any other commissioners? Is there any more public discussion? Yeah. Um, oh. Hi, my name is John Beaver, and I'm a uh, small business owner here in Montana. And are you taking public comment now? Um. Could yes, we are. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> my company is West Tech Environmental Services. We've been in uh, business since 1977 and work on numerous environmental permitting projects for clients all around the state and the West, including primarily mines, pipelines, power lines, sometimes timber sales. <clears throat> I just, I've commented before to uh, committees on funding for the heritage program. I just want to say a couple items First is that the uh, data provided is the best of any heritage program in the West. We work with many of them in Wyoming, the Dakotas, um, Colorado, et cetera. Montana does have the best data available. <clears throat> um, because it's the best, it's also universally accepted by all of the agencies. It's seen as unbiased and appropriate. And what, what that helps me with, with my business is it streamlines the permitting process for our clients, which of course they appreciate, makes it easier to get permits. Um, and I would just say it saves them, you know, a, quite a bit of money 
in terms of survey cost and agency consultation. So I would urge that the committee uh, fully fund the heritage program in particular. And um, also as, as I'd just like to say, uh, with regards to this program in particular, you know, we work with a lot of different agencies and this is one instance where government actually works, um, which can feel novel sometimes, but it in fact is a, a place where government works. So just want to, again, advocate for the budget uh, for the Heritage Program because it, it's helpful to me and it's helpful to my clients. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, Gail from Belgrade Library. Watch the lights, you sit here. Okay. My name is Gail Bacon. I'm the director of Belgrade Community Library. Um, first of all, I just wanna say how much the support of the State Library and the State Library as well as the Montana Share Catalog makes such a significant difference in the day-to-day -day work that we do at the library. I do recognize that you have a great appreciation for uh, boots on the ground uh, around the, with the libraries around the state. I thank you for that. Uh, I think we're very fortunate in this state. Anybody here in this room, I, I think would agree with me that um, if I wanna find Jenny, I make a phone call and Jenny calls me back. If I wanna find Tracy, it goes all around with all the staff and we're very, very privileged to have that kind of access to our state library staff as well as the Montana Share Catalog staff. Um, we also have a very special connection with the state library. I have a couple people sitting in the room that were homegrown through the Belgrade Community Library. Amy Marchwick started with us when she was 14 years old as a volunteer. She stayed there about 14 years and came up through the ranks and now um, you all know and appreciate Amy's work. Rebecca Camp, this, the same thing. Um, she returned to the state after getting her master's degree and um, has been successful again with the state library. So Kylie McGregor is another one. And so uh, you're welcome. We have put a lot of training. Yeah, yes. in <laughs> so anyway, today I, I want to speak in favor of the uh, budget request for the House bill to the state budget bill research agenda and data support specialist. It's a $67,000 ask. Um, if I may just step back, I started in 2006 as the library director of Belgrade Community Library, and um, no one self-intended, but when I started there, I clearly had my work cut out for me. It was um, quite overwhelming, both in physical space, uh, in lack of tax dollars. As a matter of fact, we had um, over a $90,000 debt going into it, and I'm a new director coming from managing a library in the Minnesota area. And that was just kind of a whole different configuration. But that's how I started out, was extremely overwhelmed. And about two weeks into uh, my tenure in September, I get this little email that says, OK, now it's time to fill out your public library standards report. And I didn't even know what it was to start with. And when I opened it up and looked at all the statistics and things that they wanted, I can't even tell you how overwhelmed I was. Actually, one of the staff, Bob Cooper was on staff then, he came down to personally hold my hand and help me take a breath and tell me that I would survive this. So anyway, fast forward, um, uh, we have we have had the ability to reach out. These, re these reports are some of the most important critical things that we do because we bring forth statistical data that you need to rely on the state legislature needs to rely on, as well as the federal, um, the um, federal, the Institute of Montana Library Services. And so this stuff, this stuff needs to be right. And we need good guidance with that. Um, and so through the years we have, um, I've gotten used to what this report is, but it doesn't mean that we don't need any assistance with this report. Because Time's up three the, minutes, but it's shares discretion to continue. Oh, okay, Gail. Okay, my apologies. I was not aware it was a three minutes. Sorry. Right. Okay. Um, but because, especially um, speaking to the public library standards report, because of the attention of the state library staff, they've um, um, implemented new software systems for it. They've done training for us and whatnot. But anyway, we've gone through this complex um report that we are required to do with this year in addition was a, the caveat, which is kind of the reward for doing the report, I think, is the opportunity to do some local reports. So we took one of these reports when we were done and we just 
clicked onto a template that was designed for us for the state library. And they allowed us to create some reports. We took it and we kind of personalized it more for Belgrade. But typically I, was, I have submitted um, annual reports to our county commission, to our council, to our advisory boards, our foundation, a number of people, even the people we write grants to. And it's been the typical written up with some pictures thing. I put this out there this year and it was just really amazing and impactful. And it just put all the data in one place. These are the kinds of things that we rely on the state library to help us not only get done and done correctly, but to be able to find ways to reach really important groups that advocate for our library, whether it's financially or just out on the street advocacy, either way, it's quite important. So this is just a sample of one of the um, reports that we do. But I consider this position vital. And um, the libraries are all growing. Many of us are growing within the state. And now you're incorporating seven more tribal libraries. So the work will just intensify. And as many of you know, the need for data, which is exactly what you're talking about today, is so critical that we need the assistance to make sure that not only can we get it done, while we do the number of other things that we do within our library, but to get it done accurately and to make sure that we've got the right guidelines. So I consider this a vital position within the Montana State Library. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Gail. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Would you repeat in favor of which position? The Research Agenda and Data Support Specialist. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is there any other public discussion? Madam Chair, there seems to be a hand raised. Um, is there, is, oh, David Ingram? Go ahead, David. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Hi, uh, Dave Ingram from uh, Flathead County. Um, I just, and a trustee at Flathead County Library. I've uh, been involved in our budget process for the last several years, and I found it just wanted to express my support for the, uh, the concept of looking at the items individually. A lot more information is gleaned by the commissioners, in my opinion, and also the public um, as you look at each item and as they interrelate. So I just wanted to lend my support to that concept. Thank you for the opportunity to say something. Thank you, David. Okay, is there any other further comment? And Chair, would you clarify now the motion we're yes. voting on? Okay. Yes, um, Genevieve, could you put up the motion, yes. please? Yeah, one sec, let me get that shared, one sec. I would like to comment that I, I found Gail's information very, um, and, and if we could have every information for every one of these items, I mean, I, can, I, I definitely would find that productive. But, okay, so the motion has been made to accept the budget request and moved and seconded to accept the budget request as presented. Madam Chair, are we not putting the second up there? I have not noticed them today. The second Peggy, was Peggy seconded it, seconded it. Genevieve, would you put that up there, please? It was okay, second. Okay, it doesn't have to be part of the motion, but you want me to put it in? Right, yeah, go ahead. Just to have it there. Okay. Okay, so it has been moved and seconded that we accept the 2025 legislative budget request as is. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All of those opposed say no. 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 Okay. The 2025 legislative budget requests have been rejected by a voice vote. Now, to go on. I would like to start with the first item, which is the one that was just discussed. And that is the um, do you need to make a motion to go through each of the requests? I make a motion to go through each of the items individually. Is there a second? I second that. Okay, it has been moved and seconded that we go through each of the 
2025 legislative budget requests individually? Are, is there any public discussion? Or is there any further discussion from commissioners? Is there any public discussion? Okay, we will now vote on going through each of the 2025 legislative budget requests individually. All those in favor say aye. 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 All thank you. Thank you, Elsie. I'm sorry. All opposed say no. Okay, so going through each of the 2025 legislative budget requests has been accepted by a voice vote. Okay, so let's go ahead. Just for my records, were there any nays? I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Just for my records, were there no. any nays? No, there were no nays. Thank you. Okay, so the first is the modified to permanent FTE. Um, oh no, yes, uh, um, 12 FTE. The funding source is the federal revenue state mm -hmm. special revenue. And this is with the work group of central services. Is there any discussion? Madam Chair, um, we've talked about this a few times since I've been on the commission. And um, of course, all of us on the commission are part timers and volunteers, and so we don't have a 20 year history. But um, I understand that this has been a live issue for several legislative sessions, maybe several um, other kinds of elected officials. Um, my understanding is that the benefit to this to changing from modified to permanent is a feeling of permanence on the part of the employee. And um, many of these employees have been in their posts for, and, and those positions have been funded and here for, mm -hmm. for quite a few years. Um, the, there's also a cost savings of uh, a few dozen hours of accounting time, but that's not a, it, it's not tremendous cost savings to be realized. Um, my proposal on this is that we, we leave this, that we do not act on this, that we leave it to legislative committees and the governor's office. And, and so I will not, I will, I will vote no on making a change from what applies to the permanent. Madam Chair, may I comment? Yes. Um, I, I would respectfully disagree with, with um, Commissioner Burnett's assessment of, of the staff feeling about this issue. Most of our staff don't know if they're a modified or permanent position. They receive permanent letters of employment regardless of their employment status. This request really is about both efficiency in, in the process of not having to spend those hours every single year recreating the same modified positions over and over. But it's also a question of transparency. When you look at the number of permanent FTE that the state library has, it's 30.46 or something like that. When in fact, we have about 53 people, individual persons on staff. And so we constantly have to clarify with commissioners, with the legislature and others, why there is that discrepancy. And it I don't believe it reflects well in the state library. I think it um, creates questions in people's minds that really shouldn't exist. And it's just not transparent in how we operate. So that would be my perception of why this is an important need. How many times has this been brought before the legislature? We've brought it to the commission twice now. To the commission, mm -hmm. and then it's gone on to. It has never gone on it's to. Never gone. On. So it's been brought to the commission, mm -hmm. but not sent to the legislature. Madam Chair, um, I have a question for Jenny. Um, Commissioner Burnett said that he would propose that this is left to the governor's office and the legislature. Is that correct? Well, I'm proposing that just our action be known. 
and then it will it, it is still a lot of well, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. So that's my question: is is it can it can it can't go forward if we don't push it forward, right? Um. So the process is we have this conversation with you, and we will move forward those items you direct us to move forward. So if the governor's office or the legislature comes back to me and, and asks, is this a priority of the commission? My response would be no, even though I believe it is a priority. Madam yeah, Chair. Yes. Um, I would encourage also along with um, Mr. Burnett that we do not carry this forward at this time. I mean, my reason is that we are not the only agency dealing with this FTE issue. This is throughout the government. And there is a subcommittee that is addressing, or some it's either a subcommittee or some directed by the legislature to clarify this. Mm -hmm. And so my feeling is that we need to just wait, find out what everybody's doing with these FTEs. This is not affecting anyone's job. I think um, Melissa did explain it saves some money, maybe I thought 40 hours for the whole year, which is pretty minimal to make this major change. Um, I'd rather see what the other agencies do and um, not carry this forward at all. So if there is a motion made to carry this forward, otherwise I don't think our staff should spend any more time on it. I think we just wait and see what they decide from, mm -hmm. from the legislature on what they want to do with MPs or from the governor's office. They are addressing. So may I, may I go may ahead? Comment? I disagree with that. I think it's important for the commission to show that it is an important um, topic and how will they know to move forward if, if this agency or other agencies don't say, hey, we have a problem with modified FTEs. This would show that, yes, there is a problem and, and they issue and bring it forward to their minds to that committee. So that I look at it in a totally different way. Okay, so to clarify, Will the governor look at, will they look at this without us saying? They are. They are looking they at are it. They are looking at it. They are looking at it. I can't speak to the governor's office. There is an interim legislative committee that is looking at it. Yes. An interim it's, right. it's a problem throughout government that's being addressed by our legislature mm -hmm. and by our governor. And I was told that by the lieutenant oh. governor. So, so can I ask a clarifying question? If, if you were to not move this forward, but we had the opportunity to testify to that interim committee and express that we do believe this is a problem and mm -hmm. we hope that the legislature would address it, would the commission be in support of, of that testimony? Madam Chair? Yes. I would suggest we re remain oblique both as staff and officially as committee. non committee and, and allow them to make that decision. Yeah, we have plenty to do. The staff is free to go. Um, Chair, I know I said the opposite. Um, Commissioner Arnson wants to comment. Okay. Elsie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, I would definitely not mix have mixed messages going up to any legislative committee. I think it is the authorization of the commission to determine any kind of budget proposal. Uh, I would not want the state librarian to be caught between a hard spot and a rock in saying what we need to, uh, what we would like to see going forward. Um, I think that at this point, because when I was on the commission and this did come up, I voted no again. There's a lot of flexibility having modifieds rather than permanent FTE. And I think that uh, that offers a positive. Now, there might be some challenging as Melissa has to go through and reactivate this, uh, these modifieds annually or in the biennium. But at this point, I believe that if we do remain neutral, that staff does not go up. Staff's message is that the commission is neutral and staff's also message is neutral, that there is no uh, determination of one saying yes and one saying another. Thank you, Elsie. Thank you, Elsie. At this time, Madam Chair, I would like to move that we do not move the FTT item forward to the EP. I would say you just don't need, just don't move it. Don't move it. Yeah. Okay. That we don't. That we do not. Okay. So do we need to vote on that? Though? We I don't. Need to set. No. 
I don't think you need to vote on it at all. You're just you're just not voting to move it forward. So it's left off the list of priorities. But I don't get to make that decision. The rest of us should. The whole group should make the decision. Shouldn't be based on me. I, I'm not saying that it is. I'm just saying if nobody makes the motion to move it forward, it it got it. It doesn't it doesn't move forward for lack of a motion. Okay. Thank is you, that, Jane. Thank you for that. Okay. Okay. Carmen. This is a question for clarification for me. How did we end up with modified, or how does an agency end up with modified activities? It comes from having sources of funding, but without the legislature actually appropriating the FTE. The legislature appropriates both funding and FTE. So uh, the, the primary source of the funding for these modified positions is our Library Services and Technology Act funding that we receive. Um, most of that funding goes to fund some of the staff that you've heard from today. The legislature appropriates that funding, but they've never appropriated the FTE. And so we request modified FTE to have the staff associated with that funding. Madam Chair, this is Melissa. Yes, Melissa. Um, I just want to add that um, approximate, well, I can't tell you the exact number, but um, a good majority of the FTE that we're requesting um, is due to the budget cuts from 2017 when we had appropriation and FTE removed. And then in a subsequent session, we had the appropriation returned, but not the FTE. So what Jenny was describing is true. And also um, the budget cuts are a contributing factor as well. Okay, thank you. Do you comment? Yeah, Jenny, what's the, what's the difference of, I mean, you kind of explained it, but like the, the benefits of actually going to FTE, are there different benefits from them being mm -hmm. modified? No, mm -mm. no, the, the, their status as employees is the same. They're still full-time employees. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank the superintendent, Elsie, for your point on the flexibility. There, um, I think that modified FTE leave us much more flexibility than if we do decide, for example, I was really impressed with Gail's presentation on this one position. We actually could move somebody with those funds into that if that was a priority, if they're a modified. Mm -hmm. But if it was an FTE position, then you have to have it. Just just to clarify, to move someone from one position into another would cause us to have to lay off a person to move into that position. Same person, even, and move them. She means like to take one of a, someone, someone in a different position and put them in the data support mm -hmm. position. If, How, if it's an FTE. If it's an FTE. Mm -hmm. If it's a modified. Mm -hmm. If it was a modified, would it? Then you're starting to mix job classification right. that requires recruitment. Mm -hmm. it, it's that level of flexibility just doesn't exist. No. Yes. If you went to the FTE, would that LSTA money be freed up for something else or would it still go to? No, it would still go to these positions. It's still going to be the positions. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's basically yeah. just a label. Yeah. A label with a lot of work. Okay. But a modified does not have a specific title that was set up by the legislature. A modified position has all of the same right. job classifications, job titles, benefits. Benefits. Uh, an employee in a modified job description, job category, receives a permanent letter of employment from us if they're permanent. Modified positions are often used in state government when you get one-time monies or grants or contracts. In that case, we would hire someone under a term contract as a modified FTE. And when that funding ends and the work is complete, then their term expires. I'm referring to permanent employees. Some have been on staff since the 1990s. They have permanent letters of appointment with us. They have the same job classifications, benefits, everything. Um, we just have to go through the busy work of creating these positions year after year after year. 
If it was a part one time by the government, by the, it was a one time short term contact. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't modified, then at the end of that term, it's mm -hmm. done. Right. It would it be the same if they were NFP. All of our all of our modified positions go away at the end of every single fiscal year, okay. whether there's a permanent position okay. or a term per person in those positions. Okay. And then we have to go through the process of recreating those positions every year when we have employees in those positions. But if we had no modified FTE and we had a one year job, mm -hmm. it would be up at the end of the year, even if it was next year. Permanent. No, no. If so, let's let's just assume so we're taking away flexibility of the short term. Contract. No, 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 we're not. Let, let's just assume that this budget request went through and it was passed. So all of these modified positions were made permanent and we got a grant to hire a person, then we would appropriately go through this process to create a modified FTE for oh, that term. You would have to create one anyway. Right. But but appropriately, because the funding is one time only, and when the term ends, it would go away. So would force you to hire a new person for a modified? No. Well, well, one of the yeah. permanence of modified. Yeah. I, it's, 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 it's it, you can see how complicated yeah. it yeah. is. I think the flexibility to modify. Yeah. So, so what I'm understanding is with a full-time employee and not a modified, with a full-time employee, what you are the modified, what you have to do every year is, do you have to go back and redo their job description? Not or like what they're like. Not, what are you doing with the modified every year? So we have to create an FTE right. with the with the governor's budget office. We right. have to go to the governor's budget office, demonstrate that we have the funding, provide the job description, um, provide the work priorities of what that position is doing, and the governor's office has to then approve that that FTE. Even though it's been there since the nineties. Yes. Okay. So, Madam Chair, um, I think the, the this might be a question for Melissa. Are you there, Melissa? Melissa? Yes, I am. So the number of 40 hours a year was tossed out. Um, and I think the state librarian said that there's a lot of work associated with reappointing these people. But what is actually the real amount of work? Can you put an hour number to it? Um, that's a really complicated question because it's hard to quantify. And the reason is, um, it touches every, this modified piece touches every part of the budgeting process. So for example, when the dollars are appropriated to us during the legislative session, because these dollars aren't tied with a permanent position, they're appropriated to us in the operating costs category. And so they show up in our budget in the wrong category. So that sort of, that is what Jenny was alluding to when she was talking about transparency. Um, our budget really shows a significant amount of our appropriation in the wrong category when the legislature is approving it. And then we have to, you know, go through the process of moving those dollars during, during um, uh, turnaround when we're talking with the budget office. And then when we subsequently, when we have quarterly reporting with the legislature, we have to explain these moves and why did we make these moves and why do our personal services dollars not match. Um, so it, it, it is, it does touch almost every part of our budgeting process. So it's a difficult number to quantify. The number of 40 hours that we gave you was um, just the initial part of the process, which is where we go to the budget office and say, hey, we need this position again this year. And we submit those documents every year. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. It was good clarification. Okay, so point of clarification, Jenny, I I'm under the impression two years ago, and I would ask um, Montana Superintendent Elsie. Uh, it was my first meeting. Was this mm -hmm. process, and I believe that the majority did put this FTE request through. I believe that only Elsie, maybe mm -hmm. one other person, voted mm -hmm. against it. Mm -hmm. And it did go through. So the commission did 
takes this forward, but it was not, it, it has not happened. That's right. That's yeah. Right. So we, we did, did pass take it the forward. governors? It didn't pass the governors. Okay. No, but forward. we did. You yeah. said the yes. commission has not taken it forward. I believe that two years ago, the commission mm -hmm. did take it forward mm -hmm. and it did not pass the governors to get on the legislature. So mm -hmm. um, that's what I would say. And so we've tried and it didn't matter. But, but it did in the sense they've set up a committee. So let's see where that goes. Okay, so that so that for me, so that with the transparency to the of of the FTEs, um, I I I think that I would say that I'm going to say let's let's tell the governor's office that yeah, for me that this is a that it is a priority, but everyone make their own decision. I agree, and and that we we thought it was a problem then, and we see it continue. Mm -hmm. They got a committee, maybe showing that the need is still there. We'll push it further to the right. So, so I agree. know that. So, so that's what that's what I I'm looking at. It. So, if somebody like to make that, yes, if someone would make a motion. Um, that's interesting. I just want to comment. Well, the fact that it already went and then didn't go further, but created a, some kind of task force for school. Makes me draw the opposite conclusion, and I think it's pointless for us to to advance it again. And I agree with Tammy that we should wait what comes of the task force, the, the effort that we contributed um, in a previous version of the commission when I wasn't part of it to take this further. That made the governor's office look at the entire state government with regard to modified FTEs. I would like to wait and see what they do. If we if we already advanced it two years ago, I don't see any point in doing that again. Okay. Is there a motion? I move to not move modified positions to permanent FDP. I would second. So Tom moved and Peggy seconded. Yeah. No, Tammy, excuse me, Peggy. I'm sorry. Yes, Tammy. I knew it was Tammy. Yeah. I think what you mean, Tom, is permanent. Mm -hmm. To not move modified position to, to permanent FTE. That's the way it's written here. Right. Right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. One sec, sorry. So it has been moved, properly moved and seconded that we do not move the modified positions to permanent FTE. Is there any further discussion? Is there any public discussion? Okay, with no further discussion, seeing there is none, we will now vote on the motion, which is to not move modified positions to permanent FTE. All yeah, those, sure. yes. You need to alter the position to plural. Yeah, okay. My positions, Genevieve. Okay. okay, so I will read that again. It has been moved and seconded to not move modified positions to permanent FTE. All those in favor of not moving modified positions to permanent FTE. Say aye. 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 Okay. All opposed say no. Okay. No. Can you tell me the tell me the names? Yes. Um Tom. No, no sorry. Hang on a second. Sorry. It's okay. Tom, Tammy, Carmen, Elsie. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> <laughs> Sorry, that's all right. Okay. Do you need the nose. And no, then that, the that, nose that, that, the... Yeah, that will suffice. Okay. All right. So, it has been so that. <laughs> okay. So the motion passes. Thank you. <laughs> the motion to not move the modified position to permanent FTE has passed. And I'll just add, okay. I know I'm not your, I know I'm not your parliamentarian anymore, but 
um, Lieutenant Governor directed us that motion should be in the positive, not the negative. So maybe going forward, we'll try to only pass in the positive, not the negative. Okay. 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 Thank you, Jennifer. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, Madam okay. Chair, Madam Chair, this is Superintendent yes. Arson. I have yes. uh, another meeting that I need to jump on to, so I regret that I'm going to have to conclude my commission discussion today. Is there going to be a quorum? Any other vote? I want to just make sure that um, we have um, everything prepared so that your uh, meeting can uh, continue. Give me one okay. second. I'll pull up the agenda. Yes, there's many action items, Elsie, that we are going to vote on. Elsie, is there an item this afternoon or anything you will want you to... be? Yeah, will you be able to come back this afternoon? I believe you have a quorum uh, that will be able to uh, move through things. Um, yes, yeah. And so I think I think you are prepared for it. I just wanted to attend this morning's meeting, especially on the budget work. So with that, thank you all. Blessings. Bye bye. Okay, thank you, Elsie. Thank you. Madam Chair, yes. I'm curious. We have a Montana Library Association board meeting from noon to one. Is there going to be a recess for lunch now? Or no. okay, should we Sorry. recess now, or should we go through one more item and then yeah. we'll, we'll be recessing at approximately twelve fifteen? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And then will you be back at 1.15 then or 1? We're going we'll, to try to go 1. <laughs> sorry. I'm so sorry. I have to excuse myself. No, you're fine. Thank you. I'm sorry. Sorry we're running along. Thank you. Go right ahead. Go right ahead. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, so we'll, we will try to get one more in at least. Um, and it is the research agenda and data support specialist funding of $67,000. It's a one FTE from the general fund. It will be ongoing and it is um, from the work group of central services. And this is what Gail presented her information on. I am going to ask, um, is there a motion to, <laughs> to accept the research agenda and data specialist funding um, FTE. Is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move to approve the research agenda and data support specialist request. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, it has been moved by Brian and seconded by Peggy that we accept the research agenda and data support specialist position one FTE from the general fund for central services. Is there any discussion? Madam Chair? Yes, Tom. I'm going to oppose new um, FTE through the, as we go down through the list, um, at least for the time being. Um, I'm not willing to grow the state library. If we tally all these requests, including FTE, there are some FTE included in some of the other items, but there, is, there are one, two, three, four broken out as line items, perhaps six to eight total of the $20 million ask. Um, and frankly, when I got this a week or two ago, I was dumbfounded. I was blown away. We're an $11 million shop. And this would make us, a, well, if you break the, the 20 million in half for a biennium, um, it would be 10 million. It double the size of our agency or our, our, our spending authority, our spending. Um, so I believe that we can continue to provide excellent service to Montana libraries and, and in our mapping functions at, at basically current levels of funding. And um, of course, there's all kinds of things that we, we could improve and want. Uh, I want to stay, I want to keep the sideboards on this thing, these like patent trees. So, we heard testimony this morning from the librarian about the value of adding this person. Um, for now, I'm going to oppose the motion. Uh, unless a smaller case could be made to me in future weeks on this 
on this position. Madam Chair. Anyone else? Madam Chair, yes. who is presently doing this? Um, and is this why do why do we need new air? Because it, this is really impressive. But then mm -hmm. I have to tell you that in Belgrade and Gallup County, Gale is just impressive. Mm -hmm. But um, this. This is a support. Who's doing it now? Someone obviously is helping her. This is a support position to support support Rebecca Camp. So to help, this to is help a her. assistant for Rebecca. We did hear that. Yes. On the other mm -hmm. the other day. Mm -hmm. So right now it's been provided, but this would be a new a support position for Rebecca. Uh, and it would be sixty seven thousand a year for a support. What does that fall under? Because that central central services. But I mean what. What type? That's a high salary for. That's sal that's salary and benefits. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, for an interim and benefits are about nineteen thousand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. I, I, it would have to be classified. It's a brand new position, but something like a a level one data analyst or something like that. And I believe we, as a commission, have asked the many plates on, on Rebecca's spinning, that she's spinning to keep our circus theme and the elephant going here, that uh, in view to that. We have added many, many things to her, her plate. So, uh, have, and we have asked for data, 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 many, yes. many times. So uh, to show that support for her and what she does and the impressive uh, system that they put together. Uh, yes, this I dashboard is, is amazing. Something that, uh, we can be behind, that I would be behind supporting them. I agree with building, with, you know, just building government, but I can, I can also see the other side of definitely helping, helping out um, with the data support and, and the, and the, the benefit that we as commissioners get from, from that, from that support and the, um, the public and the library. I mean, there's a lot of support there. I would just reiterate the point that I made earlier. Almost 98% of the dollars that we are asking for are passing through the state library's budget to private contractors and vendors. The percentage of this ask that is actually retained by the state library itself, growing government, is about 2% of that $20 million ask. And so we are investing these dollars in the private sector in ways that will benefit our agency, you as the commissioner, and, and most importantly, like I said, the stakeholders who are asking for these resources. Yes. I'm trying to look on our website right now for the um, central services work group, trying to figure out who, how many people work in central services right now. How big is that work group? Um, it's uh, three IT staff, Melissa, uh, her accounting tech and accountant, human resources, Genevieve, myself, Sean, 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 Sean. the contract position, and, and Rebecca. Madam Chair, yes, I think the commission should make its decisions based on what's in the best interest of the state library. I don't think it's really the commission's role to limit the size of the, of the state library. If it's in the best interest for the state library to grow, we should put that request forward. And then it's up to the legislature to decide whether or not to fund that that, that, that position with these, these new FTE. So I would disagree, respectfully disagree with Commissioner Burnett, and I think that I believe that the State Library has made a compelling case for these new FTE, and we should ask for the funding. I doubt that we will get it all, but let's leave that up to the legislature. That's their role, not ours. Yes. Uh, respectfully to my friend and seatmate, um, the, the legislature does rely upon our, our assessment of need and um, perhaps you're saying that we shouldn't make big picture decisions, that we should just ask for everything that we, we would like and let them make the big picture decisions. But 
I, I would like to, uh, I'd like to be more proactive at the, at the lower level. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, go ahead. I also respectfully disagree. Um, I understand where you're coming from, Brian, because you work for Montana State University, and that is a, a whole different basis because it's we are getting government money and we're asking for more money and we're telling what we need. But this commission is set up to represent taxpayers, patrons, librarians, all the people in the state. And we have a fiduciary responsibility to put our budget forward. It is a legal statutory responsibility that this commission has to make. We, I don't, I do not believe, especially as a business person and a taxpayer, that we get the um, the wonderful um, benefit of just being saying, "Here's what I need," and and you taxpayers figure it out. I. I I absolutely agree with Tom. I'm torn on this one because I found Gil's very, very good presentation. And I also think Rebecca has a lot to do. Um, is this a place where a modified FPE could be brought in? We need the funding. The, 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 there's, a re, there's a request for funding. So without the funding, we would just be laying off someone else and using a different position. Yeah. I'm not in favor of growing the government right now. I was shocked at the number of people on this list um, and the total budget. This one would not go through to the private sector unless she hired someone from outside. This is us. This is us. Okay, okay. that's right. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm thinking. Um, I would like to disagree with fellow Commissioner Rossman as well. Um, I think we have an oversight duty. We are amateurs, so we will never have all the knowledge of somebody who works in the State Library for 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and we have a duty to very carefully analyze all the information we get and to more or less make a judgment call. And my judgment call will be between the, the awareness that any money we get or spend is taxpayer money that comes from the very people that we're serving with the services we provide. So on one hand, I keep that in mind, any dollar the library spends needs to be spent really well. And we're supposed to advocate for the state library to function well and be able to do its job. So there's judgment involved, and I'm not here to just be the cheerleader for whatever the state, state library might want to do. There's no limit to the very good things we can do for Montanans through library services. But there needs to also be this awareness that all the money we have, we have taken from the taxpayers. So I. I see this role not as one-sided and not as a cheerleader. They have to make judgment calls. And that's one of the reasons why I was very much in favor of looking at these requests individually, because I want to make very specific and very informed decisions on each individual item. That's when I feel that I do my job well. I think Gail had something to say. <laughs> Madam Chair, Commission. I find myself ironically in a similar position locally. We are in the process of, uh, we are currently per capita the fastest growing city in the state of Montana. Uh, the needs of every one of our departments is absolutely off the chart. And because we are building a $18 million bonded project that is now a $23 million project because of <laughs> building and COVID and all that stuff, um, it came time to, to submit our budget request and my thinking was somewhat along the lines of the rest of you. I have an enormous respect for the other department heads in the city of Belgrade. And I felt like I should defer our needs because the needs were so great throughout the city, as well as we're getting a new library and they're not even getting a new office chair. And so I I consider just letting it go. The, the new library space will be three times the size of our current building. And we have to figure out how to staff that. 
And so ironically, the very decision makers and the finance people who are the people that are like, keep the spending down, we gotta, re we gotta be respectful of the tax dollars, said, if you don't speak up and advocate strongly for those needs, it's just gonna sit there and the people that need to know, even up the chain, in my case, the city council, they're, they're not gonna know. They need to see how much need is out there, how much um, you're trying to make it work, but there is absolutely a breaking point. And based on that, I went ahead and I submitted what we did truly need because the decision, and in this case, it's the state legislature or the um, budgeting committees, if they don't hear this strongly, everything is just fine at the state library and they'll keep managing on what they need to do. And that was, that's the exact same position that I am in. And even the city manager said, absolutely, you need to speak up and advocate for what you need. Thank you for recognizing there's need all over the place, but the real picture needs to be presented to those decision makers. And financially, I'm probably more conservative than some people in this room, so I know where you're coming from, but um, I would really ask you to consider that strongly. Uh, Gail should be the advocate. <laughs> So, um, okay. Well, Is there any? Are we, are we I'm sorry. Are, are we done with the commission? Are we? We can go ahead with the commission. Are we done with the commission? Is there any further discussion for public? Um. That's yeah. It. I. I. So I do pay taxes. And what's better for the public libraries is there's one Rebecca, and how many libraries is she servicing, and the calls that she's getting. And then we can't do our job to help our patrons because there's not enough help at that state level. Have we, you ever encountered that? Um, yeah, it, it, yeah. But it's only because she deserves a, bit, a break. She deserves a vacation just like everybody else. And so when she's gone, it's hard to get those eight questions answered because there's not somebody there that would know the system as like even with an assistant, some of the stuff that Rebecca gets may be able to be answered by somebody else and some of the harder stuff she can focus on. But it's really hard for us as librarians because I'm one person, I don't have an IT and probably what 75% of our libraries in Montana do not have IT, it's the library director. I'm the IT, I'm the children's librarian, I'm the director, I'm that janitor, the janitor because we don't have maintenance right now. And so, having that help to where we can call them and say, hey, I need help. How can I do this in five minutes instead of spending two weeks on it trying to figure it out because somebody got to go on vacation with their family? I mean, it's not fair to the state and it's not fair to Rebecca and it's not fair to the librarians to be stuck and not be able to help our patrons. So I get the taxes, I pay taxes, but you know what? It's a lot less complaining on our level from our patrons when we're able to help them because it's an immediate society right now. And I can definitely see where we, if we could even say yes, that this is a potential position and let the legislature know, I can definitely see that. So, Madam Chair, yes. I am. Um, I'm waffling now, thank you. No, very good. Yeah. Um, my heart in this entire commission is of the boots on the ground librarian. And because there's two things, we're responsible for the certification and we require much of this data right. for the certification. Mm -hmm. And we have one person trying to provide this certification data to people throughout the state to meet our request. And it does um, meet the help them directly. This will probably be the only um, personnel item that I will be supporting. Okay, more comments? Yes. Yeah, hi, I'm Susan Gregory, and I'm a Boston Library Director. Thank you very much. Just a quick comment. Right? Um, I just would respectfully ask, as you all move forward with business this afternoon, when you talk about taxpayers, taxpayers, please remember we are taxpayers. Uh -huh. All of us are taxpayers. My property taxes is going up. Am I excited about that? No. And that's where the big picture kind of comes in. So what I want to say is, when you look at the cost of an FTE, please remember, it's not so much growing government as we're growing Montana. And I can speak to that. This is a true statistic that we have a new door counters. In March, 27,000 people 
came to the Berkeley Public Library just in March. That's huge. We haven't even hit our summer season. We're averaging 1,100 to 1,200 people a day through our doors. Those people are of all ages, lots and lots of children and families, but a lot of people starting small businesses, a lot of people who are entrepreneurs. And so a position like the one that's been requested really can translate into more um, business dollars down the down the way. That's what we need to remember, I think. Is what will this data do for somebody starting a small business, someone trying to grow a small business? So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you everyone for your public comment. Is there any further? We do need to get going. <laughs> We're late already. Yes. Is there someone online? Is there anyone online that has their hand up? Nope. Okay, thank you, Genevieve. I'll share the motion. Give me one sec. Okay. I think that's okay. correct. Okay, so there's no further discussion. Madam Chair? Yes. A, a, a tie vote in normal rules of order is a negative. That's right. Yes. Okay. Um, there's been a motion. Okay, sorry. Okay, it has been properly moved. Okay, hold on. Can you guys see the motion on the screen? Yes, yeah. sorry. Okay. I'm, That's okay. I'm I just want to make sure. I... we... Okay, yeah. so seeing no further discussion, we'll now vote on the motion, which is to accept the research and data analysis position as an FTE from the general fund. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. 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 So and tell so... me the ayes. Do you mind telling me the ayes? Okay, so it's um, Tammy, Peggy, Brian, and Robin say aye. Thank you. And Tom and Carmen, okay. So the motion to accept the research and data analysis position, excuse me, analysis position as an FTE from the general fund has passed. Okay, shall we stop for lunch? I'm sorry, we were supposed to be done at 12.15. <laughs> Every um, we will should we say one fifteen? We'll say one fifteen. We will be back. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you after lunch. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Out out in the foyer where you registered, there should be a buffet for lunch. <laughs> So we will now go ahead with the rest of our meeting. Let me get my, sorry, I was. Okay, so we are back to um, the budget request of House Bill 2, State Budget Bill. We, I am going to um, ask if we, if it is all right with everyone to go ahead and discuss the the Habitat and Weed Information Specialist, the Invertebrate Information Specialist, Natural Resource Information System, the Web Programmer, the um, Montana State Reference Network, the GI, right? the GIS Architecture Upgrades and Imagery Repository, GIS Imagery, what is that word? Collection, thank you, I have a hole in mind. Um, if we, we would like to have a special meeting to discuss those and go right to the Montana Library's resource sharing infrastructure, because I believe there is quite a, there are quite a few people that are here that want to discuss that with us. So I think we need their input. So I need a motion to defer those items that I just listed to a special meeting and we will discuss the order. Pardon me? Could we just change the order? No, well, it'll take a. It's going to take us too long to go through the rest of these. Let's have a. We need to have a special meeting to discuss the ones, to discuss the ones that I said. Mm -hmm. Right. If that's, I just think it would take too long. Well, we have we have other, and we need yeah. We need more information. I, I would like to make that motion. Okay, so okay, so so Carmen made the motion. Excuse me. Excuse me. Thank you. 
Okay, Carmen made the motion to um, to defer the items that I just listed. And it was seconded by Peggy to a special meeting, which we will, um, at the end, we have another, we have another special meeting proposed for the Montana Geospatial Information Act grant program. So we will, we will go, we will discuss it at that point of, of times and dates. Will that be a Zoom? It, it would be up to you if you want to do Zoom or, or, or in person. We can just, let, uh -huh. let's think about that. And when we get to the uh -huh. end, let's decide that. Carmen, so does that, been, yeah, Carmen, does that me? motion, oh wait, let me show the motion um, because it kind of was casual. So let me make sure that this reflects what you guys want to give me one second. Can you guys see it? The remaining, the remaining. Thank um, you. Budget request or the remain door of the budget request, excluding the remainder. How about the remainder? Everything's about the resource share. Okay. To defer the remaining budget requests, excluding the library shared resources to a future special meeting. Okay, so the, the motion has been made. Is there um, any further discussion? Is there any public discussion? Okay, if not, see no further discussion. We will now, now vote on the motion, which is to defer the remaining budget requests, excluding the library shared resources to a future special meeting. All, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Okay, so the Deferment of the remaining budget requests, excluding the library shared resources to a special future meeting has been passed unanimously. Okay, um, next we will go on then to the Montana Library's resource sharing infrastructure. Are there any motions? Is there a motion? I move the forward uh, sponsoring the Montana Library's resource sharing infrastructure. <laughs> that does include two of the two FTE. Um, to send on to the budget interim committees. Is that what it's going to do? Is it to, the to, the, to, to the governor's office. To the governor's office. I'm going to send that request to the governor's office. I will share that in just a second. Just one sec. I think I probably missed a few words, so. We can't see it. Okay, that's good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's get rid of the two. This yeah, just move to, just move. to uh, send the library resource sharing request to the governor's office. So the, it should read motion by Peggy Taylor. Move. Okay. Just move to the governor's office. Okay. And seconded by Brian. Okay, it has been properly moved and seconded that we move to send the library resource sharing request to the governor's office. Is there any discussion? Carmen? Is there any way that the state library could prioritize these for me? Do you have any sense of which ones? would be your your priorities? I think the difficulty in prioritizing them is how interrelated they are. So as we've talked about before, you really need to be a member of the shared catalog in order to be a member of partners. You really need a courier to have the courier 
maximize your investment in partners. Um, and then there's a huge need for e-resources for school and academic libraries that aren't addressed anywhere at all. Um, we have huge needs for other kinds of e-resources like Montana Library to go that aren't addressed anywhere else. So because these are so interrelated and serve our breadth, uh, all of our stakeholders, um, you know, public school, academic, and special libraries, it really does put us in a difficult position to prioritize them. I have a question. We sent this as a group. It with the budget, with the governor's office, look at each individual item and possibly send some forth and not others. It, or do they look at it as just the one ask? Melissa, are you on? She is. She just got back on. Melissa, you're muted just in case um, you're. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Great. Great. So the, we could ask them to look at it individually for sure. But, but the governor and his budget office can definitely put in whatever amount they would decide. Madam Chair, may I ask a question? Yeah. If Jenny cannot separate out for us individually, what parts of these might be funded by itself as a standalone? How could the governor's office? I mean, it seems like it has to be the whole thing, but we can't separate them out. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Can I help? And yes. Uh, if we refer to this page, right? That's that's a pretty good breakdown. That's what I got. And for the benefit of people in the audience who might not have the handout, um, are about and one less than item for the It's um, e resources Montana History Portal, Montana K 12 Overdrive, Montana Shared Catalog, Montana Library Google, MSC Partners Shared Collections, OCLC, Resource Sharing Staff Support, State Agencies Digital Collections, Statewide Courier, and Treasure State Academic Information Library Services Trails. But I go back to the comment when. <laughs> Carmen asked if these could be prioritized or pulled out, and mm -hmm. Jenny said, no, they're all interdependent. So then you yeah. really can't pull them out. Um, you have to include the whole thing. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and to clarify, they are broken out. You can see them broken right. out. I was asked whether or not we could prioritize them, and, and my response is that's very difficult because of how right. interrelated they are and how they serve everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay, but they can't, they are already broken. Right. right. And would be presented this way. If I that's mean, what the commission directed us to do. Oh, okay. Madam Chair? Yes. I point out this is $10 million. And um, our shop is about an $11 million shop between mapping and library services presently. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, this doubles the size of our shop or a number of requests. That's this is a shift of taxpayer burden from one group of taxpayers to a different group of taxpayers. As you can tell, I'm opposed to this. And I also point out that Montana Libraries had a 4.6 million decline from in attendance or visitation from 4.6 million visits in 2011 to in 2022, visits have fallen to 2.5 million, 46% decline. And I'm dying to get the 2023 numbers, hoping that the, the slow bump that we've seen the last year or two recovers some of that 46%. But from that number to this number, even after a trough, Mm -hmm. We're at 46 down. Um, so those are some some of the facts that I bring to bear in my opposition to this. Thank you. I would love to have a sense of what the current funding for these items is as it stands now. Mm -hmm. Are we asking for mm -hmm. twice as much? Or are we asking for? Mm -hmm. So on page four of your resource sharing document, that that information is broken out. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 
Could you, could you take me through an example? Just push one on the Sure, I can take you through the totals at the bottom. Okay. So the state library spends approximately $500,000 libraries spend approximately $1.8 million for a total of $2.3 million. And we're, ask, so we're asking for that $2.3 million plus an expansion of $8.2 million. So we're going from $2.5 million to $10 million. Yep. Okay, so I'd like to ask about the, I'm sorry not to break it out, but the e-resources. So those books, is it information? Is it, can you explain the e-resources? I'll start and then if um, Kara is in the room, she can help me. These are a, a variety of things like uh, periodical research databases that are used by school libraries, um, other kinds of online databases and e-content that's procured through a, a contracted vendor. I would ask for, for so it's basically not just oh let's go out, buy the bestseller book no. unless you okay right right these are these are largely resource research resources because I know that a library can buy a book for the an ebook but it costs the library ninety dollars you can have four copies or whatever yeah um then you lose it after two or three years mm -hmm. and I mean you can go to Amazon and buy but, but the library. Mm -hmm. It has to do the even so anyway it's, mm -hmm. that's one other thing too thank you yes um so on this sheet we show 10 million dollars in the you funding mean, required for resource sharing in the film but as an answer to Mr. Comfortson's question that's not all new. So it might should have said 8.2 million here. Give us a better better picture on this on this clear here. It's just impassable. So the request is 10.6, but some of that is old. Two two million is is yeah. present level of spending on these services. It's hard to get that, but I would ask for the presented side by side, but um, the e-resource, we're asking 4.4 million. But on this paper, that's all of it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's all correct. New. That's all new. That's okay. Correct. So it would be helpful if we could at least go down this real quickly. Sure. And the Montana portal, we're asking 150, and it's presently 50. Right? Six. 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 It's, it's just really hard to turn back and forth. They were side by side. Okay. It's, it's, it's right. It's in that far right column. column. Okay. So um, the K 12, we're asking 100,000. Right. And then what we're asking. Yeah. So you want to take the overdrive to schools. Sure. Yes, Carmen. I would sorry. like to go through this item by item. Um, the e resources, I have one question who curates that collection? Kara, so, what was the question? Who would curate that collection? Curate, that's like a really good question. At 4.4 million, we're estimating we'd be able to provide just shy of $6,000 per library, including all of the school libraries in our state to uh, be able to determine what e-resources they are lacking. And I would expect that we would have committees comprised of the stakeholders and uh, professionals who would be using those resources to make recommendations to us for what we should be contracting for. Uh, some, some examples, well, a few years ago, we had a statewide suite of research databases, which our schools dearly miss, and we would love to replace those. We could also supply research databases for our medical law libraries and our research libraries. Here in Montana, uh, genealogy resources, newspapers. Uh, we talked about summer reading earlier. There, there are online summer reading um, resources that allow uh, 
libraries and their users to, to track program attendance and reading logs and use and things called the stack, uh, let's say that one, read squared. And homeschooling resources, of course, those are things that we have been asked for over and over again at the state library that we don't have the capacity to fund or even really to negotiate through purchases. We don't have the staff capacity and we don't have any resources to, but financial resources to put into those contracts. So this would help to address some of those needs that we hear from libraries about over and over again, canopy, oopla, mm -hmm. the school databases, uh, more content uh, like Montana Library to go from other vendors to complement those needs and vocational education resources, online repair manuals, things like that. Whatever we're hearing from our library community um, through, probably through committees, is how I imagine that would come up to us in the form of recommendations to the Network Advisory Council, which we could then come to you. So it's in a way like Montana Library to go, but it's not fiction, mm -hmm. it's other types of research. Manuals, data, <laughs> research. <laughs> And the schools wouldn't have to pay a fee to be a part of this. That's correct. Easy. Yes. In the past, we have supplied those mm -hmm. uh, at no cost to the school. How are we duplicating the school libraries? Do we have school librarians in the room who would like to respond to that? What, what, I don't want to put you on the spot. How are we duplicating the resources that are available to school libraries? So I found it very difficult to be able to find resources. I'm a Deb-Western um, Hellgate Elementary K-8 district. Um, I'm the 4-6 librarian and have been searching and searching and searching to find um, not only databases that are that work for my age group, but that we can then afford within the budget that we have that would mean taking other resources away from our kids to find. So mm -hmm. our kids spend time searching the very first thing they Google to get their resources. And I really would love to teach them to find information that will help them become better researchers and information that we has been vetted and we know is valid and usable. And it's it's really difficult as a independent district. And, and I'm pretty big with a pretty decent budget, but the littler ones, schools can't can you even begin. Can to, you tell us if you have found those databases out in the real world? So um, I proposed to my school board to um, use Learn360 to get a year to see if it would work. And they I was told that it was too expensive and they thought that the budget would be used better used other other ways. So um, so we've actually I wanted it to be four through eight and we've shrunk it to six through eight and have been approved for at least that grouping. And but we found, I've we found databases for the six through eight. So that so next year so we've been will. approved okay. and I can't I mean I haven't used you it haven't yet, used it yet. of all okay. the research we've so done that was the that. one that I found would work the best for yes. us. Okay. But it's not gonna meet the needs yeah, of all our kids because group. of cost prohibitive. And this is definitely the way our kids are learning now. Mm -hmm. Lots of lots of research on computers. Well, I, know, I know as far as schools are concerned, that this would get all the schools able to have all the information, mm -hmm. all the library stuff, mm -hmm. all of it. And I would point out, as Kara said, by having a statewide negotiated contracts for these. We're saving the time of all of those local schools, all of those local school administrators from having to do the procurement and contracting work. And the expiratory work. Mm -hmm. um, Madam Chair, I especially as the whole item is together, um, it puts, again, it, it's difficult because there might be something that I would pull out. Um, I'm a noble to this. Um, I share what Commissioner Burnett shared, but I also think we're picking up jobs that are not our responsibility. I think if the schools need these resources, they have their school funding budgets that they need to do local control um, and to their state, their own state lobbying, even the medical group. I, I feel like if there's things they need, then they should be doing that for their own medical libraries. 
um, I, I feel like we are having put forward to us the request way beyond what our scope is and I'm very uncomfortable with that. May, may I respond to that? Mm -hmm. I wanna I want to point out the, the, the actual statute that we're requesting the funding to appropriate funds for. It says the commission shall establish a statewide interlibrary resource sharing program. The purpose of the program is to administer funds appropriated by the legislature. There currently is no appropriation to support and facilitate resource sharing among libraries in Montana, including but not limited to public libraries, public library districts, libraries operated by public schools or school districts, libraries operated by colleges or universities, tribal libraries, libraries operated by public agencies for institutionalized persons, and libraries operated by private, um, nonprofit, private medical, educational, and research institutions. So it's, it's wholly within the scope, and it's actually in law. It is. I agree with you. But I don't support that that is our role. I think it's a very, very uncomfortable transferring the responsibility of all those funding sources and local control of schools, et cetera, their commissions, their own oversight boards to us. It's, it's a huge jump. It's 8.2 million. And our current funding is is very inadequate to support the needs of a statewide program. Mm -hmm. so that, that, exactly. That's why it's a huge jump. Our, our library's local cap tax dollars are maxed out. And so that's why we have to look to the state to <laughs> fill in some of that gap. Mm -hmm. And what this infrastructure is really intending to provide is that base level of library service regardless of where you live in Montana. We know when you're relying on the local tax revenues at the local level, you're going to have libraries that have some resources. You're gonna have libraries that have absolutely no resources. And, and our hope is, and the intent of this statute is that all Montanans, wherever you live, can expect a base level of library infrastructure. And that's what this request is intended to fund. And it is a request. It's a request. This is, you are voting to request that these items continue to be considered by the governor and by the legislature. This is the start of a process. Chair? Yes. So to be clear, we do currently have resource sharing and we are following the statute we are doing that. We are considering how much to expand expand what we are already doing. Um, mm -hmm. To go from zero to four and a half million makes me entirely uncomfortable because it looks to me like, even though I know you are responding to questions and, and asks from libraries, um, like, a, like a big trial balloon. I would prefer that we could start with a database or two and see what the uptake is and see how much use it is um, and not start with a four and a half million dollar request from zero. Madam Chair, yes. I'd like to um, point out that the section of code 221328, the history of that section goes back to 2009 and to 1999 and to 1989. So the uh, uh, the, the lack of funding to the level proposed is uh, is an old problem. Once mm -hmm. again, to the solve. Thank you. Thank you. This has been updated as a 2023 slide, right? No, no. Mm -hmm. The most yeah. current change to it was 2009. Mm -hmm. okay. So this was put into statute in 2009 and nothing's been done about it? I'm sure it started in 89, then it was revised in 99, then revised in 2009. Mm -hmm. Has the legislature refused to give money previously? We've, we've never asked. This commission asked for funding last session. Okay. And nothing was, uh, and nothing, yeah, it, nothing was done. We, we, we got the one-time hotspot money. Okay. That was the one thing that we got out of that request from last session. Madam Chair, I look at this a little differently in that how it was in 2009 as to today. And um, I look at it as readily information now. 
<clears throat> I I think you're hard pressed to find young people who can't find what they want on their computers. But is phones. it accurate? Well, that's going to be a question even with us. Um, even with us, there is absolutely, I think we have to be honest about this and transparent. There is no amount of money you can spend to make accessible every piece, every page, every word available to people to read right now in the world. There will always be decisions made. There will always have to be somebody filtering through that and saying yes to this article, no to this book, yes to this page, no to that work. And those decisions, I think, are way better made at a local level, a family level, and by the people themselves. And any filtering that comes to us where we become responsible for which of these are considered information versus misinformation for any of the rest of it. I, I think 2009, they did, could not even conceive of the ready, readily available information that young people and seniors and everybody have today at their phones. So I think I have a hard time saying that we are the only source that can give them this information. Every time you say yes to one book in the library, you said no to a half a million. Easily. Is there any other discussion amongst us? Or what? Go ahead. How, how, are, we, are we going to go through every. Separate, yeah, I, or how, how, I, mean, I mean, should we should we go? Should we decide that? The motion this is was to consider the vote. And I'm sure we had an outline of this without numbers um, two, two months ago at our regular meeting. Right. We have the, the common tent motion. Right. Mm -hmm. They are all valid in their own right. And I can see the purpose for all of them in their own right. It's just a question of. Where we spend the money in Montana? Eight million dollars. Like a lot of groups. I guess, and I'm asking also, do we, and this is just me, do we decide, okay, we're not sending any of this forward, or do we decide we're going to send this forward and let the legislature take a look at it, take the governor, let the governor look at it, um, and say, okay, yes to this, yes, oh, okay, let's give them 25,000 for this. I mean, you know, perhaps we should allow it to go on a little further to have mm -hmm. them take a look at each one of these personally, individual without, individually without prioritizing them. I feel put in a position where I either say yes to everything that the state library wants, or I say no to everything. That is to me um, a very unhappy position to be put in. But if I'm put in that position, I will make a yes or no decision. I would personally, and I'm sorry, I'm supposed to, supposed to speak as a group, but I, I believe that we should break each one of these out and ask them to consider without prioritizing ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to point out, too, that we did have a work session, and we did hear from yes, every did. one of these people in credible mm -hmm. reports. Yeah. And, and they were all worthy. Yes. Mm -hmm. so. it's, it's up to you if you want to consider them all individually mm -hmm. or as a package. Our recommendation is to send them as a package, but it's up to you. Is there a motion on the table? Yes. Yeah. I believe so. What is the motion on the table, Genevieve? Could you show it to us, please? Yes, I'll be sure. One moment. Any further discussion? Carmen? If that's the motion on the table, I will vote no because I do not support any requests that take especially collection development in any way, shape, or form away from local libraries. I think we need to have diversity and we need to let individual libraries make their own decisions about their collections. 
that's what makes especially individual public libraries special and unique and different. I support the state libraries supporting libraries with the shared catalog and with the courier. I do not support a centrally curated collection in any way, shape, or form. So if I have to vote on this motion and consider all of it together, I will vote no. So could can we make an amendment to consider each of these individually? You could vote down this motion and then consider. I think we decided earlier that when I wanted to do that on the other section, it was a different motion. Okay. So we'll, I think so we we'll vote that. on this and see then we'll happens. see if there's another motion. Okay. Right. Can you take public comment? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Is there any public comment? I have just a question. Do you yes. want them to comment on this as a whole, or do you want to wait and have them save their comments if they have comments for individual parts? I'd say that we should wait and have them um, make comments on individual parts. I'm sure that we will get that motion. So if we could wait for individual parts. So is there any discussion on this motion for yeah. the decision here? Genevieve, is there anyone online? Their hand up? No. Okay, if there is none, it, it has been properly moved and seconded that um, to send the <coughs> resource sharing request to the governor's office. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 All opposed say no. 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 Okay, so it has been rejected by a voice vote. Are my eyes correct? Yes. Yes. Thank you. You know, I'd like to apologize for saying that we didn't have that. That was very clear, and I thank you very much. Thanks and, and thanks to Kara and Rebecca for yeah, putting together that information. On the table when I had gone through it. Okay, now I would check go. I said, Hey, is there a motion to individualize each of these requests for the library resource sharing to the governor's office? Is that do you want to do it? Like, sorry. I think you could do it by item. So by like item. you did for the previous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to mm -hmm. vote to yeah. do that. Okay. Okay. They're off now. If someone wants to put them on, they can move. So. Oh, okay. So we're still discussing e-resources mm -hmm. then. Is so there, we need to I would, vote ask, ask, I would ask if there's a motion to support that. Is there a motion to support the e-resources? I'll move that. I'll second it. It has been moved and seconded to support the e resources. Move it on to the governor's office. Yeah, add that. Um, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to put words in the motion. Should we put the dollar amounts in there? To support the e resource, but e resources budget of four million four hundred thousand. Tell me that amount. Tell me that amount. I just don't have that document in front of me. What was that? Can you tell me the what amount? Hey, Brian, did you do it? So I Can you tell me the amount one more time? I just don't know the amount. They don't have it. I'm got a different screen. Oh, oh, it's four million more. No, it's four million. Four million, million four hundred thousand. Thank you. Oops, mm -hmm. number one. Oh, come here. I'll fix that. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. One more zero, Genevieve. Oh, yep, I deleted it. Thank you. Yeah, 
right? Yeah. If the player needs that zero to four, that'll be four. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, yes, I just want to respond to uh, Commissioner Cuthbert's comment about um, this potentially taking away local control from libraries. I don't think it's doing that. What this is doing is it's making a suite of electronic resources available to libraries, and individual libraries can choose to may take advantage to use those resources or not. So a library could conceivably decide not to use any of them, not to put any of them, link to any of them on their website. So um, I think that libraries still have a, a lot of control over what they do. But right now, there are many libraries that can't afford any of these or very few of them. So it's making a lot more resources available to libraries of thought. Yes. That, that is correct, but they're only being forced to pay for it by taxes. So if we if we do this, whether the library uses it or not, you're correct, that's up to that library. But the library, in the form of its patrons and all the residents, has been forced to pay for it. Um, so, you know, if we, what I support is us distributing the funds to the individual libraries, which we are doing, and the library has successfully advocated in the past to raise that um, so that the local libraries have more money available to do with as they see fit. That's where I see great benefit. This to be, while there may be some choice of some element of choice left, the choice to pay for it or not pay for it has to be taken away from the local level and we mandate that everybody pay in for this. And that's a big part of my hang up. I want to preserve local control as much as possible. So I, I understand you. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Madam Chair? Yes. Um, that, that's correct. But if we distributed the money to individual libraries, it wouldn't go as far okay. because it is sort of by collectively that we can get much better prices right and it's divides down to six thousand dollars per library and to get the data bases and the data content i mean i mean each library doing this for six thousand dollars is not possible it's not good. you need to buy that by 120 libraries yes. well i guess the six thousand includes the school libraries also yeah. and right. other own funding no. They, they are not supported by the Office of Public Instruction mm -hmm. for, for libraries' resources. They don't receive any funding. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there any further public comment? Or is there any public comment? We've had commissioner, is there any further com um, commission comment? I'm sorry. First off. If not, we'll ask for public comment about the e resources. Madam Chair, can I just say something? This is Jeannie Ferris. I'm online with you. And part yes, of the reason I am online is because I am short staffed today and had to stay and do story hour. Um, mm -hmm. I was an academic librarian and currently I am the librarian at the White Hawk Community Library. And I just wanted to say the one thing that having the state library um, get in the middle of e-resources, it helps us so much. My time is so short, and I can tell you from being an academic librarian and having negotiate e-resource contracts that the time that they save me to be able to say, this is what we have for you, this is the price we were able to negotiate for you, is just priceless. I do not have time to sit down and go through all of the different contracts, all of the different e-sources that are available, and to be able to have the state library said, we are going to do this for you. It does not take away local control from my county here in Jefferson. It just saves me one more thing off of the thousand things I have to do in a day that comes well researched, you know, checked out and makes my patrons so happy when they can just go to the, excuse me, go to the computer and say, wow, I didn't realize you had all of this. So thank you to the state people for all of the work that they do researching this. 
because having been on the other side of it, it takes a lot of time. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Okay, and I saw a hand. Yes. My name is Ken Yeah, go ahead and stand. Okay. Um, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself, but I'm in an unusual position in that I'm the coordinator of trails, which is the academic consortium of libraries around the state. And just what you're speaking to is what my job is. So I go in and I leverage our buying power collectively and I get much, much better deals than any of our individual libraries and members could get on their own. And by not allowing this to happen, frankly, you're putting the students of the state of Montana at a disadvantage because they're going up against other students in other states where this is regular practice. They normally very often have a centralized location where they're getting all the resources. So from cradle to grave, you're covered. And I just want to strongly advocate um, on behalf of, of this uh, proposal. Thank you. Carmen, I see your hand yeah, up, sorry. Um, do we have a list of resources that make up this four and a half million dollar amount? Or is this a, a, mm -hmm. an so the proposal? There's a description on page five, which provides examples of the sorts of resources we would we have heard from libraries that they would like to fund if they had the, the budget and things they would like to prioritize. And I would reiterate that uh, the Network Advisory Council helps us to set priorities based on what we do here from our library um, community. So, so you pretty much have four and a half million dollars worth of more or less resources that you're going to aim for at this meeting. Yes. You already have them selected? No. No. Okay, but you, you, this is, okay, kind of like, okay, this is what, what we think we're going to need. Mm -hmm. I have a hand up example, you have local newspapers yes, we, here? Yes, we have a handout, mm -hmm. Genevieve, sorry. That's okay, right. that'd be the truth. Oh. Hi, oh, can you hear up. me? Oh, I, oh, I thought you <laughs> said handout, <laughs> sorry. Okay, Joe, um, this is, um, I want to let Carmen speak first, and then I'll go to Jody if that's all right. Go ahead, Carmen. So, I think you answered my question. You do have certain resources in mind? With Not specific vendors, but these areas are the areas that we've heard that are um, gaps in libraries, electronic resources. So the, mm -hmm. Some of those local newspapers. Yes, uh, Tammy asked about the local newspapers. Uh, I had spoken with the, there's the executive director of the Montana Newspaper Association, and we were trying to find a way to facilitate electronic access through libraries in a way that would be agreeable to the newspaper associations, that'd be beneficial to them. And they have done something similar with Utah and um we we hadn't got to the to a point where we had a really solid budget um, request for that, but that was something that we've heard from libraries as they would like to provide. Not you know we have we have national newspapers, but we'd like to prioritize Montana newspapers, especially Montana owned newspapers. So if they go to this to the e resources, it will be like a check mark of a patron coming to the library. Basically, if they check out, if they go on to read the local newspaper, will it be, oh, there's a visit to um, the library? Different, different resources will log use in different ways, but generally we will be able to get statistics on how many uses per month, as we do with Montana Library to go and our other resources. Now I'm sure I have a question after yes. Julie. There's yes. two yes. hands Sorry, up, uh, Becky and Jody. Okay, Jody, we'll go ahead with you first. Thanks, everyone. This is Jody Moore from the Red Lodge Carnegie Library. I am also a member of the NAF, and I'm sorry I am not there in person today. I also did story time at my library this morning. Um, I really would encourage you guys, I hear the concern about local control, but I want to remind you that the ultimate control lies with the patrons. Libraries make these resources available 
But a patron chooses whether or not they use them and which resources they access. A parent can choose whether or not their child has a library card and has access to the e-resources. So I don't think making these services available to all Montanans, to all library sizes, all library types, means that you are changing the access to collections in any negative way for any Montanan. You're just giving them the ability to access that information if they choose it. Much like the courier gives all of our patrons access to materials from libraries around the state, because maybe you are interested in materials that your local library does not carry. We have Montanans of all kinds and all interests and having access to this information, I think truly does make them more able to get the information that they want. Much like I go to the grocery store, I don't expect the grocery store to only carry the groceries I'm interested in. I know that other people have more diverse tastes and that foods for them are also available. So that's kind of how I think of it. And I would encourage you guys to think about it in that way as well. The ultimate control belongs to the patron with the library card who gets to choose what they access and making them have the most choice possible means making all libraries be able to have access to this information to provide for them. We are not going to make anyone read anything they are not comfortable reading. I don't think any librarian would want that. So just something that I wanted to point out and I hope that helps you think about it in a slightly different way. Thank you, Jody. Becky? Hi, this is Becky Dupre. Thank you, Madam Commissioner and members of the, the commission. Um, I was not intending to be a part of this meeting. In fact, I would not be here right now if I had not already blocked out the time for the shared catalog meeting. I'm a teacher librarian at Big Sky High School in Missoula County, um, but I also work as a mentor for teacher librarians through the MSU library program for teacher librarians. And I, I see a lot of people who are working in smaller districts than my own, and many of those districts do not have library budgets at their schools at all. They have zero dollars assigned to them, and so they don't get these services, and the inequity is wild. And I'm, I'm just such a supporter of the shared service, the benefit that we get from from the Montana State Library, all of our shared services. This is this this would be a dream. While we were listening to um, kind of the debate about the first part of this, I pulled my annual report from last year, and um, my school, which has about 1,100 students had um, over 12,500 database searches from databases that we pay for because we are lucky enough to have a budget. Um, I'm not sure what that budget is going to look like next year. We have a current subscription to something called Newsbank, which gives us access to local papers across the state. And we're probably going to have to drop it because the price is about $8,000 for our district. Um, and so that's just one database that we provide. But when we collectively come together, the bargaining power that we have, I cannot understate that. So right now, the state library can't support us, even if we said, here's our money, help us use your bargaining power to purchase something because they don't have the staff to be able to do that. So what this does for us is it would free up resources that, that we could use in other places and that we could use a little bit more wisely as we see shrinking budgets. Um, I remember when we had InfoTrack through the state, a lot of other states have these base level services services. Ohio has had it. Alaska has had it. We had small engine repair. Our um, students who are involved in STEM were really interested in that. We had history databases, science, genealogy. Those are just some of the ones that I remember. But we're a, we're a high school and these database purchases, they're huge. They're a major part of our budget. And then we do actually see quite a bit of use at the schools. And I, I just want to go ahead and advocate for the 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 opportunity to have that buying power um, and to be able to maybe redirect to schools that don't have any buying power because they have zero budget. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Becky. Is there anyone? Oh, yes. Commissioner, thank you. I wasn't planning on speaking today, so bear with me. Um, I'm just hoping to, my name is Karen Ketchu. I am director of Madison Valley Public Library in Ennis. 
And I was hoping to give you a viewpoint from a small library's point of view. Um, the funding we receive from taxpayer dollars keeps our building hot or cool and turns the lights on and pays for our salary. We fundraise for our book purchases. We fundraise for our programming uh, purchases. And often we have to choose whether to purchase books or e-resources. So the opportunity to leverage um, purchasing e-resources through the state would help our rural community not have to make those choices and have the same opportunities as bigger libraries, which our rural communities very much appreciate. Thank you. And Montana is very rural. Um, yes. Uh, Susan Gregory, Bozeman Public Library. Um, in thinking about the comment that was made earlier about the drop in library visits, I'm wondering if those dates actually included the COVID years because all the libraries around the country, but certainly here in Montana, I have to speak for Bozeman, we were closed for months. Our numbers plummeted, and it's really hard to remember those days before there was a vaccine, but everyone was scared. We were all scared. The only people in the building were employees, and we were all masked up, and we were running books out to people at the curve. So um, I think as we look at, at moving forward also, the COVID years influenced so many things, and especially the use of resources. During those years when people could not come into the library, they used the e-resources e at home in the kitchen tables. Those e-resources kept a lot of kids who had access to them somewhere on a successful plane with their schooling. And so that influence mm -hmm. has not changed. The demand for e-resources that was built during the COVID year has continued. And then I also want to point out that um, we serve a lot of homeschool families in Bozeman, and a lot of them use these e-resources. And as homeschool families, they, they have no bargaining power. So I'm guessing a lot of other homeschool people are going to take too. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, I just, I'm going to bring a sense of practicality to this that people often don't want to consider, but I don't think we can proceed with this without it. According to the ISBN, as of October, there are 2.2 million new books published every year. Presently, in current in the world, are 158 million books, types, not books, a type. There is no e-resource list that can list and make available every children's book. Never mind medical articles. Never mind everything about your genealogy or my genealogy or school or homeschool literature. It's not conceivable that we think that's happening. So it's a question of where are we moving the decisions to make that those choices? 20, I mean, I think we have to realize this is not going to be if we had an e-list that said this is every children's book available right now to any child through any publishing service and you can go and buy it or get it if you choose but if we are expecting people to be able to connect to those articles those books it's not conceivable this is making decisions as to what's going to be available to people and i know I don't think it's practical. I think it's moving power into one resource that should be staying. I know, but I appreciate so much my librarians, my heart aches on what they're trying to do, but they can go home and say to their children, bring up for me how I get this genealogy list for these seniors who came in here today, and they can bring it up, and you can go then and tell them if you want. But I'm telling you, we can't we can't provide all this. And for us to be pretending we can is not on us. We cannot be obsessing 158 million books titled. Never mind all the others. Do you have something to say to that? Go ahead. 
I'm Jody Overweiser, and I'm the library director at the Drummond School and Community Library. At the beginning of my career, the state library provided databases from Ebbsville or Dale, and it was some of the ones that Debbie, it, sorry, that Becky mentioned. Um, when that went away, that went away for my students, and we have no databases. Um, so we're not we're not talking about all the books that are available. We're talking about these databases that are curated and um, it's not going out to the World Wide Web. And just so are they their databases for research? Right. It's articles. It's, it's articles. Um, and even the auto repair database. Auto repair, a lot right. Of community members use that. Mm -hmm. So there will be things left yeah. out like children's books, mm -hmm. etc. Yeah. out of the, because this is different from actual books. Right. Right. These are databases for information, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Summer reading program for the joint. But that's, so the summer reading for, I mean, that we do have that. That is a, it's like the homeschooling curriculum and the summer reading um, modules that allow libraries to uh, put some other summer programming online or to help their users to log what they're reading. It's not the books themselves, it's the program or the process of using the program process. Yeah. Okay, so a lot of these are processes and a lot of them are the data to refer to not actually e-books. Right. This would be a lot of proprietary material that you can't find on the internet because a vendor is selling it and they should be, they should, they're a private Like John Deere. Should, yeah, exactly, yeah, I mean, right. Mm -hmm. They're not going to give it no, away. No, they're not going to give it away. So this would tell you where to go and get that. That they, it would uh, be like anything that you would subscribe to, password protected, you'd use your library card to log in so you can use that resource. Okay, we have it, uh, just a second, sorry, yes. Uh, my name is Hilary Woodard. I um, work at the Bozeman Public Library, not as library director or anything. I'm just a staff member. I work on a desk, um, often on the info desk upstairs. And a lot of people come for help for different things. Um, many people appreciate the online resources. And I help them. We have computers upstairs as well, so they can get on the computer for free. And then they use all these resources, consumer reports. Can't get that from home, come to the library, local newspaper online. People look at that all the time. Um, we have things in learning at Bozeman Public Library, which a lot of libraries don't, they can't afford it. Through lessons in learning, you can learn how to use Word, Microsoft Word. I see people um, applying for jobs using the software that they can get at the library through these different databases. Um, we really, really help people through our online resources. Um, and we're very lucky at Bozeman that we can afford a lot of those that some libraries cannot. So having those same resources available at every library, I think from my point of view would be extremely valuable. Thank you. Okay, one second, Gail, let's let, I'm sorry, I missed your name. You. Jody. Yeah. Jody, sorry, yes. I just also wanted to say as a teacher librarian, uh, it isn't as easy as just having a kid click on. They need to learn how to um, decipher what is to, accurate. Exactly. Yes. And um, and sort through what's what's accurate. And that and is yes. such a skill that needs to be taught. Yes. Oh, thanks. That's the words I meant to say. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Sorry, you put words in your mouth. But I'm glad they Thank were. you, Gail. Bill Bacon, Belgrade Library. Uh, just to take on something I thought of when Hillary from Bolton was talking, like we had to drop the LinkedIn Learning database because we couldn't afford it. And what we have said to our patrons is um, you can go to the Bozeman website and use it. You might, and in some cases, you might need a Bozeman library card, which means a duplication of cards, which is not a good idea at all. But what it's doing is it's putting the onus on the Bozeman library to pay for the databases that we should have or that we need for our patrons. And because we had we didn't have the money for it, Bozeman's having to shoulder that. And I'm probably not the only library that knows enough to do that. So that's a very good example of Bozeman. 
And if you didn't go, now you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> so Ennis. <laughs> More comments? Yes, Carmen. Um, I would like to respond to the grocery store um, analogy. Um, again, with regard to choice, I think the library is not at all like a grocery store. If you wanted to compare it, you would have to create a grocery store where everybody who walks in has paid for every single item that's in there, and then they go in and choose to take the lettuce but not the apple, and that's the choice they're making. So when you compare an actual grocery store where you go in and you pick up and you pay for the item you choose, that's not the library. The library, everything is paid for, and you have paid for it. So yes, you have the choice not to take the apple home, but you have no choice whether you can pay or do not pay for the apple. You've already been forced to pay for it through the tax. So I just I just want to respond that comparison of a library to a grocery store falls completely flat if you at all keep in mind the, the payment for it. And we are not discussing four and a half million dollars that is falling to our lap. We are making a choice to spend four and a half million dollars of taxpayer money on this and not on something else, which could be who knows what, fixing potholes, our roads and bridges. I just would like all of us to keep that in mind. This money is not falling where it's been. I guess that I, I would also say that um, I don't think it's the choice for us as much as putting it before the legislature for them to make the choice to, or the governor, the governor of the legislature. It's their choice. Yes. But then we don't need to be here. We can have just Jenny forward um, a, a library wish list to the legislature. To the legislature. So what, what is our job? We're supposed to use our best information and discernment and and negotiate and come to conclusions as a body and vote and make a decision. And I'm I'm trying to be as open as I can, especially with the public, with my thought process. Um, and I'm I'm really trying hard to make a good choice. And just to dovetail off of that, you talk about having good information to make good decisions. Right now, we know that there is a lot of misinformation out there, and that's going to get worse because of AI. You're not going to be able to trust your eyes, your ears, or even what you're reading. The money that goes to the vendors for these proprietary databases that have research and cutting edge research articles in it is where you go for authoritative sources. And that helps to train children and you and everyone else how to distinguish between what is misinformation and hearsay and something on social media and what's actual factual truth. Again, I have to restate, do not allow the students and population of Montana to take advantage of this, to have this available to them is really kind of disgraceful. They need those tools. They need to be able to think and to analyze and to do it properly, you have to have quality information available to them. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, one second. Going forward, if I was, I should have already said this, is we probably should only have one comment per person and we're going to have to start limiting the time. So um, we'll limit it now, Genevieve, I'm sorry, to three minutes and yes. Uh, Rebecca Meredith, Belgrade Library. Um, I can speak to uh, the phenomenal comment on needing better media literacy and uh, accurate information. Um, what we need to understand about um, research in general is that it's typically peer reviewed. Um, it's much different than say on social media where it can just be one person saying something and claiming it as fact. Um, Many research articles are actually typically uh, backed by multiple experts within the field. Um, and specifically for, for me as a MSU student, um, that is actually the information I was supposed to access for my papers to provide information. Um, 
and show that it was accurate and up to date. So, um, and especially for me, uh, as far as privilege is concerned, uh, I don't know if you've ever tried to access a peer reviewed uh, uh, peer reviewed journal, but there are typically paywalls in front of them. Um, and that can make it very limiting to who actually gets access to that information. Um, for me, thankfully, because I was an MSU student, um, uh, mostly living off Taco Bell and ramen noodles because I didn't have a to my name, um, that is absolutely crisis to be able to have access to that information. Um, I don't think I would have graduated with a GPA as high as I have if I didn't have that sort of access to proper information. So I just want to keep that in mind um, when we're talking about like accuracy and what information that we show people and what bias we have in mind. Obviously, people are not perfect, even in peer-reviewed studies, you know, um, scientists can make mistakes and they often will admit to those mistakes and uh, revise and uh, uh, reevaluate and then put out new information. I think that's important to keep in mind when we're talking about access to databases. So I just wanted to show my support. Um, so thank you for your time. Thank you. Any more comments? Okay. From anyone, the commissioners? Okay, if not, Yes. Okay, so if there is not any further discussion, um, we will now vote on the motion, which is to move the e-resources budget request of four million four hundred thousand to the governor's office. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. 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 Okay. It is three of three. Um, so moving you the can e tell me the eyes. Um, Peggy, Brian, Robin, the the e resources budget request has been rejected by a voice vote. The nays have it. Next, we will go on to the Montana History Portal. Um, it's currently six thousand dollars. There is an expansion of one hundred forty-four thousand to one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Is there a motion? I move that we continue with to fund the Montana History Portal at six thousand dollars a year. Exactly. I would say we wouldn't need a motion for that since that's already in our budget. Only action. So is there a motion? Okay, so is there a motion for anything else? I guess we would say that. Or... Seeing none, we will go on now to the Montana K-12 Overdrive, where um, the current budget is 30,000 and their expansion number is 70,000. A total request of a hundred thousand and the school overdrive will triple the size of the Montana schools overdrive shared collection and allow the statewide access to this collection. We currently do not fund any of that. We do not through the state library. This is a contract that is. Uh, I guess you could say it's self-governed. It's a it's a group of Montana school libraries that have a shared collection of uh, ebooks and audiobooks, and that they completely fund that consortium. Uh, we have had some pandemic relief funds in the past that we have uh, added some one-time only monies to their uh, budget when the schools were closed for COVID that helped them out with having more um, of digital resources available, but there's a need for this to expand to allow more schools to join because this only serves fewer than a third of the schools in Montana. And as, as you've heard, most schools can't afford to subscribe to this. And the question? 
So is overdrive fiction or is that more like what we talked about with the educational resources for those schools? It's both fiction and nonfiction. Would be starting with a motion? Yes. Sorry. Okay, we had the explanation of what it is. Um, is there a motion about the Montana K-12 Kevin's overdrive? I move to um, uh, 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 send this board to the governor's office, Montana K-12 overdrive on um, request. I'll second that. It has been moved and seconded that we send the Montana K over K twelve overdrive onto the governor's office. Is there any discussion? Is there any uh, no discussion? If there's no discussion, I'll go on to public discussion. Okay, is there any public discussion? Seeing as there is none, we will now vote on the motion, which is to move the Montana K-12 overdrive request onto the governor's office. All those in favor say aye. 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 All oh, so. Aye. Aye, aye. Aye. And I'm an aye. All opposed say no. No. So we will be moving. It has been moved. In, it's been accepted by a voice vote to send on the Montana K-12 overdrive. Could you let me know the fourth person that I missed? Carmen. Carmen, Robin, Thank Peggy, you. Brian. Thank you. Okay, we'll now move on to the Mon Mon excuse my, excuse me. <laughs> Montana Shared Catalog. Um, it's going from what we spend now at 100,000 to, no, yes, the MSL pays 100,000. The libraries currently pay $488,878. Um, we want to expand it to 800,000. So the expansion for the MS for us is $211 or or do we want to take over? Or the budget request is for the 800,000. Okay, the budget request. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we will so you're at, it is being asked that we take over what the library is put into it annually. Okay. Is there a motion? I'm sorry, what did you just say? We're okay, asking. so so we're asking for the for for the governor legislature to grant us $800,000 to take over what the libraries currently pay and adding to it. Okay, and we already pay 100,000. The MSL pays 100,000. The libraries pay 488,878. So they we want they want to put those together to 588,000 and add 211 122 to make a total request of 800,000 to take. So to, the local libraries will no longer be taking their 488. Right, because a lot of them can't afford, afford it. That's, that's the, that is the request. Um, Correct? I believe we, we sent forward the Montana Shared Catalog request to the governor's office. I'll second it. Okay, it has been moved and seconded, properly moved and seconded that we move the Montana Shared Catalog request to the governor's office. Is there any discussion? I, I want to comment. I was asked next door what everyone was attending, and it was about the Montana Shared Catalog. I, I heard from many librarians that this is an essential part of their um, programs and it would free up their money to be used locally if they could you didn't have to pay for their portion of it. So I think it's a good good move for the state to provide it. And I am assuming the addition would allow more libraries that can't afford it to be part of it. That's correct. 
Carmen, sorry. Um, we are the state library is currently at work to to adjust the cost sharing ordinance. Mm -hmm. Would the adjustment make it possible for those libraries that are not currently using the shared catalog because their portion is too expensive for them? Could we adjust the formula to where they could all afford it? Or is that the goal of the adjustments? So, I, hello everyone. I'm Amy Martwick. I'm the lead system administrator for the shared catalog. Uh, to answer your question, oh, this is a terrible chair. It is. Um, <laughs> so we part of the adjustments to the cost sharing formula is just to simplify it so that the librarians can better plan their budget in advance right now. They're in the next room getting ready to vote on their budget, and this is pretty late in the planning process for them to send to their city commissions and county commissions. <laughs> um, even adjusting it, even after adjusting it, the libraries that cannot currently afford the shared catalog will not probably be able to afford that. They have no money in their budgets for this kind of infrastructure. It might lower the cost, the calculated cost, but they still would not be able to afford it. So um, what this would do actually in replacing that or not replacing, but the we would essentially be able to use that cost sharing formula for other things um, if we still were getting um contributions to like overdrive as you work through this list but it would actually be much better for our libraries if they didn't have to rely on this cost sharing formula to balance out the money and if they could just if we had this legislative funding for the shared catalog but yeah the the ones who can't currently afford it yeah they can manager yes um i'm gonna vote no on this because it's a transfer of the four hundred the money from the local library to the state. Um, I, I think this is one of the most valuable things we do. I also think the courier service is incredibly important. I think it has to stay under the control locally. I would have been in favor of talking about we are restructuring the cost. And I would have been very much in favor of just raising some monies to help us equal like that to get it. But I do not support the transfer of the cost from the local libraries to us. So, so no, I don't know. They, they, the current amount, you know, they want to. So I, the local libraries come up with that four hundred and eighty. Right, that's what their the current library annual cost is to them. Right, and we're going to take that on plus add two hundred and eleven. And I would rather even have a future discussion on this rather than, but if it stays as it is now, um, that's just one of the most important local. And I would have been very much in favor of adding a formula which we're working on that helps those libraries that have absolutely no money to be able to get resource locally. But to transfer all of it to the state is a transfer of taxpayer responsibility. I just don't support it. It doesn't matter. <laughs> just a second. Can we, um, is there any further commission I, comments? Can or, I or make ahead, one more comment? Yes. So, as far as and at the beginning of your statement, Tammy, I think you said something about um, taking away the control. And the shared catalog actually is a program. The members have bylaws. And so mm -hmm. they actually maintain control. This would just be a funding shift. Mm -hmm. So even, even if the funding shift happens, they, they, the members vote on everything that happens. Mm -hmm. So the funding shift was to goes, but it, it is it, it, so initially it's, what they paid four hundred eighty thousand is already taxpayer money. Correct. So then it go, but then it goes to mm -hmm. us to pay the totality of the shared catalog. So yeah. it's all taxpayer money, no matter where it is. And it is. I I know there's some who have public comment, but the the comments that I've heard from librarians as we just discussed this is that that would enable them to better um I see what you're saying. Okay. They, yeah, yeah. They, they would okay. be able to they purchase local stuff. They would have okay. things for programs for their patrons. Because so the shared catalog is kind of the electric it's the utility. Mm -hmm. It's the electricity, it's the running water. So it's if it just was available, then they can use their money locally to do more things that benefit their patrons directly. Mm -hmm. So it is 
again, it's about it's about that infrastructure. It's about every library and therefore every patron having access to that same level of infrastructure. We have base funding for education in Montana. You can think about this as base funding for library infrastructure in Montana, where there's some assurance that all libraries have access to that same infrastructure. We have been talking to libraries about what it would mean if, if they didn't have to absorb these kinds of costs in their local budgets. And the, the most recurring trend I've heard from libraries is we would expand hours. We would be able to be open more hours. We would be able to add staff to better support programming or be open more hours. I was talking to the library director in uh, Billings. He said he has a small branch in Warden that he can't open because he doesn't have the staff. He would be able to put those monies into having some open hours at the warden branch. It's those kinds of local decisions to address local needs that could be better addressed if libraries didn't have to absorb the cost of this utility as Amy described it. Jane, question. We just heard over and over from local libraries that this shared catalog, the ability to use this information in their local libraries is key to their functioning, mm -hmm. is a key part of the modern library. And it is a huge philosophical shift. It's not just, oh, well, you can use it for books or something. It's a huge philosophical shift to say, we are going to take that cost from local libraries when it is a key <coughs> expenditure now of local libraries and just move it to the state. That that's a huge philosophical statement. It it's um that's a big part of local library responsibility today. And it's like saying we're not gonna have books anymore, they're just too expensive to carry, so we're just not gonna fine, decide that locally, but yeah, I'm not going to say any more on that, but it's a huge philosophical shift to take all costs from local libraries as they have been for shared catalogs. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason for that is that it's so much more efficient for us to be able to procure this resource and, and make it available to them. The, the last two libraries that joined the shared catalog were both on the same software that we currently use. So they just joined our contract and both of them saved between fourteen and twenty thousand dollars because of our bargaining power with the vendor per year. So we could have a different motion that we pursue opportunities for them to join a shared budgeting program or a shared negotiations, not just moving that whole <laughs> program from the local to the state. That that's the that's the model that's in place right now. This is the model that's in place. What, what Tammy is suggesting is the model that's in place right now. Are you saying to add to our, our portion of it? Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. To discuss that? Yeah. I think if the negotiating portion is a valid portion, then that could be discussed in its own way as if there is a certain thing that 17 libraries could use and we could help with the negotiating of that, that might be one thing. But to move the entire expenditure of one of the most important things that libraries are doing locally from them to us is a philosophical change that deserves more than just what we're doing. Thanks for coming. Yes. Um, as, a, as a trustee, the Montana Shared Catalog, I feel, is the, the one shared resource that I actually understand thoroughly. Um, and I think it's, it is in that negotiating power and that part of the shared resources that the state library has the biggest impact. Um, I would like to make it possible for every library, no matter what size they are, to benefit from that bargaining power. But as it stands now, I agree with Fanny that uh, I'm not in favor of eliminating the local library skin in the game as far as the catalog go. Having a collection catalog and having people access it is the one basic library function. Um, 
And, and I would like the state library to enable that shared catalog because it is also the gateway to use the courier and to be able to access all these other collections within the state. But I'm not in favor of in one fell swoop taking on the entire, the entire cost for it. And it is partly because of, I think that human nature and the way we look at things when they're free is just different. But I know for, for Flathead County Library, the shared catalog and having access to IT when there's a problem with the, with the software is brilliant. And the bargaining power of the state library is also brilliant. So again, as it stands now, I'm going to vote no, not because I don't want to support the, support the shared catalog, but because I'm opposed to doing it this way in one fell swoop and taking the entire expense on state life and making the local uh, no more skin in the game. Thank you. May I, there are 117, is that the number I remember? So there's 111 library organizations in the shared catalog. There's 210 branches, 200. so individual locations. 210, okay, so how many total, how many people do, or how many libraries do that belong? Um, public libraries, public I libraries. think it's... 12 or 14. Okay. We've just had a couple libraries join, so the number is changing. 12, School 14. libraries, it's hundreds, right. but that would... Would they have access to the shared catalog then if, 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 if it was totally... If, if we could lower the price through this mechanism, it would enable us to... I, can't see that this right. would cover all of the school libraries, but it would... It would make it yeah. more cost. Okay. So I hear what Carmen is saying, and I'm, I'm trying to think through some scenarios. The, the cost share formula, just, just adjusting the numbers probably isn't gonna get us there because we're, we're just, all we're doing is collecting money to cover our costs. So if we were to lower the cost of entry for some libraries, other libraries are necessarily going to have to see their costs increase. Um, so I, I, I don't think there's just a, a mechanism that's going to allow us to shift those funds in a way to, to allow non-participating libraries to participate. If libraries have the funding in their budgets right now, they can absolutely take advantage of the negotiating power and all of the services of the state library. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I mean, okay. that, that's been in existence for 20 years. So it's going to take additional monies to bring those libraries on. That that is that is the only way I can see that happening. Um, if the commission is not supportive of the idea of transferring the cost that current libraries are currently paying, I hope we can still have a conversation about adding new monies mm -hmm. to help with the issue that some libraries cannot be on. I don't think we're prepared to talk about what that would look like today, but it sounds like we don't have the votes to carry this initiative forward. And if that's true, I would like to ask that this be brought back during our special meeting so that we could reconsider some, some alternatives. Understanding that I, I think what I'm hearing is that there's a there is support for the idea of trying to get more, especially public libraries onto the shared catalog and understanding some kind of cost models that would allow for that to happen. Is that is that fair? That, I think that reflects my position. And I would vote no to the but with the understanding this will come back with an increase, not the transfer of power, but the increase for those at our work session. Basically, I would like to achieve the goal of having every public library participate, but I I think we could try to achieve that without spending the 800 thousand. How can we how can we achieve that at the best possible? So you're thinking about possibly instead of that whole 488,000 moving over doing some portion of that as the life the state library to bring the cost total cost share formula down. Yeah. Yes, figure out a way that we're still sharing costs mm -hmm. and the local libraries still have skin in the game, but making it possible for all the libraries to participate, all the libraries who want to participate. Yeah, sure. Okay. 
Okay. Is there any further discussion? Question. Pardon me? Question. Okay, yes. No, I'm calling oh. a question. Mm -hmm. Vote. Oh, okay. <laughs> Got it. Okay, yes. <laughs> there might be public comment. Is there public comment? Any further public comment? Online? Not oh, online. No, not online. Oh, yes. Yes, Are sorry. You? No, you're okay. <laughs> the lady in the corner. So you say my whole membership is in that um, other room. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Sarah Winter. I'm the head of public services at the Bozeman Public Library. My job is to help patrons register for library cards. It's the material circulation throughout the building. And I was actually part of the most recent um, request for proposals and um, reviewing the the uh, different vendors that were out there right now, we use Circe Dynex for our catalog and um, and our, our database. And it's the best one that's out there and I'm for our needs. And I must say that MSC staff does a great job of answering all of our questions, multiple tickets every day. It's, it's great to have. And I will say that um, I think that every library that uses MSC, whether or not it's going to be lower cost or free if this passes and gets to the next stage. Um, because it's the bread and butter of how libraries work and how we how we do our day-to-day -day job, it's never going to be that we don't care about it. We will always um, have very strong feelings about what what we use, how we use it, what we do, uh, potential improvements. I, I can't see any situation where a library who signs on to MSC doesn't care about it because it's free. They will just be so glad to have that resource. I, and I feel very strongly about that. And I, I know my staff um, feels that way too. They um, know that the money would be very well spent and the money that we would not be spending on that would go towards other more more fun mm -hmm. <laughs> things, um, more more hours, more um, programming, more staff. Maybe we can finagle the city budget end of it to go towards personnel instead of operations. But that's on our end. That's what we would try to work on. It's almost forty thousand dollars a year for Bozeman. More if you consider the other. Um, contracts that we get through MSC um, and the state library in general, and that money would completely change the way that we work, and we would be all the more <laughs> grateful to MSC for managing that for us and not having to go and find the database and find the resources and the IT power to, to make it happen. Um, so I I just want to say, like, I fully support fully funding this, and I think that um, lowering the cost share formula would be great, even if that's all we did, but to fully fund it would make such a huge impact to every library. And like Jenny said, it's that base level of service. Um, I bet there are still libraries in Montana using stamps, and that's, you know, we want to move away from that. We're we're um, more connected than that already. So I think we can we can do better. And I think this is one huge step towards that. So thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion, public discussion? Any more if not, seeing as there's none, we will now vote on the motion, which is to send forward a <coughs> shared catalog request to the governor's office. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. 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 I'm, I'm sorry, did I, I think no. I vote no? Okay. Then nays have it. Are there any further motions concerning the Montana Shared Catalog request? We'll take it up at the next meeting. Thank okay. you so much. Okay, thank you. So we will be taking that up at the next meeting. We will now go on to Madam Chair. Yes. There was not support to do this in its entirety. So I would just ask because we need to get moving on our program here and get to the trust, which I think is what a lot of people are waiting for. If it, it um, is anybody real passionate about bringing forth one of these. 
I don't know that we have to show for every one of them. If somebody is a passionate about bringing one forward, we've already basically said no. And then said we look at them. Well, the staff are passionate about them. Say, <laughs> yeah. Are you saying that so you are passionate about all of them? Okay. That's fine. We can just grab each of them. Probably. Let's let's yeah let's go ahead and try not to spend quite so much time on each. I I would look at the curry one otherwise. I'm not and in support. I'm sorry. I don't know if we can proceed faster. We're all very yeah. I know. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> so so is it a consensus that we should go on to each one or should we? Discussed I, I would respectively ask that all of these be, be considered. Okay. We discussed yeah. in, in our business meeting that we have that afternoon yes. with each one. When we went through all of these and the needs and that. I don't know if we discussed as much yeah. as we heard. So we still need to. Yes. 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 Uh -huh. You need to take was, action. You need public comment on all action. So you need to make sure you're including public right. comment on all action. Right. Okay. All right. So we're going to go ahead with the Montana Library to go. The current, the MSL current annual portion is twenty thousand. The libraries put it to three hundred twenty-five thousand. Um, I believe that we're asking for all of it. Mm -hmm. The expansion, what we put in, and what the libraries put in, for seven hundred thousand. Is there a motion? I move that we continue funding Montana Library to go at the current number. Is there a second? I will second that. Is I didn't there any totally hear that, so I might need some help. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm, One second. Let me I'm get what I do have. What was that? That we continue to fund Montana Library to go at the current level of twenty. Does okay? Does that need a motion? I just, I just, I just want oh, to be clear. We don't. Yeah, we don't need a motion to okay. keep funding current. This is new asks that would go forward in the to the legislative session. So, you know, you'll you'll see our our budget for next year at your next meeting. Um, you know, I, I do want to point out, I. If there's not appetite to to cover the costs that local libraries are bearing, there's still a request here to add new funds to help support the addition of content. Um, as you know, those of you who use Montana Library to go, when you when you try to select an item, you're often asked to wait days, months. weeks, months to mm -hmm. access those titles. And and as Robin said earlier, that's because of the way those materials are licensed through the vendors. Um, we have very limited access to those titles. And so the, the cost for the collections budgets to be able to support Montana Library to go really are enormous. We're, we're simply asking for enough funding to reduce the wait times for those patrons from an average of 40 days to 25 days. And I would understand that, Jenny. And I would just comment that that's not going to change with this amount of money or any amount of money. The Bozeman Library, right now my book club, we're reading a book that two of the people are on the line for at 28th and 29th on the list and they've been told they'll have to wait two months. And that's Bozeman, who have more money and have more books. So, but to, yeah. to, to clarify, we, we did have additional monies during mm -hmm. COVID. We used some of our COVID related funds to increase the collection budget and we were able to achieve reduced wait times because we had additional collections budgets. Those were one-time monies, we don't have them anymore. We know we have data that shows that by adding to the collections budget, we can have an impact on those wait times. Question? Yes. So over the, over the course of a book, is it, in that case, does it financially make sense not to buy the actual physical book? Because once you buy the physical book, you own it for 50 years or however long somebody mm -hmm. picks it up. 
But if you put it in library to go and you buy it, do you have it for two years, three years, and then you have to re-up? It depends on the licensing model that the vendors use, and, and vendors have various licensing models. Some have a, a per circ cost, some have licensing models where after so many people have checked it out, you have to renew it. So it it, it depends greatly on the vendor. So do we know if it's cheaper to do an ebook, or is it cheaper if we all on like go out and buy two copies of the current bestseller mm -hmm. instead of Offering it online. That, that's a question that's probably more complex than it seems. Um, dollar to dollar, it may be more expensive to buy ebooks in certain cases, but when you have the physical item, then you're also having to shelve and manage the, the physical volume. So you're really not comparing apples to apples when you're trying to compare those costs. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask Kara to join me before I get quickly out of my element. Hello <laughs> again. Uh, yes, and I I would also say that they can be different users. There are some of us who use both of them, but I have heard from librarians that they they have some patrons who only use their library card to log into Montel Library to go. They don't ever. Uh, to your point, um, for sure that. Some people don't ever come in the door of the library anymore. They're using their apps through the library. So that um, the cost model, it's it's kind of hard to compare the physical to the the value of the physical book to the to the ebook. So different audiences. If, yeah, we can purchase some of them in perpetuity. We have that license forever. Um, physical books will fall apart if they're heavily circulated. So it's it would be interesting to do a study on the, the long-term cost of a physical book versus an electronic book, but it varies. Is there any further discussion on this? So I oh, know the Montana Shared Catalog request to be forwarded to the governors. That would cost Oh, yes. Yeah, that's my intent. I'm ready to go. I'll second it. And is that the 700? That's the 700. Okay. It has been properly moved and seconded. Um, is there any further discussion of, about moving the Montana Library to go on to the governor's office? Is there any further discussion? Most of the commissioners. I guess one last question for um, who curates that collection? Yes, that, that's a good question. We have a volunteer committee of librarians across the state who take turns on a monthly basis selecting the cards, and then the selection coordinator, who is also a volunteer, Katie Beal out of Bozeman, reviews the cards to make sure that they adhere to the budget um, category guidelines and collection development guidelines that are approved by the membership. And so that happens every month. We don't have any... <laughs> I'm so glad we don't, we don't have that task on our plates. We have a volunteer committee that um, does about 25 hours worth of work for us every every month to select those on behalf of the membership. So they are not paid. It's volunteer. It's volunteer. They're volunteers. Yes. And and correct me if I'm wrong. I think part of that collection criteria is looking at the number of folds, and a portion of the budget is directed directly to 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 try to fill those folds. Yes. They are having their membership meeting online in a couple of weeks to approve their annual budget. And as part of that, they review how many um, holds do we have, which right now 40% of their budget is going just to fill holds, things that we already have. We have to buy them over and over again because of the licensing model. And then 60%, they try to purchase new things for all the rest of the categories. And the libraries have been taking on a 10% increase year after year for the last several years. May I ask for clarification? Are you saying holds as in hold the books being out there? Holds as in holds. there are not this type of books in our library? Holds. So it, 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 yeah, a, 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 a wait list. A wait list. So there's a, there's a title and there are 25 right. people waiting for it. And so there's a holds ratio of is it 10 right. to 1 now? So they've had to bump it up. To be different. Yeah. So for every 10 people waiting for the book, they buy a new one. That's all mm -hmm. they can afford. They'd like it to be 3 to 1 or something mm -hmm. like that. And that's where having more content budget directly addresses the, the holds issues. Question? Yes. 
Yes. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Um, yes. Okay. So, seeing as there is no further discussion, we'll now vote on the motion, which is to move. I'm sorry. Did I ask for public comment? Yes. Yeah. I'd like to say something. Okay. I'm Rachel from the Mark County City Library, and um, our school doesn't have a budget for their online resources and that sort of thing. Um, they have a low literacy level in our school, and they rely heavily on us to take on that burden for them to help them bump their reading scores up. Um, we have Montana Library to go. We use that. We are part of it because we think it's important um, for us to be a part of it. Uh, last year, our stats were about 44 days wait time. Well, students mm -hmm. can't wait 44 days to get a book. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to secure some funding um, through our generous friends to get Hoopla. We have Hoopla. Um, our school depends on us to have that for them. We will run out of budget with it because they are signing up so many kids for our through the school. Um, oh. So for the state to be able to shoulder some of this burden for us, to be able to continue to provide this service that the school is asking us to provide for them would be an amazing thing for us. So, but thank you. So does your school have the, the overdrive, Montana P3 Club overdrive? They do not, they cannot afford it. So we, we voted to support an increase in overtime. Does that bring on online schools that currently are not affording? That's the... It would, I hope, yep. Okay, time to call the question. Hey, okay. is there any further public discussion? If not, we will now vote on the motion, which is to move that the Montana Library to Go request be forwarded to the governor's office. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. No. Okay. No, the no's have it. It has been rejected. Okay. okay. So now we'll go on to the Montana Shared Catalog Partners Shared Collections. Which is uh, so to increase the expansion of the MSC to all public libraries as well as school libraries that may be interested. It's three hundred thousand dollars, going from zero to three hundred. Okay. Is there a motion to accept the MSC partners shared collection? I move that the MSC partners shared collections. Uh, Request to be forwarded to the governor's office. Is there a second? I'll second it. It has been moved and seconded. Do we have any discussion? I will vote no on this because I do not want to have a statewide curated collection for public libraries. I want them to curate their separate little collections and then share those. Through the chair catalog in the courier, mm -hmm. but I don't want collection development to be state. Mm -hmm. I'd like to explain, if I may, Commissioner. Um, yes, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, sorry. I'm so improper. Um, <laughs> no, you're, you're just fine. Uh, the this project would be um, filling holds for items that are already in the collection. So there, there isn't an intention to build a collection, a centralized collection. Uh, the way that the partners sharing, so the partners sharing group is a group within the shared catalog. They share materials with each other as if they are a system. And um, they all have their own collection development budgets, which they pay, uh, they, they buy their own collections and then they share them with each other. And uh, however, they share patrons and they share a holds list. And so the holds list is uh, what we're trying to address here to create a uh, uh, more efficient um, process of filling holds more quickly so that people are not waiting as long for those holds um, in the partner's collection. So it's it's mostly uh, purchasing more copies of existing items within the collections. We would have a, an opportunity to 
go through um, the Great Falls Public Library, they have a contract. I think it's a Baker and Taylor. They they are able to get copies at a discounted rate, so that whatever is on the holds list that exceeds that holds ratio, they would purchase those items through that discounted um, contract and be able to get those things and ship them right up to the partners' libraries. So that's the intent. Um, for my understanding, is there is there there are several partner sharing groups like the like right there's several that because of the geographic mm -hmm. distribution mm -hmm. that share do we have three or four or how many there's there's the partners which is by far the largest there's the Gallatin County Libraries which is in Gallatin County and so then there is the Four Rivers group which is uh, basically Madison Valley and Jefferson County part of Jefferson County so there are three, three. yes mm -hmm. there are three. I'm sure. Yes. So this infusion would not benefit anybody who's not in a sharing group. Correct? It would then, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. it, it benefits 40 public workers. Yeah, that would have the, yeah. Okay. Need to ask for public comment. Public comment on, on the Montana. Mm -hmm. Shared catalog partners, shared collections. Is there any public comment? Seeing as there's none, we'll now vote on the motion, which is to move the MSC partner shared collection request that it be forwarded to the governor's office. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Any of the no's have it. Okay, so we'll now go on to the OCLC group services. Um, so we have the Montana State Library at 166,000 and a little. The libraries currently are paying for their own OCLC at 283,000, almost 284,000. Um, and that's, and <clears throat> you were just asking to take the burden from the local libraries and put it on the state. Put it towards the state burden, just the, the totality. And and the OCLC is um, the services service that provides a cataloging mm -hmm. for all for the different books. I mean, you you're able to put in one of those 158 million <laughs> books and be able to have a cataloging right cataloging right at your fingertips, basically. Or to yeah. request it from another library if you're not right. in a sharing. Okay, library. sure, mm -hmm. or request it. And any library can use be part of this. They don't have to be part the of the school shared library. That's right. Yes, library. we have many non shared catalog uh, mm -hmm. libraries in our DLC. Mm -hmm. I move we uh, move this request for the OCLC group services to the governor's office. Okay, it has been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? As someone who has catalog <laughs> books, I'd say yes, please okay. help the library. Yeah, and, and someone else who has catalog okay. books, you don't know the time. I mean the the mm -hmm. the resources and the time that is put that are that when I first became a librarian back in 1985, it was I mean you have the yeah, I can't because, remember yeah. then yeah. it yeah, there's yeah. there's so it's a process. It That's is a process. A uh, oh, see, yeah. I would also just observe that this is what makes interlibrary loan possible, mm -hmm. not just within the state, but across the country. Mm -hmm. So it allows libraries to borrow books from anywhere in, in North America. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other discussion here? Before mm -hmm. I... So this, this is again something that is now being done with the cost with a, with a cost share formula. That's correct. And this asks is to eliminate the cost share formula and shift the cost completely to the state. Budget. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Any other further discussion amongst us? Uh, I'll put it out for public discussion. Is there any public discussion about the OCLC group services? Is it possible if it is not passed to perhaps do another formula? I, I mean, we're working on the formula. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
All right, so if there's no further discussion, we will vote on the OCLC group services. And so the motion is to move the request for the OCLC group services to the governor's office. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. No. Okay, the nays have it. Okay, next we'll go on to the resource sharing staff. Um, it is at zero. Oh no, and currently we do 90,000. 90, They're asking for expansion of funds of 110,000 to a total of 200,000. And that resource sharing, they are asking to for two additional FTEs to adequately support users. I think we should get a resource. Did we? No, that's where we are. That's it. That's it. The staff support. Yes. I move with the resource sharing staff support uh, request be moved forward to the governor's office. Is there a second? Well, second. It has been properly moved and seconded that we move the resource sharing staff support to the governor's office. Is there a discussion? And clarification this would be two. FTE. That's right. Okay. So did we not choose to move all those requests to our special meeting? Not, not mm -hmm. this. It's, because it's, yeah. the, it's yeah. the resource sharing and mm -hmm. this was the bundle. Yeah. So we're looking well, at I guess, I, guess I, would, I would maybe recommend that we do hold off on this. You know, the, the, the level of support meeting. necessary to support these new asks is really dependent on the, the total asks that we end up moving forward. So I, I would suggest you hold off on this till the special meeting, till we have a clearer picture of what that's going to look like. Yeah, okay. I'm happy to withdraw my motion. Okay, so the motion is withdrawn. Madam Chair, yes. May I suggest that we put it at the end when we know how many of these were funded? So if these two FDEs are to fund this service because it's part of this motion. And those services are not going mm -hmm. forward. The only one so far going forward is to study the K-12 overdrive. Then there's no need for the FTE. That's what we just said. Yeah. Right. So I don't want it on the work session, but at the end of this discussion. But because, because we were asking for a couple of these items here to come back to us during that special work session. Right. I think once we have that done, then we can look at these. To yes, I, I think we need to look at those also. Those okay. two to the other work session. session. To that special session. Yes. I think we should. That's okay. That's it. okay, so we'll do that. Okay, so that's withdrawn. Okay, so we're on to state agency digital collections. Um, so as of right now, we've spent 50,000. They're asking for 50,000 more to go to 100,000. And that, okay, the proposal increases the amount available to research de research databases, journals, professional ebooks, and subscriptions for state employees research that supports government services. That this collection is administered by the MSL Digital Library on behalf of all the state agencies. Is there a motion? I move that the state agencies' digital collections request be moved forward to the governor's office. Is there a second? I'll second. It is properly moved and seconded that we um, send on the state agency's digital collections request to the governor's office. Is there any further discussion? So what motivates the state language to double that? Um, we have a very, as, as you've heard, the databases themselves are just incredibly expensive. So we have to be very, very selective in the databases that we currently are able to offer to state employees. So this would allow us to further expand those resources to better serve other agencies. Do you have an example of what kinds of databases? Mm -hmm. um, some of them are somewhat similar to the academic databases that academic researchers use. They're used by, by scientists and business analysts within state agencies. Um, one I know that we are able to procure right now is Science Direct, which is one of those peer-reviewed scientific research databases that's used by our various natural resource agencies.
Yeah. Are there any further discussion? Points? I do remember the presentation on this from our business session, and the gentleman shared that they are trying to record every email, every data from one service to another, no, no. or from any government agency yeah. or within any government agency. Different, different programs. Is that a different one? Yeah. That's what I want yeah. to ask. Yeah, different program. Okay. So how is this different? This is just what the, why is it not recorded with the agency? Um, you're referring to our state publications right. digitization program where we are responsible right. for capturing state government information. This request is providing um, peer-reviewed research and other research databases that state agency employees use when they are doing their jobs in, you know, evaluating policies, creating mm -hmm. new rules, that kind of thing. So information that's within those state agencies. No, it's it's not right now. We we are we are procuring it through contracted vendors. This is this is you know academic research journals and other kinds of content created external to state government that we are procuring to allow Montana state employees to do research. The state government publications program is capturing and digitizing the content that's produced by the state of Montana and making it available to the public. Okay. Yes. So this pertains to that email we got a couple of days ago showing usage of this data. That's right. If I mm -hmm. think right. Um, so of the databases that are being offered to state employees now are the second tier databases that we would like to, if this were to be applied, <clears throat> are some of them possibly more valuable than ones that are being offered now could just be with, with present funding could be replaced. So class A needs, maybe not all be class A and some of those could be mm -hmm. uh, dropped out and if there's some uh, sources that are, our employees are dying to use, could they be put into that at the same funding level? That, that's a normal part of our collection development process, evaluating usage, determining whether or not uh, databases are being adequately used, if others would be more used, that, that's a part of our standard Thank you. process. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? Not, is there any public discussion about the state agency's digital collection? If not, we'll go ahead and vote on the motion, which is to move the request for state agency digital collection to the governor's office. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say no. No. I'm abstaining. I have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm very confused as to exactly what they're okay, so the so Could you tell me the count? Yes, it is Carmen, Peggy, Brian, Robin, I, Tom, Thank you. Joe. And Thank you. Peggy, uh, Tammy, sorry, Peggy, Tammy. Tammy abstained. Thank you. Okay, so next we will go on. Yes, go ahead. Um, four to two. Four to one. Oh, four to one, I'm sorry, correct, yes. One abstained. The one abstained, who is one abstained? Confused one, that's it's we'll okay it now. It's okay. Um, may I ask, Madam Chair, that yes. the statewide courier service be put on the work session? Actually, I, I don't help. But we just had a drop-in session, and Marilyn went through all the um get all the resources available to state like state staff. I could send you the link to that. I'm sorry. Did you ask about the courier? I didn't. No, no my question was the. We're wanting to take the state agency digital collection from 50 to 50, and I am not clear on what we have and what we have. Mm -hmm. I know. So it's, um, but we don't, yeah. have, but I, that's why I've stayed. I'm not clear sure. on what we have or what we're going to ask so, for. So, so you want. Fine. I, I'm fine with it passing. Okay, but, mm -hmm. but you. No, I'm asking about the next item. Yes. The statewide courier service. I would like to not discuss that at this point, but put it to the business session. If there are courts, we're, we're suggesting to raise this from 
65,000 to a million. <laughs> and mm -hmm. that's a huge jump. And I don't feel like we have the time today to delve into that. I'd like to have that to the business mm -hmm. session or just say not. Is that possible? That's my request. It's, it's possible. I would ask if there's people intending to provide public comment that are here. Is there anyone that is mm -hmm. here to provide public comment on statewide for your service or could you wait until our special meeting? I will not say. I'm sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> I'm the, Rachel Ryan, the director of the Hill County Library, and uh, we'd really love to be able to participate with the courier service, um, but it's not very affordable for us right now. It doesn't financially make any more sense than mail for us right now, and we also have trouble with being maintained on the career routes <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a lot of white libraries that <clears throat> right now and they're the most expensive ones to get on the career that's why it's such a big city but mm -hmm. last, the last the last few libraries that aren't being serviced by the career career right now are the most expensive ones to add mm -hmm. now chair I firmly believe in the career service along it's one of the most important items here to me and I just don't justify an $861,000 increase from $65,000 at this time without more clarity. And if I'm forced to vote on this today, I have to vote no, but I'd like to put on a business session and see if there's an in between because that's a huge jump. If that's not, and that does not justify putting two more. To take it from $65,000 to $865,000, that's $800,000. We're not going to, that's not to help two libraries. It's certainly not to help two libraries. Well, there's, 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 there's many, many more. Yes. But but help us understand what, what additional clarity we could provide to you at the at the business meeting. What, what are we doing that justifies? Or what will we do? What will we do for another taking it from sixty-five thousand to eight hundred and sixty thousand? That's a humongous increase. And um, I love the courier program, but it's really hard to justify that almost nearly what we're doing. So, if I may, uh, to to me, this is intimately linked with the shared catalog and mm -hmm. the, the cost sharing formulas, and. To me, these programs are excellent and we should have them. Um, and and it seems to me that the problem is we have the, the distances for some of the libraries and we have the tiny size that makes it with the cost share formula prohibited for them to participate. So what I would like to work on is a cost efficient way to allow them to participate. But I don't want to tie that into having to take on the cost for every single, single library and pay the entire cost of the three or four to share catalog. Mm -hmm. So to me, those are very similar issues and I think we should look into that further at, at the work session. So I would support that delay and tabling and go take, bring it to us at the work session. I just want to point out, because it, it won't be a work session, it'll actually be a, a meeting because we'll have action items on the agenda. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We may have them once the library to go there also because I, I feel like we would like to increase our our funds, but maybe not the total amount. So we add the once the library to go also in that discussion. I think we have to yeah, mm -hmm. I believe that is all we're going to do. Okay. Aren't we? No, we, we voted no. We, we voted, voted no on this amount, but can we can, talk about can we discuss an efficient way to help pay for that? To help pay for that it, along the same lines. As just my Is that possible? Mm -hmm. I guess. Okay. I probably know and I'm still not. But... Okay. <laughs> I guess we can okay. look at it again. Yes. Can I provide public comment before you move on? Yes. So, um, I just want to, Sarah from Bozeman, I just want to share a little bit about what Bozeman's dealing with with our Gallatin County career right now not even considering statewide career. Um, we have partnered with actually the West Yellowstone Foundation. So there's West Yellowstone Public Library is one of our, our sharing libraries. And for almost a year, we only had volunteers and staff um, driving books back and forth between Bozeman and West Yellowstone, which is honestly a huge liability for many insurance reasons um, and just 
you know, the pass is, is scary in the winter. And since we've decided to try to move forward from using staff and volunteers, we cannot find a year-round courier that goes between Bozeman and West Yellowstone. We just can't find one. And to have the assistance from the state library to help with that contract and make it a little more worthwhile than our measly $30 to $60 per trip uh, for them, it would mean the world to our patrons in West and Belgrade and Bozeman and Three Forks and Manhattan. And the management of trying to track down her, I you know, Kara can um, appreciate how frustrating it can be that the jump part of the jump in cost might be to have um, a really good, solid working relationship and a really responsive career. Mm -hmm. um, we had one of our contracts just stop showing up because their contract with the health um, group down in West Yellowstone was void, so they just stopped showing up at Bozeman. And um, I know that's probably happened to other libraries as well. So even in Gallatin County, it's an issue. So um, thank you for considering this in any capacity. It will mean a lot. So we have decided to pass the statewide career service on to our special meeting. So we will now go on to trails. State academic information and library services. We pay at this point zero. The library's current annual is $638,000. Um, and it wants to be expanded to 2.4 million. And the trails is the academic library consortium and it ne negotiates the discounted subscription to research databases and professional resources and journals on behalf of the Montana's academic institutions statewide. Is there a motion to pass on the Treasure State Academic Trails Consortium onto the governor's desk? I have a question. Yes. Can you explain why that was not included in the e resources? It is typically for party trails right now. Can mm -hmm. you explain that? Um, it, the the e-resources for trails, that budget request is more than just e-resources. It does include the e-resources for academic libraries. Uh, the larger e-resources ask, the, the 4.4 million is largely targeted at public and schools. Um, we at the state library do take advantage of the the buying power of trails to negotiate contracts for state employees. Um, but the the line item about the the digital library services to state employees is um, uh, those are that's licensed content just for state employees. If that helps. Now I was not able to get on trails because I did not have when I tried, and I haven't mm -hmm. tried for about three months, but. It, you have to have an academic code or an academic, mm -hmm. so we, it's only for college school. Right? Brian, my understanding is anyone can go to MSU and get a library card. You That's don't right. have, you don't have to be a student. Or right, but you have to have a library but you card have, yeah. from a, a public school or a university mm -hmm. to get one. Yeah, that, that's true of any but, of, of the license trail. data. Yeah. So we have a motion for the vote on. Mm -hmm. I move that we forward the uh, trails request onto the governor's office. And I'll second it so we can vote. Okay, it has been moved and seconded that we move the trails. Well, um, consortium on to the governor's office. And may I clarify the 638,000 that were being requested to grow by 17, 1.7 million. That 638,000 right now is being paid not by local libraries, but by universities and the public I, school libraries. It's, it's being paid by academic libraries. Academic libraries. Yep. So this isn't even the library. By 24 mm -hmm. libraries. Mm -hmm. Right, but they're academic libraries. This isn't even our libraries. 
Uh, again, the resource sharing resource statute. Library Center, the, University the resource Library. sharing statute right. calls on a resource sharing program to support all types of libraries, okay. including academic right. libraries. And all the others do. So, so from reading this chart, this is something that currently those libraries do in their own, and we're just being nice and offering to pay for it instead. Um, we're going to pay for it instead of those libraries. Um, this is a, a, so. If you look at the statute, the statute calls on the legislature to appropriate funds for a resource sharing program for the commission to determine how to appropriate. So it's appropriate for the state library commission <laughs> to ask for funds to help support all types of libraries, including academic libraries. Again, just to clarify, because this is important, right now Trails is funding, and they are getting their funding from the universities and the public school system. Not the public school system. These are academic, academic. libraries. Mm -hmm. What's that? Not yeah, so, the the public public system. Yeah. so this is, that's right, this is university. We are being asked to basically pick up $2.4 million of funding mm -hmm. to put forth to the government for the university system. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, Brian, but that's just a very, very difficult ask. And I have to go How are we as a state library currently supporting academic libraries? Do they use the shared catalog? They our members of the OCLC Group Services Program. We have a very few uh, libraries, academic libraries, in the shared catalog. Okay. Is there is there any further discussion amongst us? If not, is there public comment? If not, we will go ahead with the motion to bring forth the Trails Consortium and send it on to the governor's office. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. 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 May the nays have it. Okay. I'm going to request a break for five minutes, please. Okay, back on. Okay, so the next item is a review of the Trust for Montana Libraries Memorandum of Agreement. Is there a motion concerning the Trust for Montana Libraries Memorandum of Agreement? Madam Chair, I have a motion. I move to number one, acknowledge that the agreement with the Trust for Montana Libraries, a private organization, is no longer in effect, having expired December 31, 2022. And two, to decline entering into another agreement. Thank you, manager. And it's not that much. Is there a way to drop that into, oh, sorry. Is there a way to drop that into the chat or some way I can have that motion? Rather than you reading it to me word by word. Just a second. We okay. will send it to you. Okay. He's going to email it to you, Genevieve. Okay, thank you. Okay, while that is being sent electronically, it has been properly moved and seconded. To acknowledge that the agreement with the Trust for Montana Libraries, a private organization, is no longer in effect, having expired December 31st of 2022. And number two, to decline entering into another agreement. Is there any discussion? Uh, Madam Chair, I make this motion to, uh, to clarify lines of authority and uh, 
the state library and the state library is an entity of state government. And the private foundation is uh, formed by individuals and acknowledged and uh, approved by state government, but very different entities and very different authorities. And I think it's it's worthwhile to keep our um, our, our missions distinct based on on the land of the story. Is there any further comment amongst us? I see that there is a conflict, and that it's spelled out that they um, seek. They only have bond initiatives approved by us. So I, I, I don't see how there's a conflict there. Mention? Yes. Um, I call it our trust and their trust because their themes are so similar that it's very hard to um, keep this separate. But this, um, I, I applaud what they're doing. And I thank them for all their their efforts and what they're doing. But in 1997, um, it was established by the statute that Montana library, that we have our own uh, trust. And we are responsible for that trust. And one of our responsibilities on that was to direct people to spend money on our trust. And one of the things on this trust, their trust, is that we will direct people to spend money on that trust. And I think that's putting us in a direct conflict situation. Again, absolutely encourage them to carry on. Um, I think what they're doing is great, appreciate that. Um, and any other public group that sets up the same kind of a system, thank you. And we would encourage you to keep doing what you're doing, but we cannot take an active role in it. I think there is a conflict of interest. So I would also agree that we need not to move forward with being part of this by having both our chair and our librarian on as ex officio board members, because we would not do that with another public nonprofit group, library, any kind of trust. Any further discussion? Next step. Uh, Carmen. Um, the what you call our trust. How is that set up? That's not a 501c3. That's no. project no. open meeting laws, all that jazz, just like we do. Right, right. It, as as Tammy said, there's statute that gives the state library the authority to hold monies in trust with the Board of Investments. Mm -hmm. So when people come to the state library and want to make a direct donation, often they're talking book library patrons. Um, there, there's a, a fund in the Board of right. Investments that we can invest those funds in. And then, as you know, we come to the State Library Commission to request authority to spend any of those monies. When the, the state library um, decided to work on creating a separate 501c3 nonprofit that work started in about 2018. It was with the recognition that that nonprofit entity would function very much like other library foundations, like the Flathead County Library Foundation or the Bozeman Public Library Foundation, where that 501c3 is out fundraising on behalf of initiatives of that library, in this case, the state library and, and our priorities. Um, so the state library as a government entity never takes any kind of active role in fundraising to, to support our efforts. Um, but like other public libraries in this case, it was a way to have a separate organization to help support the initiatives and the work of the state library and through the state library, the work of all public libraries. So it's, it's always been intended to function like other foundations that libraries work with. And in my estimation, it's been it's been successful to date. We 
we're hit with the pandemic shortly after forming. Um, so we got off to a slow start, but they've been doing some fundraising. Uh, the, the one program that they have raised funds for to date has been our hotspot lending program, which has been a very important program of the state library. Um, it, from my perspective, Tom's correct. We, we um, the, did let the, the agreement lapse, um, but, but the relationship has been working as intended and successfully to date. So I'm frankly surprised that um, this would become an issue for the commission. I think the partnership can continue. We can we can continue just visiting and talking to them just like the Flathead Library Trust or the Allen County Trust, but to officially have them be in partnership with them or to have our head librarian and our chair serving on it, I think is um, an overstep of what we should be doing when we have our own trust. I believe there was also a question of the fiduciary agent. Mm -hmm. Some I'm sorry. Well, it, there was a question of the fiduciary. Yeah, fiduciary fiduciary agent. So is it is it legal for us to direct donations to a private entity? Which is what a 501c3 is. I mean if, there, if the trust is not subject to open meeting laws and we don't, we, I'm assuming we can't legally be involved in a, in a private entity or we, we certainly couldn't give money as a state agency right. to a private entity. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and, and we're not. Right. But, we, but you know, but, the, 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 the legal agreement that establish the relationship between the state library and the trust is a is a legal agreement it was reviewed by attorneys when it was established is that necessary or could the trust just have in their bylaws we support the state library and that sets the parameter for what the, what they do i don't know to me this seems to be a legal a legal issue I think they can put that in their bylaws and then anything they want to. They are independent Bible yeah. That's true. As is the yeah. right. so that so there is not no. Okay. Yeah, oh may I I'd like to ask for public comment. So I'm Stu Wilson, I'm the board chair of the trust currently, and John Rogers is here as well as the treasurer of the trust. So um, this is timely because the um, agreement has expired. Um, we are set up both in our corporation and our bylaws to support solely in our granting the state library. Um, that doesn't have to be the case in the future when we can decide to change. Um, the reason there are an agreement and we can have a relationship without an agreement, a lot of foundations do, um, is to have a relationship so that it's understand on your part what our role is and also have you trust that we are supporting you and what you as a commission and a staff want supported at the state library. We don't really have any interest in funding or supporting anything that you as a commission or your state staff don't want funded. It's not functional. It doesn't work. It doesn't work for our funders. Right? At the same time, we are acting as essentially your development office. Rather than you having the expense to hire a development director, you have active volunteers, and we do have a part-time staff person, actually raising money, private money, to support the state library. So as that, we need to have some kind of relationship and be able to say to Jenny or to say to the commission, what do you want funded? Because we need to go out and seek funding for it. We don't want to seek out funding for, you know, um, doors at a convention center. We want to seek out funding for what you want funded. And so the agreement has elements of saying, we're going to be part of your planning process, and it's going to be a relationship. And if we understand what you want funded, you also understand what private funders want. And in many cases, um, the reason private foundations are set up to support public entities 
is there are many large, particularly large foundations that will not support a government entity. And then in those cases, you even need a fiscal sponsorship because we need to hold the money, but it needs to flow through the state library. That's what we're set up to do. That's what all of the library foundations across Montana are set up to do. It's the same relationship. It's one in which we want a relationship and we want that relationship to cl be clear, whether that's an agreement or a memorandum of understanding or everyone meets once a year and says, this is what you do and this is what we do. We need that so that we can get more private funds for the state library. I've listened to you for way too long. Thank God I'm on the trust board because our meetings are no more than an hour long um, and yours are way too long. Is um, uh, you just went through a list of things that we're way too small at the moment, but 10 years from now, you could be getting private support for and helping fund both alleviate taxpayer dollars and do more to save libraries. That's what we're set up to do. We can't do that unless we have some kind of relationship with the commission and the staff. We can't operate entirely independently. As a board, as an organization, that says we're really, if we can't have that kind of relationship of some kind, um, we can't really fundraise for you. Um, the one other comment I would make is uh, one of the reasons private foundations are set up is because both um, individuals and corporations and foundations like to give to a uh, private entity for tax reasons. Um, realistically, anyone giving directly to the state library also can get a tax deduction. We're not really interested in undercutting that. That's true for every public library. But the point is we're acting as your development office. So we need to develop relationships with funders, whether that's an individual or a corporation or a philanthropic foundation. So it really helps us raise more money for the state library if you can help us develop those relationships. And that's pretty simple by saying, if somebody approaches Jenny and says, I'd like to give $100, administratively, have you thought about it or talked to the trust? It doesn't, it's not a matter of undercutting direct donations to the state library. If somebody wants to do that, hallelujah. But it helps us develop a fundraising world for the state library in the same way that the Bozeman Library Foundation has advanced Bozeman in the same way that the Flathead Library Foundation has advanced Flathead. We're in exactly the same situation. So I don't really care if we have an agreement or not. What I want is a relationship and a clarity in that relationship. An agreement helps get there. It helps clarify that. Many foundations operate without it. Many foundations operate under a memorandum of understanding that's not signed. So at least we all are on the same, both boards are on the same page. Um, <clears throat> I think when this was passed, the commission at that point felt that, it, that they wanted something a little more legal. Um, if you want a new memorandum of understanding or a memorandum of agreement or a clarity in relationship, I think our board would be very open to, uh, to working through that with you. So I'm not sure what the fundamental issues, I mean, the reason we have uh, the opportunity for both uh, someone from the commission and the state librarian to serve ex officio on our board is to have points of con um, communication and understanding of what we're funding and what we're not funding and a relationship there. Um, they're always welcome to not attend. They're not voting members. And one of the reasons for that is there's a conflict of interest for Jenny to be a voting member or Robin to be a voting member and then us making a grant. They can't really, it's a conflict for them to be voting on both granting and then they basically being in the organization that receives that grant. So that's why they're not voting. Um, but we certainly want that transparency. So happy to answer any other questions you might have. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then what, go ahead. Go ahead. If, if the tax deductions aren't different from donating to the 501c3 or donating to the state library's trust, why do we have to? Why couldn't we just encourage the same relationships and fundraising and then the funds going to that trust that the state library already has? 
Why well, there are two issues. One is we're actively fundraising. You're not actively fundraising. You have no staff to actively fundraise. So <clears throat> essentially at the moment, you're getting piece of uh, people who passively come in and say, I'd like to make a donation to the state library, as opposed to we're trying to build a fundraising development structure. But you and, could, could build that structure and the money goes into the, the trust that already exists. If the, if the especially for the, the high-end donors, if the tax ramifications are the same. Well, then, they could donate directly to the trust, but as volunteers, and as donors, I'm not wanting to direct that to the government agency. I'm wanting to have some intermediary so that we're overseeing that. There are libraries. I don't think it's a very effective model, but there are libraries that hire development directors mm -hmm. and do that and fundraise directly. You could hire a $100,000 development director and fundraise and have it go directly to the trust. Um, more than likely, they're going to want to create a uh, foundation that's a private entity, even if they're a development director, because a lot of donations come through board members who are on foundations. So, so from, the, from the viewpoint of a high-end donor, it just looks more attractive. It looks saying. much more attractive to give it to a non-governmental agency and to have a board that oversees how their funds are being used. So for us as a board, it's not your responsibility. For us as a board, we have equal responsibility to donors as well as to the state library. And we have policies around donor relationships and use of donor funds. So um, that gets back to, if we have a donor who wants to donate X to the state library, we would work with that donor. And the first thing we would do is talk to Jenny and say, do you want X? And if Jenny says, we don't want X, but there's a parallel thing here that's over here and it's Y, we would go back to the donor and say, the state library doesn't want X. How about if you do, do Y? Um, and so that's that relationship with the major donor that we have that you don't currently have capacity for as a staff. And that's what we're trying to develop all the time. And that's individuals, that's corporations, Many philanthropic foundations will absolutely not give to a government agency. And that's why you know, a fiscal, a model of a fiscal sponsorship agreement is, believe me, as a trust, we would rather not manage those funds. We would rather grant them as quickly as possible to get their library. But there are entities that say you can't you can't transfer that to uh, the government. You have to manage that and then parcel it out. And in that case, we would want a fiscal sponsorship relationships so that you knew what was happening um, even though we controlled it. Sure. Um, yes. John Rogers on the on the board. Um trust board. Um I was just uh thinking I, I have to admit to you that I had to pull that agreement off the police meeting to, to refresh my memory. And um and I think there's a reason for that, that it didn't register too well in my brain. And that is that I, when I think it came before us and I looked at the wording, I thought, well, of course, would we ever do anything as a trust that would be, contra that would contravene what, what the state commission felt? I thought, absolutely not. We're, that's the purpose of us being here. So why do we need this agreement? So I always looked at it as, um, a no brainer, excuse me, because if we were to ever get into that role, I would resign as a member of the trust board. So to me, what it really does is it tethers our mission to yours. We are the ones that are being tethered. It isn't the state commission that's being tethered. If you read that, if you read that agreement, it basically says, that we, we only do what the commissioner permits us to do. So I, I was really confused when I read, the, read it again. I thought, well, number one, why didn't I focus on it more? It's because it's a no-brainer for me. It's like a green light at a, at a traffic stop. I know to press on the gas. So um, the, the, the thing about having Jenny, and I, actually I love being here today because I learned a lot about I'm not a librarian. I've never been on a library board. I'm, I'm a chronic user. 
of libraries. And so, but I am amazed at how much I don't use in libraries by the discussion I heard here today. But I'll tell you um, the reason that I'm on the trust is when I retired, I wanted to do something to try to get back to Montana. And when I heard about the trust being formed, I couldn't think of a better use of my free time and my energy. And I, I'll tell you right now that I don't think it matters if that agreement is, is in place or not. I think we'd still operate that way. We'd still want, we'd still want to consult with uh, Jenny because Jenny can, can help guide us as to where the, the needs are. Uh, listening to you today, I think there are a lot of needs out there, a lot more than I knew. And I'm, I'm a student 10 years from now. I hope we could be a partner. We could have enough money to be a partner in helping advance some of these things that small libraries are dealing with. Um, my former job, I traveled the state of Montana for 25 years. And um, I didn't bother my clients after the work day. I'd be on the road. So there was two two places to go in some rural communities in, in the state. One was to the bar and one was to the library. And I'm not an alcoholic. <laughs> For the reason that there were libraries open. And I happen to I can kill three hours in a in a smallest library in Montana. And so this is where we come from. We want to be students use the word on the same page. I think that's what I agree with it's about. Uh, if I could add one more thing quickly, uh, to reinforce what John said, I have always seen this as a hand in glove relationship, and you're the hand in the glove, and we don't move unless you do. Um, the second one is in um, touching base with Jenny about this and reviewing the previous agreement. The one thing that I don't think ever um, um, that you never got to was your internal process either of how to request things from the trust and how to work and approve any grants that we would make. And I actually think that's a, um, that's something that really the commission and Jenny and her staff need to work through of how do you all request what you would like from us in terms of private support. And then when we are ready to make a grant, how do you accept that? And I think that's a really useful thing for you to have as an internal policy. Um, because um, if we decided we wanted to grant, um, um, you know, um, something really weird to you, you don't have to accept it. Do you? Um, there's nothing, there is this separation that are really advantageous for you. It's that thing again of a donor wanted to donate a million dollars to you for something that you really don't want. Um, you can say no, and then it's our problem. Um, so I think you having an internal process of how you want to work with us and request funds from us, we will have both unrestricted funds so that we can fulfill things, but we will also seek out restricted grants for things that you want. But I don't think you have a process, I mean, maybe Jenny can answer this, I don't think you have a process of how you and staff work together on that. Is that fair? Madam Chair? Yes. I think... Uh, one of the things, and I agree with you, I'm learning a lot. We all are been on this two years, and it's like drinking from a fire hose, and that's what today was. And I also agree with you. I wish our meetings were an hour long. We're all exhausted. We can't face clearly anymore. But I think the public input and the debate is so crucial to keeping the transparency of what we do here. Um, and, and it was a big ask today to double our budget, to actually double the entire budget. Um, I guess what I would say is that when I came on this board, it was made clear to me that this is a very strange setup in the state of Montana. There are only a couple of these commissions that exist in the very long way. We are not tied to the department. We, there is the Arts Council. There is the commission, um, the Board of Regents. <laughs> um, there are only a few of these. And we have very, very strong statutes that apply to us, and we are responsible for the fiduciary budgeting. And we don't, I guess, have the luxury of having 
a department ahead. Back there was some talk about putting us under the Department of Administration because we just both. Um, and so I think you know a couple of times you used the word oversight. Um, I I loved having a partnership with you. I think what you're doing is phenomenal. There are other like the Arts Council has trust funds and people that support them, but they don't have the agreements that we did. They don't have the people serving from this group on their group. And um, I guess this frees you up not having an agreement, but just having a great part friendship. Um, that like today, it was divided on many of these issues. And, uh, you know, if you wanted to go back to your people and say, look, a lot of the libraries need this, 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 and they don't have the funding, I think you need to be free to say, this is a really good cause that they don't have the funding for. But man, in today's world, you know, a habitat we specialist at a cost of $92,000 is a really good cause. <laughs> and, you know, if that were to be defeated here, which I'm not saying it would because it hasn't come up yet, um, I, I think it frees you up to do that kind of thing. I don't see that we are, but we have to be very careful not to be in a position where we get oversight from an outside 501c. And I, we can't, that's just all there is to it. And that was the legal advice given to me too. And so I think, um, you know, I just don't think we can sign into an agreement. Now, sounds like you don't need that. So. If I could comment, number one, that's not the case at all. We have no oversight of what you do. You are entirely in uh, control of the operations of the state library. We don't control that at all. You even control what we grant to you. Um, that is exactly parallel to how all of the library foundations in Montana mm -hmm. operate. There's a county commission, there's an advisory group that oversees the operations, and then there's a foundation. It's exactly the same legal structure. I think what we need is the clarity of what the relationship is. So to use your example, we could change our bylaws and we could support libraries directly. Um, I don't think we want to do that because our fundraising requests and our relationship and our relationship with staff, because you do have staff, is stronger if we can work and support things through the state library that are statewide rather than us trying to support individual libraries. The reality in Montana, and one of the reasons this has been set up, is there really are only five public libraries that have staffed foundations. The great majority of public libraries in the state of Montana do not have staff or boards to raise substantial amounts of money because they're too small. So we can, as an entity, fulfill some of that role through working with the state library staff and support all of these individual libraries. It changes us and our role if we're not working with the state library. So we, as a board, and I think John would agree with this, we need the clarity of what is the relationship. What is the relationship you want to have? That's an agreement, or if that's a discussion, I don't really care, but we need that clarity. And I think Jenny and her staff need that clarity. I don't know, given what you just said, are we okay to talk to Jenny and her staff about what their needs are? Right at the moment, I'm not sure where you stand on that. So do we just walk away and we're not allowed to talk to state library staff about what their needs are? No, I, I mean, we as a board, we need to know. As fundraisers, we need to know. And how, how we know that is what we need to know. I've been our gray uh, past library director for about 30 years in Montana. And as you all sit here now, you don't know if you'll be here tomorrow. I've worked for library boards that come and go because people move about so readily. <clears throat> if you do not have these agreements in place, it gets lost in translation. Nobody knows what the purpose of the uh, first thinking of this agreement was. It, there's got to be something in writing so that the people that follow you have a clear understanding of why this opportunity even exists. And the foundation came into place because we were all struggling with 
tax dollars not being able to provide what the citizens of Montana were asking for. And so a group of people came together and said, we need this foundation that can raise the money to come back and help provide the things that the citizens of Montana are asking for. So I would beg you to have some kind of an agreement in place so that the people that follow you and the people that follow on the foundation board know why you exist, um, why that relationship exists. Otherwise, you don't know what's gonna to happen to the hard work that you do. Yeah. I think that sums up exactly where we are. Because <laughs> that's why I'm like, why do we have two foundations? I mean, just to even get the two names straight and then trying to figure out why do we have the two? Well, that's many exactly people, are, so. as a library director, many people would not donate money to a public entity. They pay taxes to us for, to support the library. They do not want to donate extra money, but they will donate it to a foundation because they can kind of dictate where their money's going to go to. So I, I think that when you look at it from the public standpoint of why philanthropists give money to 501c3s and not government agencies, it's kind of a no-brainer. They pay enough in government support they feel like, so they want to be able to dictate where this kind of money goes. So if you don't have that outside foundation, you're missing out on a lot of money that you could be getting otherwise. Mm -hmm. and I think maybe a starting point would be a discussion for staff and Jenny and I as to what direction for fundraising we would like to give to the mm -hmm. foundation. Yeah. And, and also I'd like to clarify that um, in the statute, it does, there the distributions, it does say that donors may specify a particular library program to receive the benefit of the donation. And that is the Montana state library trust. So mm -hmm. in the state statute, it does say, so if somebody mm -hmm. would, did want to donate to the government, they could say, you know, I mean, basically the government, whatever, they could say where it went to. The um, trust issue. Right, uh, and, and I understand. So that. we're on trying to trust. trust. The rest. If I can have a I trust that you'll do with my money what I ask. Right. right. And I don't think that trust exists amongst people. That's why we have foundations. Got it. Um, if I can add one more comment about that, and then also maybe a suggestion, and that is there are multiple reasons why the foundations exist separately. And one of them, we have a board member who wants us to raise $60 million through plan giving, which is people dying dead and leaving their money to the state library. Um, those are set up as foundations. And um, generally, if it comes to the state, which it could, and that would be a tremendous thing if the state library got a plan gift for a million dollars, because then you would get in Poland. The problem is there are also strong restrictions, usually on governmental oversight of internal foundations mm -hmm. that don't allow you mm -hmm. to invest it very um, aggressively. So I will give you the example. I was the director of the Minneapolis Public Library Foundation, and the Minneapolis Public Library held about $5 million in funds that were government funds and under their foundations. They averaged 1.5% return on that annually. We held about $10 million of the private foundation, and we averaged 8% return. I'm going to invest with you. <laughs> guess, who, guess who contributed more to the Minneapolis Public Library every year? For you as a commission, if somebody left $60 million to the state library and wanted it to be in a perpetual um, endowment, you want that to be with the nonprofit because we're going to give you a lot more money annually than if it's in the government coffers. Now you can set up all kinds of requirements. The commission could oversee what that agreement is, um, all of that. So my suggestion is direct your staff to come up with a new document that's a memorandum of understanding that doesn't really violate anything in the state code that maybe isn't even signed by both organizations, but both boards review and say, yeah, this is how we want the relationship to be. That would be a tremendous help to us. It would be a tremendous help to you because we clarify what the relationship you would ensure that it's not violating any state statutes. I haven't heard anything today, anything that any of you have said 
that our board would disagree with or would want to violate. I just I, doesn't exist. It, we're never even precluded from some of that under our current bylaws and our current incorporation. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think there's a process here to go back to your staff and say, let's look at a new some kind of understanding between the two organizations that would be written that would help clarify everything and that that is reviewed annually by both boards. I mean, I think that's been a mistake that it hasn't been reviewed annually, and that's just a matter of COVID and getting going. We're a new baby organization still. Is there any other public comment? Any um Good question? Okay. Seeing no further discussion, we will now vote on the motion, which <clears throat> is to move to acknowledge that the agreement with the Trust for Montana Libraries, a private organization, is no longer in effect, having expired December 31st, 2022, and decline entering into another agreement. And again, I would like to explain my yes vote in that I'm not sure that we can legally enter into an agreement, and that is a serious problem. Mm -hmm. um, but I would like to have a discussion in the future mm -hmm. with. And Jennifer. that is my question, also. I yeah, well, I mean, we 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 have entered into an, a legal agreement. It was drafted by attorneys, so yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's and the time. Okay, okay. The question has been called. So, all in favor of the motion. Uh, do I need to reread it? No. Okay. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 All in favor say all opposed say no. No. I didn't say no as well. I have seen. So tell me my eyes really quick. Sorry guys. Tammy. Robin, Tom, Tom Tammy. Robin, yeah. That it? But and then the, yeah, who have seen? <laughs> Uh, Car Carmen, Carmen Extend. Okay, so, thank you. Um, now I would like to call, if I can, to establish an understanding. I would like to have a meeting with them. A meeting, just a work session with them, and to and to have staff or. To work up an understanding, because I mean, they I believe that they're doing it. Madam Chair, uh, yes, we just declined entering into, into another agreement. Another agreement. That's what but not an to. understanding. I mean, it's so different. <laughs> I I mean, the wording is because <laughs> this is a memorandum of agreement, which is what you just said. But yes, it's, but it's under we. Uh, to clarify, you could create okay. a joint understanding that in essence you vote on as your internal policy and we vote on as our internal policy so it's not a legal agreement between the two but it's how you understand how you operate and we understand how we operate mm -hmm. so that it's not it doesn't and have so a, that you can contact i mean i believe that there should be some uh, agreement there that they you that there can be a contact between the commission i mean the library and you like you had said it could be a point by point bullet or it could be just a relationship statement you know i think that's that probably is more important for you than it is for us but we need some kind of again clarity about what the relationship is and what we can expect particularly working with staff but also what your approval process is um you know again um we may have board members who want to fund X and you have no interest in that. So we wouldn't do that. We wouldn't pursue that. So we need we need that. We need that some kind there of needs clarity. To be clarity. About what is it you're willing to yes. have us? What role you're willing to have us play? And and staff need that clarity as well. Right. You know, we 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 had um a, just a fantastic meeting with the trust staff and our staff last month. Peggy was able to join us because it was just after the NAC meeting where we we brainstormed a number of priorities 
uh, including helping to fundraise for our Lego history portal program to help expand that statewide. Um, we identified a need for defibrillators in Montana public libraries. Um, early literacy is another funding priority. Um, I, I felt like I was acting um, in, in my capacity as state librarian in, in the, the best action for the state library because with the exception of defibrillators, these were all current programs of the state library, just working with the trust to seek private donations to help expand that great work. So I, I too need better clarification from the commission to what extent uh, the, the staff have the flexibility to continue to function in that manner or not. Yes. I move that this be um, a meeting for another day, a topic for another day, and not to be resolved at the present time. I second that. It has been moved and seconded that we discuss an understanding with the Trust for Montana Libraries on another day. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? I think what we need to figure out is for us ourselves internally how we direct staff to interact with the with the trust. Not anything between the two entities right now, but we need to know how to direct our staff to to interact and that's what we do. So we can call the question. The question is there any more public discussion? I'll call the question. So, the motion is put on the floor to discuss it and understanding with the trust for Montana libraries at the future. Probably with the wordings, I think I'm, I don't have this right. Is that a good? Tom? Um, a possible understanding, a pop, okay, a pop. Okay. To discuss a possible understanding. Thank you. And while you're crafting up above the motion did pass. Yes. You oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Thank you so much. And on the current motion, remove the words to move. Motion by Tom Burnett to discuss. Well, it's to move. You always say a motion to move. To just no, take out, take out to move. Genevieve. Oh, that's all. Whatever. whatever. Okay. It's fine. That's how okay. You word motion. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. So, uh, so it has. We are ready to go ahead with the vote. Yes. Seeing as there's no further discussion, we'll now vote on the motion, which is to move to discuss a possible understanding. With the trust for Montana libraries at a future date, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? No. No. <laughs> Don't yell at me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we we it has been accepted, and we will be meeting and discussing this at a future date. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's trails of five hundred one c. It's a construction. What's that? Okay. I believe, I don't believe, is it? Yeah. I don't know. Oh, it is. No, no, sorry. So it's, it's, a, it's a program of the university system. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The goal is to ultimately get there, but, mm -hmm. but we're not there yet. We don't have, we don't have the budget. Mm -hmm. All right, we're moving on. We're moving on now. Um, the Montana State. Library employees voted to form a local union of the Montana Federation of Public Employees. The Department of Administration and State Human Resources Division recommends the Montana State Library Commission form a negotiation preparation group as allowed under Section 6C of the Commission bylaws. The group would be charged to work with the State Human Resources Division Office of Labor Relations to establish the commission and library's contract priorities for the collective bargaining agreement with the new union. As chair, I will form a new work group and will appoint the members of the work group. The group will consist of state library leadership management staff and commissioners. Do I have a motion for the formation of a union negotiation preparation group? So moved. Is there a second? A second. It has been properly moved and seconded that we form 
a union negotiation preparation work group. Is there any discussion? Really quick, who was my um who who moved that? Who made the motion? Tam. Tammy and Thank you. Brian Brian seconded it. Thank you. And I'll share it in a sec. Is there any public discussion? I would just like okay. to make one comment that I, I think it would be wise of us to um, to use some of the skills of that it, people who have been involved in unions, perhaps. I know I have done some, and Brian, I'm sure, has been done some work, and, and um, maybe let us be part of the uh, of conversation, too, is that um, might have some, some points to contribute to that group. I've also been and, yeah, and, and I've been with the school been on board and it was done, so, so yeah. Okay. So I think so. Very new thing for for the library to should be involved in. So if we can help mm -hmm. in any way. Okay. So, okay. Where was I? So, okay. So I, I have the motion and the second. Mm -hmm. Is there any? There's no further discussion. We will vote for the formation of the union. The okay. Sorry. <laughs> All those in favor of uh, forming a union negotiation preparation work group, say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Okay, this has been accepted by a voice vote. Okay, as delegated to me by our bylaws, giving me as chair to the authority to appoint committees, I, I am going to think about this and get back to everyone. I will. I will think about this. Okay. If that's appropriate. Okay. Okay. Next, we're discussing the designation of union negotiation leads. The Department of Administration State Human Resources Division further recommends the State Library Commission designate those commissioners and mani uh, managing staff with the authority to negotiate and sign a contract with the union on behalf of the commission. Excuse me for being inappropriate. Mm -hmm. Within the parameters established by the negotiation preparation work group, I would recommend Jenny Stapp and Tom Burnett as our leads. May they will have, we will give them authority. Do I have a non, do I have a motion for the des designation of Jenny Stapp and Tom Burnett as negotiation leads? I don't move. Is there a second? Seconded. Okay, it is to be properly moved and seconded that we accept the designation of Jenny Staff and Tom Burnett as negotiation <clears throat> leads. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Okay, it has been accepted by a voice vote. Okay, thank you. And I will be getting back with everyone. I missed the remind me who who was the first motion or who put the motion forward. Tammy. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Seconded by Carmen. Thank you. Okay, we are now on to stand reports and information lock items for the purpose of saving time in our meetings. <laughs> As we proceed through okay. the informational items, I'm going to allow. Happy to answer any questions. You might yes. Have. Yeah, Jenny. Okay, librarian Jenny staff and staff will have the state library reports. I will try to shorten this. I'm sorry, as much as possible. Um, go ahead, Jenny. Happy to answer any questions you have about any, questions. Of the, any of the standing reports. Oh. I have a question on page 14 of the work plan. I would, it said that you have completed, um, Colette and Pam, have um, completed the series of four classes that library staff can take to learn more about serving you. And then the next one is to provide access to online summer reading material. And then creation of short videos addressing the job of library board. I would just make sure we get a link of that to the commission. Sure. Those three are completed, but I'd like to link. Okay. And that's all I have on the dashboard or dashboard. Madam yeah, Chair? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, just hoping that we can get some, um, all of a lot of 
in each of the categories, the goals and, and the work plans. So if, if it's a thousand dollar project and there's six hundred dollars into it, um, instead of just completed by the modules, a little bit more. Once we set out on the project there, it would be nice if we knew how involved that was. And then we could we could see at a greater level of detail and just started during progress. I made that suggestion before. Okay. Any any input from the staff? So one comment that I can make is right here you have the summary document. It would be many, many, many pages, but if you're looking at the, the digital version of the dashboard, you can click on any of those projects and it brings you to a Gantt chart that shows um, the different milestones in the project and when they're expected to be completed. So although it's not hours, it does give you a time frame. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. After, uh, mm -hmm. Can that be translated into hours at the beginning? At the outside of the project, you have the executive team saying, this is what we think it means instead of just a pie chart. So pie chart yeah. have numbers tied mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. As it I, I I honestly don't know yeah. if we if we could do that. You know, we we don't have any project managers on staff. Mm -hmm. Um, it to what extent we we can plan for those kinds of hours? I I just don't know. I would need to talk to staff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. You know, within our our human resources time management system, it would be an incredible amount of work to have to add all of these projects and have staff log hours according to the projects to be able to track the number of hours. Thanks. Thanks. Anything else to ask Jenny? Any other questions or feedback or? If not, we're going to go on to our annual business calendar. Same question on what we skipped here in the quarter. Contracts. Oh, um, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. On the quarter contracts, the one with the oh. uh, botanical and vegetation data products for one hundred ten thousand is that renewable or is that one time? Um, it's with the um, mm -hmm. LSM consulting for botanical data. It's one hundred ten thousand botanical and vegetation data mm -hmm. products. Is that ongoing? Um, it 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 is. Budgeted through next June, June of, of right. 2025. At this time, I don't believe they've made any, made any determination okay. about whether or not they would renew that contract next year. Okay. Madam Chair? Yes. On the staffing memo? Yeah, yeah sorry, I, I skipped mm -hmm. ahead. I meant, to, I meant to include that, the staffing memo. Yes. So I see that we have. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, with Sharon. We're hiring the four. Is that, is that correct? We have uh, a GIS tech, a system support specialist, and two library consultants. So the, the, the GIS tech position was filled. Um, the oh, okay. library network specialist position was filled. Um, we, we have, we're nearly concluding our recruitment for the two library consultants. I see. Mm -hmm. This does not, um, do we have vacancies that we're going to begin recruiting for? Um, we, we've, we've caused a bit of a cascade in our hiring. This all started when Amelia Kim left. And so we, we did a recruitment. We hired an internal candidate, Bobby DeMontney, to fill the lifelong learning position. So then we had our, our her position, the, the Montana Library Network tech position open. We recruited for and just filled that position. Um, the consulting recruitment will likely cause uh, some other internal movements like that. So there may be some additional recruitments to fill vacancies caused by that cascade of, of internal hiring. So Amelia Constant. <laughs> Amelia, and then we had Pam retire. Right, Pam retired. And Suzanne is retiring sure. at the end of oh, uh, this, to the um, yeah, at the end of the the fiscal year. So, thank you. Yeah, was, um, did we want to discuss? I have one question on the interim budget committee report. Okay, um, I wasn't clear. 
Um, I really appreciate the Department of Administration's responding to the committee, directing mm -hmm. them to try to help these eight, eight uh, commissions like ours save money. Your response was that for us to discuss, or had you already said that? Um, this this was shared with the committee. I did share it with Robin before it went to the committee because it was in between your meetings. That's why I'm sharing it here. I'm sorry, I don't remember having that mm -hmm. shared, but I would like to. Um, I I appreciate where you're coming from, Jenny, when they said that there could be some of our staffing situations that would go to the Department of Administration. Um, I would like us to have a discussion on that. I think there are um, a few of these where we could perhaps save some money within our um, staffing to have that shared with the Department of Administration. And I'd like to at least discuss that and not just say no to the committee. Um, Offhand, I would think I'd like to know about the HR. I think um, the HR probably could be handled by their HRs, and also the um, the legal would be very comfortable under the Department of Administration having the judicial. And and we we pointed out that that we would. You know, we 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 all know we would prefer to have better legal support. Mm -hmm. um, I I think this is probably a good discussion for your yeah. June. I would just meeting. like to have a discussion on the possibility of those. I I can see where the accounting is quite complicated, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but a couple of these seem like we could maybe consolidate as the House Committee asked us to consider. Yes. Um, perhaps it would be appropriate for our uh, commission to send a note to the to the interim committee saying that we have taken our staff's advice and uh, and we've gotten the analysis by our staff and uh, we had a couple of. Well, so, you know, some things down the road might be possible. Mm -hmm. Because the way this stands now, any of those alterations are clear. What, so where, where things were left with the committee, the committee asked D of A to provide information about the kinds of services they could provide to small agencies. And so you so I shared with you their, their response to the committee, and then we were asked to respond to that response. And so our response is based on our analysis of, of um, D of A's initial response to the mm -hmm. question to the committee. Um, what is really lacking in D of A's response is true cost analysis. You know, there, it's not clear to us that they, they could take on the work of providing human resources to the state library or the historical site or other agencies without first adding additional staff. We're, we're talking about 130 FTE between our three agencies. So the D of A has been asked now by the committee to provide the committee more information about their capacity to do that work and what those costs would, would in fact entail. And so I think that information from D of A would be useful to the commission to have a fuller picture of, of what's being proposed and, and what, if any kinds of cost savings or other efficiencies would be found based on the initial analysis of the initial information provided. Um, it's not apparent that there would be any immediate cost savings. Um, several of us, well, we, we can have a larger discussion in June, mm -hmm. but but that's the status of, of that discussion with the IBC. So, mm -hmm. so get a clear how this is supposed mm -hmm. to work, the Education Interim Budget Committee approaches you, not the State Library Commission. That's right. I mean, you're you're certainly welcome to attend, but but I'm the, the person charged to come and provide testimony. Okay. But if we could say, $103,000 mm -hmm. by moving the HR specialist to the Department of Administration, 
that is a fiscal saving, and that would be our responsibility. Well, we would, but we don't. Still, we don't know that there's that saving we don't, right. because we don't know that they have right. that capacity. So that's the question right. that the IBC has asked D of A to consider, and 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 that's the information they're supposed to provide back to the IBC in June. Okay, thank you. But well, we'll get more information from mm -hmm. them, and then we'll have discussion. Yeah. Okay. I think that meeting, I'll double check the dates of that meeting. It's in early June, I believe. And I would like to point out because everybody seems to be really, we're all exhausted, but um, we have a lot to cover today, and we are actually only one hour behind schedule. And one hour is remarkable given what we had to do in the fact that by 11 15 we're already you know, an hour behind yeah so we have really talked a lot um do we and i we didn't i did not address the downloading the dashboard instructions is there anything there that we that's just discuss? instructions for you if you'd prefer to download the information from the dashboard versus viewing it online so right, nothing great. to discuss all right we are now on to the Annual business calendar. Madam Chair, okay. yes. I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt. No. Um, I, as well as being a part of Bozeman Public Library, I am the vice president of Montana Library Association. Oh, and we have to get to our opening reception at 5 p.m. Right. Uh, across town. So if it's, well, if I would respectfully request that if at all pot an option that we um, move our discussion to your special meeting. We would really still like to have um, a conversation with, with you and all of our executive chair Sorry. committee is already over there. So I would like to offer that. We would be happy to I be think that probably the June meeting that. instead of our special meeting, I think our special meeting is going to be full. Do you, can you tell me off the top of your head when your June meeting is? The 12th, June the 12th. 12th. Yeah, okay. That's on right, so. Genevieve. June yes, 12th? yes, June 12th. Is that a Wednesday? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, okay. I think we can make that work. If that's okay with you, I would really, Sorry, really, really appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. We, we, really, really, we appreciate you. Yeah, that. we've yeah. got to get to the yeah. conference and we'll, or reception and we'll see you there, hopefully. <laughs> okay, I okay. heard about it, but okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank yeah. you. I guess we had heard about it, but I was. Yes, it's at the Butte Public Library. Oh, come on, come on over. We'll oh, have, we'll gosh. have some book readings and we'll give away some awards for great books that were about Montana. Awesome. Oh, thank you. At five. At um six thirty. That starts, but the reception does start at five. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you so much for all your comments. Oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you. All right. So um, here we thought it would be a good place to explain. Pardon me. The conversations with the commission session tomorrow. Here is the outline that has been developed with Tracy and Jenny's help. Okay, number one, the room will be configured in a circle. Commissioners will be encouraged to sit amongst attendees, though some commissioners may choose to sit next to one another. Tracy will introduce the session and will share ground rules for the session to encourage a positive experience for all. Um, we have asked Trace, Tracy to be to work as a facilitator, and she will ask that the conversation is respectful, we build bridges and relationships, we learn about different perspectives and try to understand each other's viewpoints. We, as in all of us, everyone in the room. Um, they would like the commissioners to introduce themselves and will be encouraged to share some personal element as they're comfortable. If you want to say I'm whoever, go right ahead, whatever you're comfortable with. <laughs> I'm Fred. I'm Fred. <laughs> Tracy. No, Tracy will also also ask attendees to raise their hands to indicate that they're public library directors, trustees, staff, etc., to give us commission an idea of who is attending. Um, Tracy will then open the discussion to questions from attendees and will let attendees know that the commission is interested in learning more about the current challenges that they face. Um, if people are not are quiet initially and are not ready to ask questions, Tracy will prompt attendees with a conversation starter about what is going on well in their library. And that is our plan for tomorrow. And it is at 3.30. 3.30. And it is where? Next door. Over here. C3. C3, that's right. C3. Okay, C3. Okay, any questions about that? 
Are you exhausted? Yes. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's go on to the Montana Geospatial Information Act grant program special meeting date where we will. So that will now be a meeting where um, the, the council, the Geospatial Information Advisory Council will recommend grant awards for FY25, as well as a special meeting to further consider the budget requests that um, we, we delayed from today. So I'm, I'm expecting what, what we should probably expect that to be the better part of a full day meeting. Okay, all right, do I have a motion? Okay, do I have a motion for a special meeting? Uh, so we're going to discuss at that special meeting um, a couple of the items from that we did not cover. Mm -hmm. Plus, I think we forwarded two. Is that correct? The um, to get the courier more information. I think we were saying that some of this is too ambitious, and we'd like you to give us a clear name. Mm -hmm. And I think it was the courier program, or what was the other one that we said forward? The, the shared, shared catalog. catalog. Mm -hmm. But I yeah, think catalog. we can include them one that went to those. Mm -hmm. And we would. Mm -hmm. And we to... could if one of the novels would agree with that. Um, the Montana Library to go. And the FD, that was the other one. There were three that we did put forward. So this topic that you have here is going to be part of that, or it needs its own special meeting? It would be part of that meeting. So what's up? we just have to move to... So wait, let, me try to let me try to form a motion here. To include that in the, in the meeting. Plus, we had the whole first part. We have yeah. quite a bit to discuss in this mm -hmm. work session. And I would just encourage that we have those things we have to make decisions on before we have reports. Um, I don't think, it's, yeah, right. we won't plan on any reports in yeah, meeting. So this one, yes, I got you. I would Is like that to motion to... to... Go ahead, Jennifer. Is the motion on the screen um, too vague? Would you like me to add any specific wording? Um, so is, it on, is it on the screen? And that's a request not voted upon today. I would like to specify those budget requests that are going to be here. Mm -hmm. I think that would help us be better prepared. Okay. I, I know. Right? So mm -hmm. does somebody have the free time? Do you have them? Um, the resource sharing staff support. And the statewide courier service. And Peggy wanted the Montana. There was a third one. That we the Mont had. Montana Shared Catalog. The Shared Catalog. The courier. And the oh, yes, yes. We want to discuss the formula of the Montana Shared Catalog. Yeah. Right. That was the Montana Shared Catalog, the courier, and the two FDs. The, no. The more than two No. FDs. The statewide courier service, the resource sharing staff support, right. which is two FTEs. Yes, you're correct. Mm -hmm. So there were three we put forward. Mm -hmm. One, two. And Peggy would like to add the learning to go, the library so to go. And in order to do that, we would have that one of the no's say that, that they would change or we would be happy with that, correct? Because as of now, it's defeated. But we could be not the others too without it. And so we want to change it. Change it, but it was the learning to go library, Montana okay. library. I'm, I'm not changing any words. We're trying to figure out okay. what we want to have come up. We have three things. No, there's three more. I thought there's the things that we did. This yeah, morning. there's all the things that we've heard this morning. We have heard, but on this one list of the 10 million share, there were only three. But she's saying that we have to, if we wanted to discuss the Montana Library to go, that we would have to have someone. 
change their vote? I think I think one way you could approach it, the, the motion, Genevieve, correct me if I'm wrong, the motion for the Montana Library to go was the full $700,000. Right, right. Um, right, so someone you, could, yeah, do another motion you, to, you, of a you, different. To, you could move to have us bring back that proposal at your work session you know for for a lesser amount or to to provide a better um analysis of how to address the holds issues in montana library to go something along those lines i think one of the one of the, the points i must i made was that i only had the choice to vote mm -hmm. for taking over all the cost or leaving it as is Mm -hmm. And if the goal is to make it possible to participate in some of these shared resources, to make it possible for small libraries, then that's what I would like to look at with regard to our funding. Mm -hmm. And whether that comes through some way of, mm -hmm. of fiddling with the um, numbers, the numbers for how the costs are shared or how exactly we're going to do that, I wasn't sure. But that's mm -hmm. what I would like to discuss. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that's for the shared catalog, correct? Yeah. For and Montana that, Library to go. And the statewide courier service. Right. Okay, we're already doing that one. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we need the... But the and the MSC, no. The, we're, already, yeah. we're already discussing the formula for the MSC. Mm -hmm. We are moved, so we have moved that to the special meeting. Mm -hmm. And we have also moved the resource sharing staff support to the special meeting and the statewide courier service. And we are trying to perhaps get a motion to say, can we bring back the Montana Library to go to also discuss other ways to fund it? So, can we do an amendment on this? I think that we have to. This is just my. This is just, so we're going to have to put an agenda out for this, just like our other meetings, and we could put when 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 we share when Robin shares the preliminary agenda, a commission member could ask to have an action added about the library to go. Can they not? If that works. Sure. Sure. That works. Yeah. Discretion. Mm -hmm. okay. So does this motion, sure. Tammy, look like one that you stand behind to move? Mm -hmm. Do you feel it necessary to list out the other items that we delayed due to lack of time? Um, or are they are is that I understood? We... You you could just say and other budget requests not previously discussed. Yes, because we only defeated the, or dealt with the, the temporary FTEs and the 10 million. We didn't do the others. We've not done oh, the and GIS. the one that we did pass. Now the GIS. Yeah, so. yeah, we did pass one staff one. So, so quite a bit if you could just add to that all of the other, mm -hmm. all of the they other added, yeah, And other budget items. requests not discussed. Yes. The items that were not discussed. Yes. Yeah. Then that encompasses and those three, and there were only three: the courier, the Montana shared catalog, and the sharing support staff. Those were the three that we agreed we would talk about. And then actually, and then and 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 budget request not discussed. Okay. Okay. Is is there a second? A second that. Okay. Okay. It has been properly moved and seconded that we have a special meeting to consider the MGIA grant awardees and resource sharing staff support, statewide career service, the Montana Share Catalog, and other budget requests. Requests, you might want to put an S there, not discussed. Is there any more discussion? I'm a little uncomfortable trying to do both sets of those in one meeting, but let's see. Um, how long are you anticipating me? In my thinking, tell yeah. me what you think, but I was thinking 30 minutes per budget request. And yeah, there's about, just there's about, about 11 or 12. So you, you, again, we're talking a full day meeting. Yeah, full day. I was mm -hmm. thinking about how long you anticipated the, mm -hmm. is it the GIS or whatever, what was the other one? Mm -hmm. How long are you anticipating for that one? The MGI grant. So at the, least six hours, if not. Mm -hmm. No, for the MGI. Oh, grant. well, yes, yeah, yeah. That You know, that, I'm that's saying typically a business item that doesn't take very long at all. Okay. So you're but, not okay. doing that. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
It depends on, on your, your six hours, and maybe session. 50. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and are you sorry, carrying yeah. that as a Zoom meeting? Oh, do you have a preference, commissioners? What do you want to do? Do you want to zoom it or would you rather you hear? I think I would prefer in person. Okay. okay. Right. What was that, Brian? In person? I would prefer mm -hmm. in person. Okay. Okay. I'll take either. Are you hearing me? Or? It depends on the date. I, I, said, I am out of town from May 12th to June 18th. And, and you won't long. be really available. Mm -hmm. I will be She's going to be in South places. Africa. And switch oh, wonderful. Also, uh, so for, for Carmen, any time so before May 12th, that's kind of our cutoff? That would be mm -hmm. yes necessary okay. for me to be there in person. Okay, I will send out okay. I will send out a doodle tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And, and Genevieve will have to also look into where we might be able to hold the meeting if it's going to be in person, just to double check that the capital would be available or another meeting space. Yeah. You could always meet Where? Kalispell. 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 There you go. She also said she would try to have us at her office building it. Okay. Oh, that's a okay. Oh, perfect. Good. All right. Did we vote? I'm sorry. No. 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 Okay. Okay. All right. Um, it was the second in. Did someone second it? Carmen. Carmen, Carmen did. Okay, I'm sorry, Carmen. I don't even remember. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. I'm sure she did. Yeah, okay. I'm sure. So Carmen seconded it. Okay. So would you put bring it down a little bit, Genevieve? I can't see the top of the motion. Oops. There you go. Okay, thank you. All right. It. Without seeing no further discussion, we will now vote on the motion, which is to have a special meeting to consider the MGIA grant of priorities and resource sharing staff support, statewide career service, the Montana Shared Catalog, and other budget requests not discussed. Not discussed. All those in favor say aye. 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 Are there a no's? Okay. There are no no's. So this has been accepted. We will have a meeting and Genevieve will send out a doodle and we will give our preferences. Okay. And I need it to be closer to May. When are you leaving the book? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I need it to be closer to the night than the board of around there. Well, not the 10th. That's my grandson's first birthday. Bird. <laughs> You have to make the cake in the night. <laughs> no, you're making it. Not. I'm making it. <laughs> okay, I could bring it to you that day if we had another one. Um, I can't do the first or the second, but um, I'm free. I think the first is now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I can't do the beginning. Jenny said she'll do it by doodle. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Is there any public on any matter not contained in this agenda and that is in within the jurisdiction of the State Library Commission? Yes. I think we we uh, skipped Federation meeting attendance updates. Oh, I'm sorry, we did. I had that on here too. Uh, yes, we did. I'm sorry. Okay, I forgot to go to the one in Miles City. I forgot to zoom in. I'm sorry for that. Yeah, I, at this point, I don't think we've had any commission attendance at the three Federation meetings thus oh, far. I'm sorry about that. Sorry about that. We'll have to be a little bit better. Yeah. And we will keep sending out the dates and the links and agendas. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Hey, anything else that is not on the agenda that pertains to? Okay. Is there any further business or announcements? Thank you all for your hard work. Thank you for be putting in your time and your service. And I appreciate all the information provided and the preparation that went into this meeting. With that, do I have a motion to adjourn? I so move. Okay, is there a second? Okay, it has been moved and seconded. The meeting is adjourned. Do I need to vote? Do we need to vote? Mm -hmm. I want to vote. Or we all say aye. Mm -hmm. <laughs>